I start, Humberto? Yes, let's start. Yeah, let's start. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second workshop on recommender systems in fashion. I'm Reza and with Shaza uh, today. Uh, we are happy to open this exciting day. Hello, everyone. My name is Shaza Jaradat, and I'm a doctoral candidate at KTH Sweden. And together with Nima Dukohaki from Accenture Sweden, Corona from Booking.com, and Reza Shervani from Zalando, we organized this workshop for the second year. Yes, as some of you may, you may know, uh, we had a great success at the first edition last year in Copenhagen. Fashion yes. Rexis 2019 was packed with passionate people for, from both industry and academia. Uh, I cannot hear you, Reza or Shara. Reza? Yes. Now we can hear you. Sorry, continue. Okay. Um, today our focus is on some of the challenging areas on fashion, including uh, fashion personalization. Reza got himself quite a mustache. Size and fit <laughs> and social. <laughs> he looks very funny. Everybody, if you could mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't. Oh, sorry. This is sorry. Challenging to not everybody being muted. Let me try again. What is the main focus on this workshop? Uh, so we have the fashion recommendations, personalizations, size and fit, which is a huge challenge, not only in online fashion, but also in offline. We need to go and change clothes, even in shops, until we find our own our size and fit that we like to have. But also it's about uh, expression on uh, social media and we want to uh, today take a look at these dimensions. Uh, Chaza, could you please uh, walk us through uh, the day's program? Thank you Reza. So I will explain the program that we will have today. Uh, after the opening and introductions that we are giving right now, we will start with the first keynote speech that will be given by Ralph Herpresh from Zalando. Then we will have the first paper session that we give the title Fashion Understanding in this session, we will listen to three presentations. Each of them is 20 minutes, including questions and answers. Then we will have a 30 minutes break so that we come back to the size and fit session where, we'll, where we will listen to two presentations. And then we will have the interesting panel with the title, Different Perspectives on Fashion Recommendation. Uh, after that, we will have a small break to come back to the second keynote that will be given by James Cavarelli from University of Texas. Then we will have the final paper session that has the title Combining Fashion. In this session also we will listen to three presentations. Then for socializing we will go for random Zoom breakout rooms for 30 minutes. Then for 15 minutes uh, to get some feedback from the audience for the next year workshop. And then finally we will have the closing remarks. Before we start our workshop today, we would like first to thank the program committee for the amazing efforts that they have done with us in the workshop this year. We had a combination of uh, academic and industrial researchers who joined us for the paper's reviews. And each submission that we received, it got three blind reviews. We are very thankful to the program committee. And now I will introduce the panel members that we will have for today. So we will have Jessica Graves. Jessica is a chief data officer and uh, founder at Soufleria, and she will bring the perspective of consulting with many large fashion luxury brands, as well as the startups on the topics of personalization and product innovation. The second member is Paula Rochado. Paula is a senior product manager at Farfetch, and Paula will bring the perspective of working in the recommendations team in a luxury e-commerce fashion platform. And we have Julia Lasare. Julia is a data scientist at Zalando in the size and fit team, and she will present the perspective on this topic. And we have Heidi Welfley. Heidi is a lab manager in the University of Minnesota Wearable Technology Lab. Heidi will give a dual perspective as she works in the academic field of recommendations and fashion recommendations, and at the same time, she's a fashion designer. 
Back to you, Reza, for the speaker notes. Thanks. Yes, we are also very happy uh, this year to have two keynote speakers, uh, as Shaza mentioned. So Ralph, in a few minutes, will uh, tell us more about fashion recommendation challenges. And James, uh, later this day, uh, will tell us more about opinion leaders in fashion. Starting with Ralph, um, Ralph has been in AI for many years now, uh, AI domain. And for some of you who love machine learning and games, uh, you may remember the true skill paper from Ralph and his colleagues for Xbox Live. Uh, today, Ralph is the SVP of Builders and AIs at Zalando, and his teams uh, apply and advance the science in various fashion domains. And we are very happy to have you, Ralph, here with us for our first keynote. And uh, I think we can switch to the keynote at this moment if everything goes well. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. So let me first try to uh, get around the AV problem um, that we always have at conferences. Maybe this virtual format makes it a little easier. Great. Good. I hope everyone can see the presentation. Uh, so as Reza is saying, what I wanted to spend the next 30 minutes on is talk about the challenges in particular and recommendation in particular in the fashion domain. Um, and <clears throat> uh, in doing so, I want to define this term of fashion-related ML or fashion-related AI problems. So what is fashion AI really and what makes um, the fashion space so unique and so interesting for methods of in general AI, but more specifically machine learning and recommendation to be applicable. And then pick out two, challenge, uh, two challenges that um, make it very particular. I won't go too much into the details of the algorithms because in the program later today, you hear uh, you hear a few talks about both the sizing and the outfit problem. But before I start, um, I see there's about 60, 70 people here in the call. Um, not everyone is probably familiar with Zalando itself, so I um, prepare a little overview. Generally speaking, at Zalando, what we're trying to do is um, connect customer with brands. Um, so in order to be the starting point for both of them when it comes to expressing their personality through fashion. And we do this with more than 31 million customers to more than two and a half thousand brands. And um, we do this in 17 countries. So clearly one problem we have to tackle with AI or generally is many languages. It's only luckily 14 languages, but that's still a lot more than, than English. Um, we have to do this over a catalog of 500,000 products. Um, and up to date, uh, so today we do this roughly for 350 million different visits uh, every single month. Now, what that results in, um, what, what those visits coming from is 80%, they come from mobile devices. Um, and we do this with the help of not just the, the few people you see here, but over 14,000 employees all across Europe. Um, from a business perspective, our latest figures say that um, by running this marketplace, uh, we generate a gross market merchandise value a volume of 8.2 billion per year. That's a figure from last year. So hopefully it gives you a bit of an idea um, what we do, how, we, how well we do it, and how many people are doing it. Now with that, um, I want to start with uh, what's fashion and what's AI and what makes both so special. So when you, as I just said in the, uh, um, in the fashion space, Generally speaking, it's around connecting consumers with brands. So 31 million on the one side, two and a half thousand on the other side. We do this through products. Um, so the platform idea is really that we, that we do this by bringing them together in an, uh, in an online space. So that many, many advantages, um, and it's not new to use the internet to bring people to products, but what makes this so very unique is that in the fashion industry, as opposed to many other industries, for example, in, in book printing, um, the lead time before a product, between the product being, uh, being conceived of and the product being available is in a matter of weeks. Um, in the fashion space, the lead time is in a matter of one and a half 
one to one and a half years between the product being created and the product being available. So that means when you just think of the standard problem of forecasting for inventory management, you have a much harder problem there. Secondly, products are not very long lived. There is a few evergreens like uh, our famous black and white socks or the white t-shirt. But generally speaking, most products really only live for half a year or a season. They live for one summer, they live for one winter. So many of the half a million products have a relatively short lifetime. So from an ML and recommendations perspective, you're constantly facing a cold spot problem. And secondly, um, in contrast to a book, or in contrast to a, a blender, or contrast to a, a chair, um, you, there's one attribute that really makes this problem an, an order of magnitude harder, which is each product itself, like this, this jacket, comes roughly speaking in eight different sizes to fit eight different body dimensions that people have. Um, so every problem you have already in matching products to people gets conf confounded by R of magnitude because people can really only wear what fits them relative to the dimensions of their body. And on the consumer side, one of the, the hardest problems is that <clears throat> in contrast to when you buy a book, you buy that particular book, you don't generally buy a, a combination of them, but when you buy for, when you go shopping for a fashion item, like a, like a shirt or a dress, um, you don't just go and buy a shirt or a dress. Like many of you know, when you buy a shirt, you wanna have it match the, the trousers you're wearing with it and the scarf you might wear with it and the, the belt you have with it and the shoes. So you shop whole outfits. So why you have to do a task solve for an individual item, the unit, the single unit that really defines a good customer experience is a group of items um, that compose really well together called an outfit. The second problem makes this problem harder um, is that fashion doesn't really get consumed. So what do I mean by this? Um, one interesting challenge is that um, when you buy something, you're going to wear it for a long time. And so part of the, uh, just of that marketplace doesn't involve producing new fashion items and getting them in order to wear and consume, even though they only live for a season. But you also have to think about how can you reuse this? We call it circular fashion um, or, or uh, <clears throat> re-commerce. Um, and that's very particular for fashion because you don't end up eating your, your shirt. And uh, lastly, size really matters. I bet on the brand side, but it really means on the consumer side, size and style really matters. So um, it does compound the problem by an order of magnitude when you just think of this as a matching problem um, in the space of recommendations. And that I think makes this really interesting. The other interesting thing I find personally is that shopping um, profession hasn't, been, hasn't seen much of this technologically advancement that we've seen in many other industries um, in the last 20 years. So when you order a taxi today or when you order a hotel or when you book a trip, everything you know, it's, it's sort of helped with the need of uh, some electronic means. But when you have to check something fits you, um, you still have to go into a changing booth or the changing booth isn't uh, in the shop. You still have to look in your mirror at home and get the clothes on your body to actually know if it fits. Um, so it's also an interesting space that hasn't seen much of uh, advancement in, in, that side, in that sense. Now, what's AI? And uh, the simple definition that I use for AI is it isn't just machine learning, but machine learning is a big part of it. It's the part that's about predicting the future and predicting the future on past data. So anything, any algorithmics that fall in the, in the realm of taking um, predictions from the, uh, uh, taking information from the past, so whether this is what you looked at, what you were wearing, what you were offering again, um, you know, how you're rating it, um, in order to predict what a, cust what a consumer, what a customer ends up doing or what a brand ends up offering, is a machine learning problem. But it's not really about decision-making. And mostly machine learning these days is about the algorithmic side. Because there's a second pillar for me that makes uh, systems of AI really work, which is data science. And that's to derive knowledge and insights from data. Not just making pure predictions, disregarding what structure is in there, but really modeling real world problems and, and even very interesting or very important aspects of visualizing both data and the predictions is something that's essential. Uh, but that alone wouldn't be enough because really to close uh, to make an AI system truly intelligent, you kind of have to feed back and, uh, and have these actions that would be taken typically by people. So when you think about, uh, you know, a couple of decades back, um, there weren't any computers and people were doing the ordering tasks. So this task of translating a prediction like a forecast into an actual order demand, an actual order unit, 
that's called uh, making a decision. Um, and uh, the branch that really has um, dealt the most with it is econ economics or econometrics, basically the science of ex uh, establishing causality and designing markets for optimal decision making. Um, and the, what we're all probably familiar with is this notion of establishing causality through A-B tests and how can you do this with a minimal number of interventions but also quasi-experimental methods where you can establish causality even though you can't really randomize um, an outcome. And the idea of auctions as mechanisms to design markets and, and fair allocations. And it's really only those pillars together or the application of each of them, like the algorithmic choice, the modeling to an actual uh, problem that's currently done by human decision-making and then establishing what are, the, what are the key drivers, what are the variables that if I need to ch if I change them and if I, as a basis of a prediction, I'm actually going to cause a change in the market. I'm going to cause a change in consumers. I'm going to cause a change in the brands of what they manufacture is what makes the system truly artificially intelligent. And uh, so now what's fascinating I really is uh, it's the application of those three pillars in the, in the space of fashion that has these unique attributes. So practically speaking on the consumer side, I think it's problems are specific to size and fit because size matters. And, and you, you have to solve that problem if you want to get away from the changing booth to, a, <clears throat> to something that, uh, to a system that can do what a tailor can do, a very well trained tailor can do uh, himself or herself, which is to really make sure whatever gets offered to you fits. The notion of optimizing for outfits rather than just general recommendation and taking subjective attributes such as style into account and also making uh, modeling that experience of of uh, going through shelves and browsing around, um, which is very manual today, even the notion of which categories are, are good categories to browse in. Um, on the brand side, so some of the um, problems that are very specific uh, to, to the fashion space is the notion of size charts. And I speak about sizing in a second, so you see what I'm talking about. And lastly, I mentioned forecasting, but it's a really big problem because of that long lead time I was referring to. And actually, because of the two-stage process where in order for a jacket like this one to be manufactured, it first gets one, a few samples get, uh, get produced, get shown at fairs. Um, then there's a commitment to be made. So there's already a first forecast task that a, that a marketplace has to do, whether they're existing online or offline. And then actually, um, six months later, throughout the season, do refined forecasts that are a bit more short, uh, shorter lead time in order to have this optimal inventory. So it's very unique and the problem of forecasting really and in the space of fashion really um, uh, elevates the need for probabilistic forecasts and, um, and forecasts that are coupled from a very long range forecast to a short range forecast um, with respect to order constraints. I mentioned also circular fashion. So this goes more in the economic space. So the problem of, um, you know, how, when, when, when your wardrobe is the smallest warehouse you can think of, because once it's at capacity, you can't really put anything else in there. So how do you create mechanisms that allow for consumers with themselves to exchange fashion? Um, very particular problem to the fashion space, because as I said earlier, fashion doesn't get consumed at the same pace that it typically lives, uh, lives to be worn. Now, Having defined what fashion AI is, I, I started to speak about these two aspects that I find very particular and that you don't find in my experience in any other, um, any other e-commerce or any other uh, retail space, which is the notion of the single unit that gets exchanged on a marketplace has to fit the consumer and the consumers have very unique bodies, very unique properties like, uh, you know, well, well over 10 measurements of their body that have to be matched in order to make sure that uh, it's actually a product that fits you, so the sizing problem and the fit problem. Um, and the notion that in the fashion space, uh, shopping actually happens at the level of an individual item, but the judgment um, happens at the level of a full outfit. So let's talk about the sizing problem. Um, and to start with, I wanted to share a statistic that might not be widely known. So, a couple of months ago, what we've done is we went through our catalog um, and we looked at uh, women upper garment, the women upper garment category. So it's a, it's a subset of all the catalog. And we didn't look at all the brands, we looked at 2,000 of our brands, not the two and a half thousand. And we checked each of the different size 
um, size denotations. Um, so we looked at some, you know, uh, a dress uh, shirt might be labeled as an XL or an M or an S, or maybe labeled as a size 48. Um, and so that would be a unique size. And we wanted to know is the sizes, because that's the units that um, the consumers have to understand. Ultimately, to their task today is that they remember that number or that, that token and they match it to what they think their body is like in that part of their body, whether it's upper or lower body. Um, and we looked at how many unique are there and is this a constant figure? So when you look over the time period of 2015 to 2019, look at these 2000 brands, what you see is an interesting uh, statistic, which is the number of distinct sizes just on woman upper garment category has actually almost doubled over the last five years. So that's an interesting statistic. But the other interesting number we found is what the y-axis is, which I've been hiding. And uh, we set up a, uh, a survey because I'd be really curious what you think. So if you go on the session Q&A, there is a, there's answers, four possible answers for you to vote on. Um, so for everyone that thinks the y-axis has basically the tick marks in the hundreds, be great if you could vote on that one. Um, so currently I see zero votes for everyone. So if you go in more on the session Q and A on the left bar, um, and then search for Zalando, you're going to find it. You're going to find these, uh, these votes. If you think the Y axis is in the thousands, the so one, two, three, four thousand, please vote there. If you think it's in the tens of thousands, different unique sizes, please vote there. And if you think it's in the hundreds of thousands, um, please vote there. So I'll pause for a few seconds. So you can, uh, you can cast the vote and then I'll reveal what it actually is. No one seems to find the voting tool. You need to refresh the page to see the votes, uh, Ralph. Ah, that's good. Well, that's not good, but it's good to know. I see. So there's three votes on, still four votes only. So. Uh, um, for votes, uh, three votes on the tens of thousands, one vote on the thousands. So the true answer is in the tens of thousands, um, which I found startling because if I'm imagining shopping, um, of course I'm shopping more rarely in the women, uh, not so often the women upper garment category, unless I shop something for my daughter or my wife. But if I had to imagine that I have to be able to maintain in my head 10,000 different size denotations depending on brand, um, I'm of course overwhelmed. And then what we looked at is the top 80 brands only. And we looked at the number of distinct sizes they had themselves. So you'd think maybe it comes through everyone having their own sizes. But if you simply look at this in our brand sorted by number of distinct sizes that they offer, there's a significant number of brands that actually offer well over 40 different uh, size and uh, denotations. And by 30, you're almost hitting the, the medium of that. And that shows you a bit of the problem that the sizing space has for fashion, because it isn't some, it isn't a, a, a unit that is easy for the consumer to understand, not in the online world, let alone the offline world. Um, and that's why um, you'll, you'll see later, there is something that uh, most people do, which is to remember the size for a particular brand that fits them and then stick with that brand. And, um, and that's known as something that brands themselves do uh, to create a brand affinity. Um, the second one, um, why you see that happening a little bit, um, we address that one, it's this notion of vanity sizing, where brands want to make you feel good um, by basically shifting sizing a little bit or introducing their local sizing um, in order for, if you truly have a waistline of, let's say, a meter, um, marking you as an M or even an S, it's going to make you feel good, even though that's not the calibrated measurement. And both these effects lead to this enormous number of, of sizes. Um, so the second thing, oops, I wanted to uh, show you is, um, is basically related to, not only is this a problem for the consumers, it's also a problem for the business. So if you look today for every packet, for every uh, fashion item that gets sent out by Zalando, um, half of them return. Um, so 50% do not uh, come back because for some reason or another, the consumer doesn't want them. And if you look a bit deeper and for all the returns, how many come back because they're purely the wrong size as indicated by the consumer, that's a whooping 30%. And if you then add it 
the percentage of everything that's not only a size, but the consumer didn't fit, didn't find it fits them well, um, you get well over 50% for that also. So it's a whooping 25% of purchases um, that have a size and fit issue and thereby lead to a ascent and return, which isn't a sustainable, uh, environmentally sustainable way, let alone from a business perspective. So it's a real problem. Not only is it complex for the consumer, it also is harmful for the environment and, and for the business. So what data could you possibly use to, um, to make this solve this problem now with algorithms? Because the problem is not a new one. The problem's been around as long as I can think. Um, so the first source of data is obviously on the article. Uh, of course, I forgot the simplest one. You could uh, get a tailor, but that's not really gonna scale if you're online um, unless, we, uh, you know, unless you send out a tape measure and instruction manual to measure yourself. But the first source of data is obviously on the article. So there's two ways that today it's possible and made easier to get um, such data. The first one is the garments themselves already get measured when they get designed. So um, certain cuts digital in the digital fashion space make it actually possible to have a digitized measurement for the shoulder length, the, the leg length, the, uh, um, the waistline of a particular garment, including the properties. But also um, there is now simplified uh, uh, machines to, to measure them uh, directly. Um, second model, which is a bit more expensive, but there's also a lot of uh, devices developed now to actually truly scan um, the garment after it's been manufactured um, so that you have the exact measurement, including, uh, <coughs> including how it falls and behaves. Um, that's a costly one. You need many cameras. You need a lot of computer vision algorithms to, uh, to align key detect key points that you detect in the frames across several pictures, but it is a possible technology today. So that'll give you a digital representation of the article. Now you need a digital representation of the body. What kind of data could you get there? So one of the sources of data um, that you can use and we have been using is a questionnaire. So the simplest one you see uh, is actually from, uh, from one of our products and from myself. Uh, it's a questionnaire that asks you not only your height, uh, sorry, it's in German, and your weight, but also what's typically your uh, waistline um, and you wear a jeans, what size you wear, how, <clears throat> how long are the legs, um, what type of body figure do you have and what time of cuts do you prefer given what, you, what feels comfortable for you on your body. So that's a useful piece of information if you have that from a customer. It doesn't give you the exact centimeter measurement, but, uh, but an indication. And today that's more and more commonplace to, uh, to, to uh, have this available or get collected. The second one for the body alone is obviously, um, there's now a plethora of, of uh, devices that can take images and with the images, there's now algorithms and a well-established field in the computer vision space to have models of the human body, so-called simple SMPL models um, that uh, get reproduced from 2D, from a sequence of 2D views in order to then take that 2D bo uh, 2D, uh, 3D body model um, and measure uh, simply the key measurements that are used in the manufacturing process of the fashion items. So that would give you both um, the size of an article as well as the size of a body. Now, in front, with respect to fit, there's also data you can use. Um, and more and more of this becomes available, which is purchase and return data. So purchase simply what have the customer chosen to, uh, to buy in the size they bought it at. And then as I was just mentioning, some of it is returned, in fact, uh, 50% and whenever an item gets returned, we're collecting very detailed feedback either offline. So you write a little note on the returns, uh, return slip or um, you can uh, specify it online. Is the article too big or too small? That's extremely valuable data because it gives directional. It gives you an ordinary relation between the measured article and the non-measured but existent measurement of that part of the body. Second bit is, uh, is fit data themselves. So suppose you didn't return the item, then uh, there's more and more questionnaires in application flow that allow you to specify, did that actually fit you well, um, given you didn't send it back, it didn't, obviously wasn't so large or too small, or did it not fit perfectly yet, or was it in fact for someone else in the household and you didn't do the recommendation. Again, very useful source of information to, uh, to solve the size and fit problem. And the third one, and I'll refer back to the brand example, is the reference size. So it's the brand and the size of something that fits you today. When you, can, when you think of this huge number of, uh, of brands and sizes um, that we, we saw earlier, 
that's a good reference point that anchors a particular customer um, in in the uh, in the dimension space. So we have this uh, we have this offered. So when you when you go shop as a as a female customer, um, you can choose to say what brand and then what size in that brand am I currently wearing and fits me very well. And that helps algorithm um, to relate articles and sizes as well as body relative to the sizes of the articles with each other. Now, what algorithms would you then use for recommendation? There's two classes that we've been working on and you'll hear more about it later. One is what we call size flags. So it's the idea that you aggregate across consumers, um, but you look at the shift that an, uh, that an article has with respect to the sizes um, that is specified. Um, so think of it as there is a, a, you know, an a priori uh, probability that it will actually be the correct size, that it will be too, or too large. And given the return data, that gets, uh, can be updated in a posterior probability. And when we have that, then it gives a, a strength of the indication, does the item run too, slar uh, too large or too small? And that's being told back to the customer um, that can then at the time of buying, uh, basically independent of their measurements, implicitly or explicitly taken, get an indication across all consumers that buy that the denote, uh, uh, denoted size. This typically is a size up or a size down based on the returns data um, and the fit data that gets collected. Um, second one is size recommender. So here we really take the individual person size into account um, and then have to estimate an offset from the size that the uh, that the, the article has to the uh, size of the consumer based on the fit data that's for that particular user. So this is where typical user item recommenders come into use. Um, uh, so it would basically, rather than saying it generally runs in a size larger or a size smaller, it would actually recommend you the size that um, we believe based on past purchases and based on body measure, all the sources you saw before, um, what the recommended size is. The interesting thing, we did a user study on this, and consumers trust the first, the size flex, more than they trust the size recommender, because uh, you know intuitively they also believe there's a lot more data, which is true um, on the level of an article alone, where you aggregate across all customers, than on the article on the data level that is for an individual, like myself only. Um, so in terms of the trust and uh, usage, the first one um, has a larger number there. The second problem I want to talk about is the outfits challenge. So the outfits challenge uh, refers back to what I mentioned earlier, um, where people don't go and just shop for a new a new sweater. Um, the new sweater has to fit the trousers, has to fit the shoes. Um, and that's something, uh, a feature we call get the look, where when you see someone and, and you think back of before the advent of, of e-commerce and, and fashion, um, you know, the, the, the shopping was actually happening through, uh, through models that were wearing um, full outfits um, and you could sort of judge the look of the entire combination. And so the, the problems, the AI challenges that we have with outfits is twofold. So one is that of generating an outfit. So roughly speaking, you have one item that the consumer states they have or they're about to buy but you know it belongs to a complete outfit. So now you need to complete it with all the other, like that shoe should go with a particular dress and glasses um, and maybe a handbag or the personalized outfit generation problem where you have the identity of the individual plus the few or one item, one or few items they already own or they're about to, they've put in their card and you wanna give them a recommendation that makes that dresses them completely so that would be, if you just uh, take this example, uh, a shirt, a jacket, um, a dress, and, uh, and glasses and shades. There's a second problem. Even if you compose that, um, if you present items like you saw before, it's called pack shot rendering because it's literally how it is in the box, in the pack that you receive. Um, but the, the far more appealing, the far more relatable uh, representation of an outfit is not four images of a shoe and a dress and a blouse and a, and a, and a, and a sweater, but it's actually a model that wears all of these together. And as you can imagine, even taking a shot of a single item on, on, a, on a real person is a serious endeavor, but taking the combinatorial explosion of all combinations of outfits on people 
is impossible to solve. So what you see here is actually some work from, uh, from our research lab where this person never exists in real life. It's a, it's a generated individual that's human looking and wears all these, these items. That's the second problem. How do you represent visually appealing the, uh, the outfit? I wanna focus on the first one um, and just sort of outline what kind of data can you use for that? So clearly you can also start with part purchase and return data as you have it, um, but that's often not indicative of the whole outfit. And the second source that's really a lot more indicative is the wish list when people place items on, on a particular list um, that they're wishing to purchase, but maybe they already have or, or it's not in the budget that they're shopping for. So there's an example of a complete outfit here. The second one is questionnaires again. Um, and so we have this uh, product Zalon where we are offering um, such questionnaires. So where you would offer example combinations. So here is a six typical outfits and I'm sure many of you have used to shop online for, for a fashion have, have seen such questionnaires that actually give an idea of what combination of uh, jacket, trouser, shoes, shirt, belt, um, do I feel appealing and goes well with me and I would like to could imagine wearing. And that data is super helpful because that's actually the full output of that process that we have to generate. Um, but we have to mark, mask some of them or, or um, condition of some of the items that I already own or I've already decided to, to purchase. So how would you do this from a recommendation perspective? Well, naively speaking, uh, or the simplest one, um, a starting point, um, is to combine the expertise, the intelligence of fashion experts, of rules. So these are typically in the form of reproduction rules. So a business outfit is a t-shirt, basic, um, a bottom, a knit, pairs, jacket, and a shoe. Um, and each of them either reproduces into another uh, category or into individual SKUs, which means individual products. That's expertise that, that, uh, that uh, stylists have. And you combine that with the notion of item compatibility. So which two items really go well together because consumers have bought both of them or consumers have liked outfits um, that both of them occurred in. That gives you a strong indication that two items like a pair of shoes and a jacket or a pair of shoes and a shirt, a pair of shoes and a, and, a, and a jeans go well together. And so how would you do that? Well, you'd embed those um, the representation for them it could be based on the image and, and meta information. Um, you can use a CME SNET model. Um, you're going to hear more about that later. Effectively, to then produce a probability that two items um, really belong to each other. And then, if you use the reproduction rules together with the similarity, um, you basically uh, condition on some of the on the item that's already bought, um, and then so it can generate sequence can score based on the compatibility likelihood can score a sequence of, um, of fashion items until a full rule has been produced and the compatibility of each item mutually with each other is very high. Um, that's often done by greedy search. Second one is if you don't wanna use the fashion rules and simply be data driven, you can use a, think of it as what we saw, there's really a sequence of, of identities of items that go well together as a complete outfit. So one way to do that is you could say, you could imagine you, do a mapping from one item to the next. So from that shoe um, through the trousers and then from the trousers to the shirt and from the shirt through, um, through the jacket. But in between, you treat it like a, a time series that has no, ocean, uh, no, no notion of uh, time. So back and forth, there is a representation. So in the neural network space, you use LSTMs. In a graphical model, you'd basically have an HMM that goes in both directions. Um, that bundles, that couples the mapping from one item to the next in sequence. Um, and if you have such sequence of pairs, complete outfits available, that's a good data source to train such models, which would then implicitly embody the, the fashion stylist expert knowledge. Of course, you can alternatively use uh, what's known as attention models. So rather than having this temporal order that you have to break, um, you'd use models that predict conditionally, um, but mask the, the first choice, mask the mask through attention, um, the, the mapping of later choices. Um, again, you'll hear more about that later. So those, those are approaches right, that would actually leverage the, the data that is today available um, in larger and larger numbers to complete, to generate complete outfits. So to conclude, um, 
I think uh, hopefully have convinced you that fashion is a really new and emerging area, which is enabled by having digital fashion and having IoT sensors, mobile phones, um, ways to measure garment um, in larger and larger numbers and in a broader availability um, in society. Um, also, the size and outfit problems are very fashion specific problems for recommendation and they have a profound, they have really a profound impact on the algorithmics of both of them. Um, and hopefully I was able to also convince you that improving size, fit and outfit is really a win, win, win. A win for the brand um, because it knows its customers better, a win for the customer because there's less returns and a win for the environment because there's less, uh, you know, returns. Um, finally, if you did find that interesting and you found some of that work interesting, there's two ways to stay connected with us. We have a Zalando machine learning community online on pagesbeamery.com Zalando. Um, or you can join us to work on many of these problems, uh, on all these problems and others. Um, we have many jobs available. Thank you. Thanks, Rod, for the great presentation, uh, telling us more about two of the dimensions that distinguish fashion from other e-commerce activities. Uh, the floor is open for Q&A. Uh, there are two ways to do that. So we could either put the questions, please put the questions into the session Q&A uh, in VOA, or if you would like, you can actually ask the question directly from Zoom for people who are already in Zoom. So please use this opportunity to ask the questions and I make a pause for the questions to come in. Thank you. I'm reloading, but I don't see a question. Also from the audience in uh, the Zoom meeting. Um, ah, there's one. Are th is this system being used production already? Uh, yeah, um, everything I've shown you is was snapshots from the live page. So um, as I said, some of it was, was taken <coughs> um, with my data. So yeah. Every screenshot you saw there wasn't a test uh, page. Um, the one thing that is, and I, that's why I denoted it by work in our research labs that's not used is this fashion render that you saw were um, pack shot items. So the idea of a whole outfit being, being uh, recomposed on, on a model. That's, that's not in production, but all the rest is. And there is more talks as far as I understand from the program and from talking with the, with the team and the colleagues um, they'll actually give more details of how they got in production, what accuracies they had in their experiments. So I hopefully give you only a glimpse and didn't steal the thunder from the presentations of my colleagues. We have 87 people in the Zoom. Uh, yeah, that's why I stopped my share. <laughs> <laughs> to ask questions, this is time for a question and any question is a good question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Shangfan, we can hear you. Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah I'm uh, curious about the questionnaire that you mentioned. mentioned. So, so do you um, ask this questionnaire multiple times during the year because I would assume because of the fashion trend and people's preference might change and because of um, maybe uh, because of the pandemic, for example, which might change people's preference. Do you uh, ask, like how frequently do you ask people interact with the people and collect the data? 
Yeah, Shampan, really good question. Um, today we don't force it. We force it. The, we need it the first time when you get connected to a stylist. Um, so the Zalon model is that there is a stylist um, and you, right. you represent your preferences once um, and then you do build something um, which is the stylist will collect a complete set of uh, a complete set of outfits, more than one with yes. outfits instructions. And but it, she or he does not force you to take it. I have myself, I, I'm a customer of this. I like this outfit here. I have myself updated it, but there's no forcing function to right. update it. The, o the only one that's there is to provide more, want more images that helps actually the stylist of how you look in the clothes or in related clothes. But it's a very, you have a very good point. I think it is necessary to update that regularly because taste changes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. We have one on the... Uh, uh, hi, hi uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, hi. So I just uh, want to ask about the, how uh, Zalando manages uh, different data from different brands. I mean, how, how are they harmonized or standardized? What kind of model is used in this case? Yeah, um, I, I give, give you a rough um, uh, introduction. I think there's some colleagues here and if they, if they wanna refine, they should jump in. Um, but roughly speaking, we basically look at the triplet of size, um, what we call commodity group. So commodity group is the, we had upper garments, we have lower garments, shoes. So size, commodity group and brand. So that size is only a valid identifier in combination with a brand. So a Google, you know, a Boss 52 is not matching to a Levi's 52. That's okay. of course where that means that you know there isn't generalized there isn't a mapping from within brands, and and there may be projects and if people uh, from the team of here uh, can uh, want to refine, um, that would be. That'd be great. I'm not familiar with it, but right now we make sure to take this into account by creating a triplet of a size, which is does the size refer to your upper body? Does the size number mean something? Does the size come from a particular? And that's why you mentioned the, the reference when yes, dealing with that's the right. Size. That's yeah, why I mentioned really the reference amazing. size because that, yeah. that way you can go from uh, Dorothy Perkins 52 to yeah. Gap. Some kind of calibration, maybe mechanism or. Yeah, it's the end time yeah. mechanism of what the industry is doing, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. There is a question on the, um, and I think we're running up time, right? I think I was supposed to finish by 4.45, but I will answer it briefly. How is working at Zalando different for you compared to your past positions on big companies like Facebook or Microsoft? Um, I can... Uh, Maybe I can give you the simplest answer. Um, I have always, apart from two years of my life, I've always lived in Europe, um, which I love very much, but uh, it's always been challenging to work um, here and then work with colleagues all over the globe, in particular West Coast. So one of the big uh, differences is that it's now my, you know, I work in the same time zone that I live. Um, so that makes it extremely nice to have a normal day. It starts at nine and finishes at five. Um, but Apart from that, there isn't really a big difference. I mean, it's a, it's a great set of uh, very innovative colleagues. It's a culture of, of entrepreneurism. So of, you know, try ideas out, failing, fail in order to learn. Um, so there isn't a huge amount of differences that I would see on uh, the way problems are addressed, the way boldness is, is lived. But not living, working on two times is a big difference that I really like. Thanks, Raf, for that uh, answer. Um, we have a few minutes, uh, so we can actually take uh, two more oh, okay. questions, three more questions, and there are some coming up on the Wuhan. Is there a way better way to get rid of the other questions? Can you elaborate about the outfit picture generated with separate items picture? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I was talking, um, uh, generally speaking, to so the, the high level, the, the class of algorithms we're using is, is called GANs or style GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. 
but um, just pure just using them without any form of structure of the picture um, would make it difficult. So there is a decomposition um, that basically happens between what region is the face, what region is the upper body, the lower body, um, and then particular features of the garment are taken as constraints locked in for the GAN to then sample that space from a lot of images that we trained it on and we have ourselves uh, studios. So when you go on the Zalando page and when you go shopping, you'll see some high quality renders, which are photos taken from hundreds of models and hundreds of thousands of different um, fashion items. And that's excellent training data because we both know uh, we both we know demographic attributes of the of the photo models as well as we know exactly what pack shot images corresponds to what rendered image on the image that is uh, in the training set and so that's how the algorithm is able to learn that mapping from pack shot to real image and then the the uh, samples from from human models so all of what you saw there was generated out of the uh, the catalog uh, out of a model that was trained on the entire image catalog from high definition images. Besides size and fit and outfit recommendation, what are two other main challenges you're working on at uh, Zalando? Um, what are other main challenges? Uh, well, one of them I think uh, I was just talking about. So uh, the idea of uh, supporting the generation of complete outfit images is, is a big problem we are working on. Um, uh, I mean, a, a, another large one is in the space of search. Um, similar to we said that you in recommendations, you, you actually look for entire outfits. Um, in search, you often search is both more task driven um, and you're also looking for a completion of the outfit in particular, if you know what, uh, what garment um, a customer already has in their wardrobe. And as you might have seen in the, in the latest release we've done past couple of weeks, there is now an ability to see and review the articles you've already bought, um, what's in your wardrobe, it's coming from Zalando, so that helps to make it uh, easier to also influence our search relevance. Um, in the outfits generation pairwise compatibility, how to get the training data, the positive negative pairs. I imagine you have positive menu created, but negative one. Um, if it's okay, I've already stolen a little bit of thunder from a presentation that's to come. So I, uh, I, uh, I don't want to steal all the thunder and I'd leave that for, for a later talk where that's presented. Um, but your, your hunch is right. The positive ones are easy. The negative ones um, are not explicitly given. So there is a, something that we know from the information retrieval community where you often have um, positive examples of clicks, but you don't know for what wasn't clicked if it wasn't relevant. Um, last question is outfit generation preferences could vary a lot by customer age or lifestyle. Does your outfit generation approach take that into account in some way or are they the same for all customers? They're not the same for all customers, no. Um, but uh, <clears throat> again, there is a later presentation. That's why I separated between the two where you have a single item or you have the identity of the customer and the single item. Roughly speaking, in case you wonder, the, you still, I mean, you can't really, you don't have, can't really have enough data of the individual customer. Um, so what you end up doing is the way you represent the, the customer in to the algorithm as an identity is through purchase history, like uh, what types of products has that customer bought in the past, and that allows an algorithm to then generalize and, and effectively cluster them. Um, so that's uh, th that's the technique how you avoid this issue that you um, basically have with n customer and independent models. Well, I think I can refresh for the presentation. I believe we there is no more questions. Let's take a last look. No, that was it. I think this Perfect. is all questions. Thank you very much uh, to Ralph and to everybody who participated and asked questions.
uh, we take a short break uh, and we are back with our first paper session in five minutes, uh, which is about understanding fashion. And we have three papers presented. Thank you very much. See you in five minutes. Can the speaker for the first paper please uh, start sharing your screen? <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you see my screen? No, not yet. No. Now we can see the screen. Oh, we'll start at five sharp. Cool. No, I don't like the contrast of black. I wanted to do mute, but I can't do it. Ah, it's here, it's here. I extend my welcome to the new joiners, people who just joined us for this session. This session is about uh, uh, understanding fashion. So as uh, we all know, fashion is a complex domain and understanding fashion can take uh, many different dimensions. Uh, in this session, we have three papers that can serve as a basis for many of the challenging problems that we discussed through the day. Uh, the first one is from Diogo about uh, the importance of brand affinity. Uh, Diogo, back to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Reza. Um, so I'm for, from Farfetch, and I'll be presenting you the work we conducted at the recommendations team. Um, uh, and Farfetch is the leading platform for uh, luxury fashion. So we have more than 10,000 brands, and we sell worldwide. Um, so the agenda for today uh, will follow five steps. So context and motivation, the method that we employed offline and online experiments, and then conclusions and future work. So regarding context and motivation, uh, this is like luxury fashion is a very special domain. There are a lot of particularities, but one is that fashion trends, they change very fast. And that's no news for you. Like everyone knows that uh, fashion trends, they change but maybe in this domain is even faster. For example, there's micro collections, collaborations between uh, designers that make things uh, quite unpredictable. Then uh, luxury fashion customers, they expect luxury fashion, um, uh, uh, fashion savvy feedback and they are experts in fashion themselves and they want to have a feedback uh, like in descriptions, in recommendations, in search, that uh, matches their, uh, their understanding of fashion. And then high-end customers, they expect high-end experiences. Um, they, are, they are used to go to brick and mortar luxury stores, uh, be treated by their name, have a very uh, personalized experience, and they want that to be translated into the online world. Another interesting thing um, by discussing with our fashion experts uh, it's something that they told us, which is uh, fash uh, people consume luxury fashion the same way one consumes art. Uh, first, because luxury fashion can be seen as a form of art, like Beaux Arts, and also it can be seen as music in the, in the relationships that the customers create with their designers. So we have unique pieces uh, with, which uh, fashion savvy people want in their collection, and they will do anything to have, to have them. 
and also they follow the designers like for example someone that likes music and an artist will follow everything and go to concerts and uh, be always waiting for the new album to be released that's translated a little bit in our data so most of the search queries that we have in our platform they include designer or they are for a designer only so uh, it's very common that the customers they go to farfetch platform and, and they search for a particular designer just to check what's new on or what's on farfetch available uh, from that designer so brands are very important and uh, this creates some implications to our uh, recommender systems. One is that pure collaborative approaches are suboptimal in this space, uh, mostly because, for example, we have a lot of items with just a couple of uh, stock units. So whenever we find that there's a relationship between a product and an item, and we want to use that information to recommend to another user, it, the probability of that item to be already out of stock is very high. Um, so we have, uh, we cannot rely on pure collaborative approaches. Another thing is that user interactions are not guaranteed to mirror fashion authority. Even though our, our customers, we can uh, consider them as fashion experts as well, uh, their transitions and their implicit feedback not, not always translates uh, the fashion authority that is uh, required and that creates relationships, for example, between two brands. So uh, hybrid models for the win. We should provide users preferences uh, so, um, so we can give personalization that they, that they expect. And also the fashion expertise uh, that is uh, something that we can extract from our fashion experts. So how did we approach to this? Uh, we want to embed fashion expertise of brands since it's a very important topic and we should nail it in our recommender systems. So how did we do that? Uh, first, we get experts data, of course, then we pre-process that data and we train embedding models that can then feed the recommender system. So to get the experts data, we focused on five different sources of data, all text data, because we had a lot of, uh, of this data available for free. So First is product this inform information, the descriptions that are curated by our uh, production team, the brand descriptions with all a detailed explanation of what the brand is, uh, brand DNA, which is a, a, a subset of brands uh, with all the information about that brand. So who's the, art, uh, the artistic director, the motivation of that brand, etc. Fashion taxonomy, it's a, a graph built in-house that uh, connects brands and products and fashion attributes. So we can go to each brand that we have in our catalog and extract the most salient features. And at last, we also fetch some uh, articles from business of fashion uh, of the brands that we have in our catalog. So to pre-process this data, we follow the uh, typical natural language processing approach from uh, a normalization, removing uh, stop words, special characters, etc., et until we get the, the, vec the tokenized vectors. Um, one thing that I want to stress in this presentation is that um, brands do refer other brands, and we want uh, uh, that to be taken into account in the preprocessing, so we don't lose the um, the meaning of brand in the text. So, for example, uh, let's look at this particular product. So. We have a collaboration between Nike and Off-White, which are two brands. One, everyone knows, the other is uh, maybe not so popular. Um, but for example, imagine that we start to do the, um, the pre-processing straight away. Maybe Off-White will be uh, divided in two words because of the special characters, and we don't want to lose that. So we first identify in the text the, the occurrences of the brands, and we substitute that by a brand ID, for example. And we do that for uh, Nike in Off-White, and then we'll look for other brands. And for example, in this particular product, there's the mentioning to another brand, Jordan. Uh, so once we do all the pre-processing, we can have like these beautiful vectors that can feed the, the neural networks or the models that we want to train. With this pre-processing, we get uh, uh, a data set of 2.8 million sentences. We call it the sentence data set. And we create two extra uh, data sets uh, just for exploration. For example, we remove the, all the sentences that doesn't refer brands 
So in order to reduce a little bit the data set size, uh, and we also substitute the, um, the synonyms, the fashion synonyms, so we can also reduce the dimensionality, uh, the dimensionality of the problem uh, with the sentence uh, keep synonym. So, and then it's just uh, a method of training the embedding models. Uh, we focus on three models, word to vec especially the flavor of skip gram, then Glovey, uh, which takes into account the key occurrence of words uh, across uh, all the sentences, and also fast text with, um, with a character embedding part uh, in it. So we also, we do the combinations of um, models and, um, and number of components and data sets, and we try to, to understand which is the best combination. And we can do that in offline experiments. So basically the offline experiments, they focus on two parts. So one is for model selection to understand which is the best combination, and another one is for quality assurance. So for model selection, we train each combination uh, so we get the, um, the word embeddings matrix. We slice that matrix to get only the brand embeddings, and then we compute the brand-brand similarity. From that similarity, we can get the top five uh, recommendations for each brand, and then we'll use that to compare with the uh, other models. Those other models are uh, also, we call it the auxiliary uh, recommenders, and we build four based on navigation, and we also build one um, auxiliary model based on outfits data. So we have the outfits curated by our stylist, uh, stylist team, and we can go into each outfit, check what's the, what are the brands there, and create a graph that, go, uh, that um, connects the brands regarding outfits. So we get also top five uh, recommendations for each brand in the catalog. It's like roughly 10,000 brands. And um, we compare those recommendations with the uh, recommendations coming from the brand affinity from expert data. Uh, we compute uh, recall at five, um, precision and NDCG, and then we arrive into the to a decision making uh, problem. So uh, which combination should we uh, choose? Uh, we selected the board, uh, board account. So it's a method for single winner in elections. And the best combination seems to be word to vec with 120 elements in the vector size and the data set uh, of sentence. That's very convenient because it's a less, uh, le less complex um, ETL than the, other, uh, than the other data sets. So for productization, that's very convenient. And also we don't need uh, annotated data regarding fashion synonyms, which is very expensive. So for quality assurance, we did the typical uh, TSNI projection, and I will only um, uh, pinpoint uh, an interesting case that we found. For example, if we target the word Gothic, which was also mapped in the word embedding model, and check what's the closest brand, the closest brand by far is Alexander McQueen. I'm no fashion expert, so I don't know like if uh, fashion, uh, Alexander McQueen is Gothic or not, but actually their designs, they focus a lot of using skulls. So maybe there's some relationship here. So we are uh, comfortable of sending these, uh, these uh, models online and uh, we will do that um, shortly. So basically on one experiment, we conducted some A-B tests uh, to understand if there was a, a positive feedback from our customers. So first was a pure content-based approach to, uh, to check if the users were sensitive to this new source of information. Uh, we use the consideration user phase, in especially in low stock listing pages. So uh, we have listing pages from a lot of brands that doesn't have a lot of items. So the user uh, arrives fast to the bottom of the page. And because of that, we want to recommend other, um, other brands that have some affinity to the brand that the user is navigating. For that, we use the, the same approach that we use for the offline uh, uh, model and we get the top five recommendations for each brand. We did a Navy test, and as you can see here in blue, it's the alternative, and it's statistically significant, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is different enough uh, to the control, which is in red, uh, and we have uh, an expected uplift of up to 3% in our metric, which is non-click based. 
so it seems that brand affinity model um, are adequate to user expectations in uh, this, uh, this touch point. Um, so then we also tested the brand affinity boost. So uh, for that, we, we took the consideration uh, user face space and also the post purchase, uh, post purchase. For consideration, we went to product detail pages with and without stock. We have different layouts for each. And uh, for post pur purchase, we focus on the operational email. Um, how did we do that? So, for example, we have already recommenders in, in each of these touch points. So, uh, we wanted to include this information uh, in an easy way for productization. And uh, the way was okay, let's uh, keep the recommender control and uh, create a new recommender of brands and join the, the vote scores uh, with, a, with a weight uh, alpha, which can be defined by business or optimized. Then we, we did a A-B test and also we, we can see a, a statistically significant difference and uh, PDP's uh, recommendations seem to be improved across uh, the board. So uh, we expect an uplift of up to 10% in no stock PDPs and up to 6% in uh, PDPs with stock. So as a conclusion, it seems that um, the modeling of experts domain uh, improved the user's engagement in all the settings tested. The, also that brand, uh, brand embedding seem to reflect the nature of brands correctly. Uh, as future work, we want to test the brand embeddings against other approaches. For example, the auxiliary uh, models that we did uh, it would be interesting to do also an online uh, evaluation in order to compare the performance of uh, offline and online. Uh, and then we also want to, to use, uh, improve the personalization of this brand affinity model. So uh, it's true that we want to keep the fashion authority, but it's also interesting that we can take uh, users' preferences into account. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now open for, um, for questions. And if you want to know more about our work, there's a link there to one of our blog posts. Thank you. Thank you, Diego, for the straightforward presentation. Uh, we have few questions uh, in the system, but also we are open uh, for the Zoom questions. I maybe read the first one for you. Uh, okay. How do you deal with uh, sub-brands like Adidas Originals versus Adidas Performance? Uh, like if they have different brand IDs, we will consider them as uh, different brands. I believe Zeno, you are also in the Zoom. If you had follow-up questions, please, you can also ask. Um, no, that's that's okay already. Thank you, thank you, Diogo. Thank you for the for the nice talk. I found it uh, really interesting. Thanks. Um, yeah. There is the second question. Do you compare the brand affinities computed from text to ones computed from customer interaction data? Uh, you mean online? Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, so, have you compared the brand affinities? that you mm -hmm. would compute from text to one that you could compute from customer interaction data on online, yeah. Yeah, like uh, we, have, uh, we have brands into account in our models already. So that uh, is already mirrored in the, the recommenders in place. Uh, so we wanted to have an extra edge uh, with the fashion expertise, uh, which we didn't have at, at, until that moment. Uh, but for example, th those auxiliary models like based on clicks, uh, uh, orders at wish list and other implicit feedback, we compared in the offline experiments and uh, they were uh, very different. Like uh, there was a, a very low precision, for example, comparing the recommendations coming from the, the brand embeddings from the text and the brand the uh, recommendations coming from the navigation data. So, um, so I think that means that um, like we compared, but not in an online setting. So that's why the uh, future work would be interesting to boost also the recommender with that uh, extra information from, from navigation. Hey Diego, a follow-up question. Why would you think that uh, the customer interaction didn't win or was far away? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So 
the thing is uh, uh, user navigation, they, they go to brands and they visit different brands uh, uh, across their journey as customers. But uh, when we compare the, the transitions and we show that to our experts, it not, not always uh, represents what was uh, like fashion authority. So like this, this brand is very similar to that other brand. So uh, in order to, to give uh, like, um, like in order to understand if this was uh, useful or not, we had to do a, an online test because if we were solely relying on logs, uh, the recommendations with the uh, fashion expertise were so different than the, 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 those before. So it was very hard to do like, uh, for example, counterfactual estimation of, uh, of the performance before. Thank you. There's a question about, did you consider BERT-based embeddings? Because they are yeah, yeah, pretty they are great <laughs> at these yeah. times. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, actually, we actually we we I'm hearing myself. Sorry. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so actually we tried BERT in other transformer approaches, uh, but not all, not all the, um, the, the text data is, uh, is as beautiful as the product that I showed there. So a lot of the, the descriptions are very basic and they are almost built uh, in an in a ordered manner. So there, there's no, not a lot of um, natural language uh, involved. So it's a lot of like, this is the product X with this and this and this attributes. And uh, so because of that, BERT models were not giving very good um, uh, embeddings at, at that time. So uh, then we discarded that and we went to more uh, like frequent, frequency based approaches like, uh, like word to vec or this simple, which doesn't take into account such particularities of the language, I would say. So one thing that maybe would be interesting is to use BERT for uh, like more free text approaches, like uh, for example, the, the articles from the internet and the, the descriptions that are more uh, rich regarding uh, natural language, uh, and then use maybe some statistical focus approach in the other type of information. Thank you, uh, Diego. So we are at time. Uh, for those questions that we didn't get the answer, please reach out to Diego uh, during the breaks. Uh, we have intentionally made those breaks so that we can discuss. Thanks, and we- Thank you very Diego. much. Next uh, speaker, please. So, hi. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, I do hear you, and we do see the slides. Okay. Uh, yep. So here we have uh, Mohammed uh, presenting to us the probabilistic color modeling of clothing items uh, to you, Mohammed. Thank you, Reza. Um, okay. So thank you, Reza, again. Uh, my name is Mohammed Arawi, and I'm based in Trinity College Dublin. And I'm going to present my work for holistic color modeling of clothing items. So basically, our objective is to extract uh, the color values and color names from clothing items. So th this is just the uh, teaser figures that, that we have this uh, image of this lady and we are going to extract the colors of clothing items and probably the skin and the hair. So for, for this simple experiment, extracted colors, this is just the teaser figure. So this is the sweatshirt colors and, and this shows the color of the pants. So why color? We, uh, color uh, is a very nice feature in, in, in fashion, and it's one of the most important cues in, in fashion. So it can be used in several applications, uh, rec recommender systems, uh, travel, uh, personal styling and shopping, and uh, many other applications. So, so if, we, if we think about color, let's talk about red. So this is a dilemma because we can distinguish and we like different tones of when we say red, so which kind of which red do we mean? So this is a problem that we have to uh, 
uh, address when we talk about fashion. And fashion is not about only, fashion is an art by itself. And I, I maybe extend the, the vision that uh, uh, Diogo talked about that uh, luxury is art. I think all fashion is about art. Every fashion is art by itself. And fashion is not about only dressing, it's about love and comfort. And then if we do this, we get to the beautiness afterwards. So, but there are a lot of problems in color extraction. When we think about uh, the image or the photo, we have first the problem of segmenting the clothing item and how many colors are there and how these colors interact. What kind of degradation or deterioration happened to that color. There are lots of other parameters like that affects the color that we perceive as human. And even the colors that the computer is able to uh, uh, present, or even if we model these colors and we, we want to extract them from the uh, items like the material, the fabric, the edge of an item, and the images, what kind of uh, imaging geometry illumination. Uh, I mean, is, is it where they take in indoors or outdoors and many other problems. So, so when we talk about clothes, we have this uh, nice dress and we see that this dress has like uh, around 10 to uh, 12 colors. So, so when we think about this problem, this problem, uh, there is a distribution for the, the colors in here. So apparently if we speak about uh, this model, we have to speak about a mixture of distributions when we speak about the multicolor item. And for, for a single, if we speak about a sing, single color in a single channel, so, so in fact, this is a Dirac delta density distribution. It's a, a spike that, because there is only one value. And I have prepared a simple experiment. This is a, an orange color that I generated with the curve. So this is only a single color. So, so it's on or orange. So when I consider only one channel, this is the channel, the green channel. This is a Dirac distribution. But in reality, this doesn't, that is, is not the case in reality when we, when we acquired the image. So I acquired the same image and then I did the histogram for this uh, color after acquiring the same uh, uh, image here. And it's uh, some kind of a normal distribution. But however, and still if we, if we move further to include different colors, then we have to speak about uh, Gaussian mixture model because we have several distributions that are superpositioned into the space. So in Gaussian mixture model, we have in this case, if we speak about uh, RGB space, it's a three dimensional distribution that we are uh, trying to figure out. And for K number of colors, if we have K colors in our model, that is if we know, we don't know the value. We usually do not know how many colors in the clothing item. So if we know this by hand, beforehand, this is the Gaussian mixture model that we have to estimate. Now, again, for uh, Gaussian mixture models are really, complex that they they are usually they are usually trapped in local minima and really they are really hard to estimate and in this case we don't have the ground truth of colors because everything is unsupervised and the number of colors k is also unknown which is uh, a very complicated which makes it a complicated problem now if, if we if we think about Clothing segmentation, for the other hand, this is an image of uh, a lady, and we have to segment the clothes. So, so this is the very first step, because we want to extract the colors from each piece of clothing. So for each piece of clothing, we have to segment it from the image, then deal with it separately from the others. And for this purpose, we use mask RCNN, these are very uh, powerful uh, instance segmentation models that can be used to, to extract uh, 
different uh, things and they have been used in a lot to solve a lot of other problems like uh, uh, segmentation of uh, real scenes and but we are using them for uh, clothing uh, in this case so we train them using uh, data sets fashion data sets like the modern data set and the clothes co-parsing data set but uh, again uh, since the Gaussian mixture model is complicated, we opted to use the k-means algorithm, a multi-stage clustering algorithm. Uh, and the first stage is the k-means algorithm. K-means algorithm, in fact, is a special case from Gaussian mixture model. And it's really simple, not simple, but we can deal with it. And, and in this case, we still do not know the number of colors because everything is unsupervised. So, so we had to deal with this problem. Uh, in this case, we use the k-means, then we uh, find the probability for each color. And in a second stage, we grouped the colors that we got from the k-means algorithm into different clusters. We did that using the uh, hue values. So, so the, hue, the hue values of the first stage clustering have been used in the second stage to estimate the colors that have made probably some pure colors. Then this is maybe the main contribution of our work. That is we treated the colors that we extract in this multi-stage clustering scenario as a probabilistic model. So what do we mean by probabilistic model? Probabilistic model. Because we have we, the, the cluster algorithm using usually generates different shades of the same color. We don't have a pure color, but when we cluster them using the mean shift or the differential clustering, we get some groups that have pure color, but they are like into different uh, types of coloring. Like here, for the probabilistic model, we have 30% dark blue but also we have in the same group 70% light blue. So we mix them based on this probability and we get the resultant color. So now for some results, uh, this is a simple experiment. We have done uh, several experiments and unfortunately we don't have the ground truth. This means we have to rely on uh, subjective measures. But we also generated in the paper, I'm not presenting here, several other color distributions about the fashion data sets and about the fashion uh, trends for uh, this year. So uh, for this uh, image, we have to estimate the colors for the, this uh, dress, this piece of uh, garment. And for the upper garment, we have this uh, nice blue jacket. So if we only use the k-means algorithm, we will have different shades of gray and black as well. But with our method, we can really narrow down the number of colors to two. And this is the results that we got from one of the commercial packages. packages. It's uh, called TINI. It's uh, a search engine that is based on color and they have this is the uh, url of the package and they have a multicolor uh, uh, color extraction engine that we just use to compare with the results we uh, are getting and for the jacket this upper garment uh, this is using only the k-means which is a single stage color clustering, this is used by some, uh, this has been used in the past. So uh, it generates really many colors because we do not know the number of colors, but we can see that this jacket has only uh, a single color. Uh, with our method that we are proposing, the multi-stage, the probabilistic color modeling, we were able to get 96% blue and 4% as gray. Maybe the 4% 4 could either be due to bad segmentation or maybe the color of the zipper and some other noise. 
So sometimes, but if we think about this probability, it's 96%. So we can, with confidence, say that the jacket color is blue. And this is the result we got from the TNI uh, multicolor engine. We did also an experiment for this dress. Uh, so we manually identified, I think, 12 different colors in the dress. So after segmenting the dress, we uh, get this result with the k-means plus the differential clustering. And then we tried also different variants of the multi-stage clustering. Uh, sorry, this is the result we get from the TNI. We can see uh, uh, that there are some false uh, colors that they do not exist in the dress. And we also see that we did this uh, TNI multicolor engine was not able to identify the white color in the dress. So we see the dark, uh, the black, and, and uh, we cannot say that our method maybe is better because we are relying on subjective measurement. But we hope that we can maybe uh, do uh, some data set in the future to address this problem. And we also tried different variants of our method, like here we're using, using k-means and mean shift. And this is using the fuzzy c-means just to compare what uh, uh, results can we get. So, so how about color and um, uh, concluding remarks in, in these two slides? How about color and clothing recommendations? Uh, we think that this kind of uh, Color extraction can play uh, an important part and role in personalized recommendation because the colors can reflect to the face, to the skin color, to the color of the eye. And people usually, when we think about luxurious fashion, people are, are usually, uh, uh, maybe they can pay an image stylist to pick them the right clothes and color. There are color specialists that people can pay to help them pick the right outfit. And we think this should be part of the next generation recommender system. That is to include the color components and the extracted colors from, and to embed them with the other features, that textual features and the other features that are used in recommendations. So we conclude that this model, I, th I think, has been the probability or using the probability of colors because this is a probabilistic problem and it has to be dealt in as a probabilistic model. I, it, it has been effective to in, at extracting colors and powerful because we do not know the number of colors. And it's a bit handy at producing palettes of clothing items. And in fact, we are currently considering Using making use of this probabilistic modeling and building to build a fashion recommendation system. And I conclude, uh, I'm five seconds ahead of schedule. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm open to any question. Thank you, Mohamed. The floor is open for questions. I don't see any uh, on FUVA, so. Meeting. If you have any questions, please. I maybe start. I had one. Could you uh, tell a little bit more about uh, your work with the recommendations and this color uh, probabilities? Yeah, we are just starting this project because we want to uh, make use of that because we have to not only use the text that we. we uh, collect from different uh, paths, but like we are relying to use the uh, personal characters, characteristics, the personal preferences, and the text that comes with the uh, clothing item that, that describes the, the whole item. All the information, we are thinking to use all the information in this kind of uh, recommender system. Thank you. We still have a few minutes for questions. So I make a pause to see if the audience has a question. Um, sorry, may I ask a question um, directly? Or? Yes, yes, please. 
Um, how do you intend to tackle this at the outfit level? So do you look at what colors um, uh, go together? And for example, things like too many colors on the top should be followed by not so many at the bottom or something like this. I'm not even sure yeah. that really true, but. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally understood because this has been uh, in our mind day one of this project. Uh, I think this is a part of the whole system because uh, we are going to prepare uh, what I say a database of all the colors. Then uh, we are going to, it's, this is like fashion co compatibility. So we are addressing this issue and we are going to use uh, maybe uh, deep learning Siamese net or other models, maybe multi-model uh, Siamese net. I'm not sure, but uh, this this is a very good question because this is uh, what we really aim as part of uh, our uh, solution. Um, uh, because you, because we what we have seen and what we know that and maybe we all know. I'm not sure if this will be the case uh, that uh, uh, the convolution layer is color. I call it color agnostic. It's color blind because it only extracts the features, but it, it doesn't give the color value. And we are interested in the color value because if we think about red, there are different shades of red, different shades and different, they have different names. So if we treat color as some other works that, that they treat color as a prediction model, like classification model, and we use uh, convolutional networks. Uh, I think this is, this is not gonna work to, to give us a really good performance if we speak about color and about art and about fashion. And the major reason is that uh, the convolution layer, the convolution layer, the feature extraction, which is the piece is colorblind, then the, the feature goes to the upper layers of the whole model. So, so yes, we are going to address this and it's part of our whole vision and the whole project. I'm not sure if I answered the question, so please uh, reply back if uh, you need further insights. That's okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Mohamed. We had uh, time, uh, maybe one question from my side. Do you have a plan to open source this or any activity on that side? Uh, yes, um, we, we, for, for this one, I mean, the next milestone, yes, we are considering this, of course, to do, to do this. So maybe we can stay in, in, in keep in touch and stay in touch to discuss this further, yeah. So we are going definitely to open source this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for thank the you. great talk. Um, thank you. We close this talk uh, by now and we move to our last talk for this session. Um, for the okay. people who just joined us. Uh, so this is the session on understanding fashion. So we are at our third paper and it is uh, about user aesthetics. Uh, identification for fashion recommendations and uh, presented by Eder. Eder, please. Okay. Back to you. Could you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's start. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. My name is Eder. I'm data scientist, part of the recommendation team at Farfet. And today I will present our work, user aesthetics identification for fashion recommendation. Here, a brief outline of our presentation. I will start discussing about aesthetics, then present our models, experiments, and some conclusions. So let's start. Uh, one of the challenges in fashion recommendation is how to personalize the user experience. In other words, how we could incorporate the concepts of fashion and style in our recommendations. And uh, we're talking about uh, customers that are fashion lovers. So they have a very unique sense of style. So in order to uh, deliver a good experience for our customers, we need to deeply understand them. And to do so, uh, it's uh, one of the main focus of this work. At Farfetch, we have um, our fashion experts defined a, a key set of aesthetic concepts. And these aesthetics 
reflect our customer style and preference. So for each of these one aesthetics, we have a dedicated product listing page for them. And also uh, the products in this listing page are curated by our fashion experts. Here, an uh, example from our uh, streetwear aesthetic listing page. As you can see, some products that resonate with this style. Uh, and we have aesthetics buffs for males and females. We have six for males and four for males. And uh, here in the presentation, I will focus on female aesthetics as we did in the paper. And has you, you could mean image. Uh, it's a very valuable source of information when we try to understand our customer. At one hand, we have the domain, expert domain knowledge in the form of, of the curated list pages of, uh, of with the aesthetics. And on the other side, we have the user behavior on our website. So, uh, here in, in our presentation and also the paper, we want to understand if it's possible to predict the aesthetics of our customers based on, on this data. And to do so, we trained various models over multiple sets of features. But before going uh, on our models, uh, it's interesting to note that a customer could be interested in more than one aesthetic, like when going out or read some sports. So we're dealing here with a multi-label classification problem. And to deal with this multi-label classification problem, we experiment both with classical models like random forest and also with a convolutional network. Uh, when training a random forest, we experiment both with binary relevance and label per set techniques. Binary relevance is when we have one model for each of the classes, one model trained for, for each of the classes. And also label per set is when we train one multi-class model over all possible label combinations. Talking about features, we experiment here with four different sets of features. Uh, we have two sets of features extracted from, from text, one set of features extracted from images, and another set of features extracted from user statistics. From images and texts, we used the information about the products uh, a customer have interacted with in our website. And when I'm talking about the user statistics, I'm talking about the number of sessions, orders, device, eight counts of categories and brands the user have interact and so on. We have like uh, 300 of those features. So we get those features, fit the model and predict the aesthetics for our users. Talking about image features, uh, I'm talking about uh, basically on, on embeddings, embeddings of, of the product uh, images. And uh, to generate these embeddings, uh, we have used the last layer of uh, pre-trained HasNet 15. This uh, HasNet was trained over the image data set, so yeah, uh, image net data set. And so for each product, we have uh, embedding, we have a vector, and to generate a representation for our user, we aggregate the vectors from the products the user have interact using like a, a vectoral math, mean, max, average, so on. And also we experiment clustering. Uh, we make a clusterization by the category of the, the products and we use the, those uh, clusters to have features for, for our our model. Talking about the text, uh, the text of features, we have two set, two different sets of features extracted from, from texts. Uh, and when I talk about text, I talk about the descriptions of the products the user have interacted. 
one of those representations is uh, using a classical representation, is uh, using TF-IDF, so we process the descriptions and uh, use TF-IDF to, to represent our, our words. And also we experiment with embeddings uh, using fast text. Here, uh, as in, in previous um, image uh, features, we uh, aggregate the, the description, the, the vectors for, for the, the user based on the vectors of the products the, the user has interact. Uh, I example a uh, picture from, from our convolutional network. Uh, we have here as input of our network, uh, the embeddings and uh, the products are the channels of the input layer. We pass it to, through uh, our network. We make some 1D convolutions, max pooling, fully connected layers and so on. And we get here to, to analyze the, a layer where we have one neuron for each aesthetic and we perform the multi-label uh, classification. Now it's time to show some of our experiments. Uh, but before going that, let's talk about uh, our data set. Uh, as we can see, our data set is very balanced. Uh, the difference from the less popular ones that that's artistic, not so big from the most popular one that's streetwear. And also our uh, users are inter mainly interested in one or two aesthetics. And it's interesting to note that aesthetics are not correlated with other, uh, which makes sense once the aesthetics are gen uh, generated by fashion experts. So here are some of our results. Uh, I will show here results for our random forest classification model trained using binary relevance. Uh, as before we perform a five, five fold cross validation and that stuff on, on our data set. Uh, also we have here uh, our random forest model trained over our each of one single set of features and also we've trained over combinations of our features. And uh, as metrics of interest here, we have precision, recall, F1, three default metrics here. Uh, and random force model trained with the uh, product descriptions using a TF-IDF is the, the model that performs better here. And uh, explanation for that, it's in product description, we have some words that are a strong indicator of the aesthetics preference. On the other hand, uh, the, the models trained using uh, embeddings don't perform, uh, are the ones that perform worst. And uh, explanation for that, it's uh, products inside the, the same aesthetic uh, are very different one of the another. So yeah, we have very different word embeddings, uh, word em feature embeddings, uh, embeddings, and it just could confuse our classifier. We also should note that our, our classifiers perform a way better than a uh, random classifier trained here for sake of, of, of comparison. And also going further, let's uh, take a look on our convolutional model. Here we have our best model from the previous slide. And uh, as you can see here, even uh, train it with different amount of data, uh, it has a little impact on, on the model quality, which is the opposite when we think about our convolutional model. Uh, increasing the amount of data, we get a pretty good increase in, in recall here. 
and it's interesting to note that these two models uh, have kind of a trade-off between them. We have um, a convolutional model with a bare precision at the cost of a worst recall in comparison with the other model. Breaking down our results by the aesthetics, we could note a positive correlation between the frequency and our metrics. And this could be an indication that most popular aesthetics are easier to, to classify. As an example, here we have a user that was correctly classified as a feminine aesthetic in some products that this user have interacted. Uh, as you can see, it it's make perfect sense here. So, uh, as final remarks, yeah, we here demonstrate that it's possible to infer the aesthetics of our customers based on our the information we have. And uh, as future work here, we pretend to test it in life and also uh, conduct a survey to further improve and validate our models. That's it. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. If you're interested in more, uh, as Jog said, we have uh, more information on, on our blog. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eder, for the presentation. The floor is open for questions, either in the Zoom meeting or on the Rexis platform. Maybe to warm up, I start with one question. Um, uh, how much do you believe that the recall and precision could be good uh, measures for uh, aesthetics problem? Uh, so I know I see that you want to do a survey and do some type of user research, but in particular for this problem, you have casted it as a classification problem. So I wonder if you would say that recall and precision is a good metrics for this type of problems. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, recall and precision are good metrics for this kind of problem. Uh, we have few aesthetics. Uh, and also we know that our customers generally uh, interact with one or two of them. So uh, the multi-label classification approach here makes sense. And also uh, our metrics uh, give us a good estimation on the quality of the models we, we have. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, I think Jog mentioned it. Uh, some users uh, tend to interact with few brands to to be kind of loyal to some brands. So uh, yeah, we know that the users uh, have a particular aesthetic. So this makes sense. They, they maximizing precision here. Uh, max or maybe maximize a, a relation between precision and recall. Is a good thing. Thank you. I, I am. The questions are coming in. A follow-up question from my side would is that. Um, so these aesthetics are defined by experts, fashion experts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how do you imagine that users that are not fashion experts would uh, interpret them? And you know, so there maybe there is a challenge also. Uh, yeah. The question makes sense. Uh, to be honest, it's impossible to to really know what in, in the mind of uh, a particular user. But uh, in general, uh, we know more uh, looking on at the data that uh, it makes some kind of sense for our user. But this is the kind of, the kind of question that we could also validate in our survey. It's the kind of question you could, we could uh, uh, directly address to our user. Thank you. There's a related question on Vuva. Uh, how did you come up with aesthetic groups? 
these are static groups. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these are static groups are uh, fought by our fashion experts. Uh, and also, these are static groups are presented in our website. So, uh, it's possible to navigate through these aesthetics in the Farfetch website. Thank you. Expert defined. So yeah. another question comes up. Uh, do the visual and textual features give similar or complementary cues for the item style? Visual and? And textual features give similar or complementary cues for the item style. Because you presented that you had both visual from the ImageNet, CNN, and yeah. also you had the text one. Uh, the answer looking at, uh, at the result is no. When we compare here the models that are combinations of feature sets, they give us similar or worse results than when uh, we trained over one uh, feature set. So it's kind of, they not, are not complementary. They most give us the, the same kind of information. Thank you. There is a follow-up question on this one. Do you think more advanced fusion techniques of these two, basically vision and language, would improve the classification? So a uh, more complex model to... So yeah, basically maybe. Them, because currently the ones we see, we could think of, uh, this is my interpretation of the question, we could think of more advanced ways to fuse them, to leverage both uh, benefits from both sides. Yeah, yeah, there is always the po possibility to, to think in, in, in more complex ways. Uh, looking at this data and uh, remembering that uh, we don't have uh, an infinite amount of data, uh, we should, uh, if we, we decide to use a more complex model, we need to guarantee that we have enough data to train that model. Here, we saw that we have enough data to train a classical random forest model. And uh, that if, when we increment the amount of data, and here we are talking about uh, a big amount of data here, uh, we, could uh, produce results for uh, a neural network model. So yeah, if you experiment with a more complex model, we need to guarantee that we have enough data. Thank you, Adair. Uh, we are at time. This, thank you everybody uh, for the questions and participation. This concludes our paper session on understanding fashion. We have 30 minutes uh, break now, and then we start with the second paper session on size and fit. Uh, the chair for that session will be Nima Dukuhaki, and I hope that we see all of you in half an hour. Thank you very much and enjoy your break. Hi, uh, thanks Rissa so much for moderating this session. Heather is really happy celebrating there. I'm gonna pause the I'm resuming the recording now, uh, and you can start the next session, Nima. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the second part of the workshop. And uh, my name is Nima, and I'm uh, hosting uh, this part. So this part uh, is entitled Size and Fit. As you have, may have uh, understood from the keynote, Size and Fit is a quite new problem. And also, it's a very challenging area. Uh, for this part, we have the pleasure of having two uh, papers. Uh, first one uh, titled Towards the User in the Loop Online Fashion Size Recommendation with Low Cognitive Load, which will be presented by uh, Leonidas Lefakis. And the second paper entitled Attention Gets You the Right Size and Fit in Fashion, which will be presented by Carla Jar. So I would like to ask uh, uh, Leo to start his presentation. I hope everyone can see my slides at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Then. Uh, yes. So, hello, everyone. My 
My name is Leo. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about user in the loop towards user in the loop online fashion size recommendation with low cognitive load, which uh, I'll get into in the following slides what, what all that exactly means. Uh, I'll just mention that this is work done together with my colleagues, Evgeny, Julia, and Reza, who are all part of the uh, size and fit team at Zalando. So first things first, uh, what kind of problem are, are we actually trying to solve? So uh, I'm not sure how many of you are actually familiar with Zalando, but it's, a, it's an online, online, sorry, an online fashion company. So users can browse uh, different articles that they like, and once they find something they like, like this uh, dress, they can click and go on the product page, and there we would like to offer them size or personalized size recommendation, right? So as you can see here in the red box, we recommend size 36 for this specific dress to the customer that has, happens to be browsing at the time. And uh, to put it another way, slightly more mathematically, assume we have a customer and an article. Uh, what we'd like to do is recommend the optimal size, which we call S prime, such that the probability that the user, the customer actually keeps the, the article is very high. Uh, and this, this quantity here, R, the return that status of the order, is actually very something very crucial for, for online fashion, fashion platforms. Um, so why is it important? Well, first of all, it has an impact on the customer experience. Obviously, when someone goes on a site and buys something, they wanna be able to keep it. They don't wanna be returning it because it's the wrong size. Um, returning articles also has a huge impact on platform profits. And it also has a very, uh, uh, sorry, a large environmental impact. So every time an item is returned, um, there's a cost in both money and in environmental impact. So that's why we view this as, as an extremely crucial and important problem. Uh, unfortunately, it's not only is it important, it's also very difficult. So um, the naive approach, which I myself also um, had before I became acquainted with the size and fit problem would be that, okay, my shoe size is 42. So, I mean, how difficult can it be to just recommend the size 42. But uh, it turns out that it's much, much more complex than that. There's a variety of reasons here. I've also only listed a few of them, why uh, the sizing problem actually is uh, so difficult. And one of them is related to sizing systems, which are a mess. They're very limited. Um, there's a whole different uh, number of sizing systems. So what means medium for one company might not mean the same for another company. In fact, even within a company, what means medium is not standardized. Um, there's what's called vanity sizing. So there's in fact brands that purposely mislabel their sizes. And uh, there's of course also the subjective aspect of size and fit, right? What may, what I might consider to fit me might not be the same for someone else who also has the same body type. So all these uh, aspects compound to make it a very difficult problem. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already saw this, uh, this plot. Um, when Ralph gave his keynote uh, speech, talk, sorry. Um, so actually not only is it a very difficult problem, but it's not even reducing, right? It's increasing. So instead of seeing fewer and fewer sizes as the industry somehow standardizes, in fact, what we're seeing is that the number of sizes is exploding. So the problem is difficult and it's becoming more difficult every year. Um, and another way to see the complexity of the size problem is through a tool, a mathematical tool we've developed at Zalando, which is part of the paper and I'll be presenting today, which is the, what we call the article and the brand offsets. So to build these offsets, uh, we consider a customer, we consider customers who happen to have bought an article in multiple sizes. Like for instance, if you want to buy a shirt, you might buy it in medium and large to try both and then return one. Uh, if we look at these, these customers and for this specific article, what we can do is calculate the mean between the sizes they keep and the sizes they return. And this is going to give us um, a quantity that's, uh, uh, sorry, a scalar that somehow quantifies um, how off the expectations of the customer were. So if, if, if um, sorry, if a customer bought a, a shoe in 42, 43, 44, and then kept the 42, it means that actually the, the shoe is slightly smaller than he expected it to be. But the, the size, his size is slightly smaller than he expected it to be. So now we have for every customer and for every article pair, these customer offsets. And what we can do is look at each article and uh, fit a Gaussian. And now we have the distribution for that specific article of all these offsets of the customer. So how off the expectations of the customers were of the, of the customers are 
for that specific article. And here, for instance, well, the mean could tell us that actually for this article, customers consistently underestimate their size or overestimate for that matter. Um, and this is, like I said, the article offset, we can go a step further and look at what we call brand offset. So now uh, we look at all the articles within a specific brand and fit a Gaussian there. So now uh, and we do it by, by actually weighting by sales so that more popular brand, uh, sorry, more popular articles receive a higher weight. And now we can actually look at the distribution of these article offsets within a brand and look at, okay, maybe a, maybe a brand is you know, consistently off, but it's consistently off by a specific margin or a, a brand could be all over the place. So by using these brand offsets already, we can do an analysis of what's going on. So for instance, um, if you look at the, the there, there's a course labeling here, of course, the problem is much more complex, but if you look at the red brands, you understand that, okay, these, these brands are off, but they're systematically off by a specific scale. So they just have a slightly different numbering uh, sizing system. There's other brands like the blue ones that are just all over the place. Not, not only are they off, but they're not even off in a consistent way. And just by looking at this dispersion here, we can actually see how complex the problem is of sizing. Um, sorry. So uh, that said, how are we actually going to try to solve this problem? Uh, well, there's different approaches. I think uh, Carl, uh, Ralph also talked about some of these approaches. Uh, Carl, who's after me, is going to talk about, uh, 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 sorry, state-of-the-art uh, personal, personalized reco. So um, from all these different approaches, which you can see here, I'm going to be talking about customer in the loop personalized size reco. So here, we're going to have a size record that doesn't, uh, um, sorry, is not based on prior order history of the customers, but rather by involving the customer in the process. And why are we going to do that? Well, because what we're interested actually is, but the problem we're interested in is the cold start problem. So here you can still see a histogram of the number of prior orders and the number of customers that have that many prior orders. Uh, and what you can see is as the number of prior orders decreases, the number of customers that have only purchased that, th those many articles increases. So actually we have a very long tail problem. And though there are very many um, successful personalized size records that uh, depend on prior order history, and Carl again is gonna be talking about one of those approaches, a lot of the customers on the, on the, on the platform aren't eligible simply because they don't have enough order history, because they're new, because they've only uh, purchased once or twice, or because they've purchased in another category and this is the first time they buy jeans, for instance. So to be more uh, concrete, what we want to do is learn how to predict customer size in the, specifically in the female upper garment, at least for the work presented here. And we want to do this without the benefit of prior order information. And how are we going to do this? Well, uh, we're going to use uh, a service called Zalon. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sure most of you aren't aware of Zalon, but it's a service provided by Zalando where customers can call stylists, give them some information, basically they answer a questionnaire. And from this questionnaire, the stylists can give them personalized fashion advice in general. Um, so this questionnaire is, is huge. There's more than hundred questions, but 20 of these questions are actually related to size and fit. So as you can see here, there's all different kinds of questions. Some of them remain uh, uh, general characteristics like weight, height, age, other ones specific to upper body, other specific to lower body. Some of them are just uh, measurements like weight, height, size, and other ones are related to, for instance, body proportionality. The customer is shown different images and told to um, indicate which body type is most similar to their own. So we're gonna use, use this questionnaire. And as some of you may have actually uh, noticed, the question top size is actually in the questionnaire. So um, in, on, on some level, I mean, the intuition would be, okay, well, now we've solved the problem. We just ask the customers, what is your size? And then when they go on the platform, we recommend that size and it makes our life very easy. But sadly, we found that to be actually a very bad strategy. So just asking someone what their size is, isn't a good idea to me, surprisingly. And actually what we found is that customers only really buy their own size 50% of the time. So even though they say they're a medium, when they actually go to buy something, they only buy medium 50% of the time. And uh, what was it? 
I mean, maybe not so uh, unexpected was that, in fact, customers tend to underreport their sales. So though, though they're large, when they're asked, for some reason, they say they're a medium. Um, and I'll just leave this as a piece of trivia, which I found quite interesting. In fact, what we found that was that male customers were more likely to underreport their size. So they were worse offenders in this category. Um, so since we can't uh, rely on intuition, what we did is machine learning. So we ran a lot of uh, experiments with all kinds of different classifiers. What we wanted to do was to build uh, a predictor that maps from this questionnaire data to the predicted size. So what did we do? We had customers for which they had answered this questionnaire and also bought stuff on the, on, the, on the platform. And from there, we trained a classifier so that when a new customer came who had filled in the questionnaire but didn't have prior order history, we could immediately predict their size. And what we found to be the best classifier um, was gradient boosted trees. So th the various details can be found in the paper, but basically gradient boosting trees are just a boosting algorithm, gradient boosting to be exact, which uses uh, classification trees as the weak classifier and then builds an ensemble on top of it. And uh, not only were they strongly perform, they, they performed the best, but we also uh, preferred them because they, they're robust for overfitting, but they also offer interpretability, sorry, interpretability which is something we're going to be using later on in the, in the study, as I'll show. So based on this, we were able to build this um, cold start reco. Um, here you can see the performance, the accuracy of the cold start reco we built, which is the blue line, versus a uh, state-of-the-art hard start reco. Um, again, the details can be, see, can be found in the paper. And as you can see, even for as many as 20 prior orders, a cold start reco that uses customer information outperforms the, the, the baseline that uses order history. So this was a very a successful study for us. This, this is actually live on the platform now. So we're able to um, serve these customers who are not eligible for the, for the, for the hot stop record. Um, but actually we wanted to, in this study to go even further than that. So um, the solution I just presented, like I said, depends on 20 size related questions. Um, what, we liked, what we wanted to do was start a, um, some kind of dialogue with the, with the customer. And immediately, of course, one realizes that asking 20 questions requires a very high engagement from the customer. So uh, what we wanted to find is whether there was a, a cold start record out there that had similar performance to the one we built, but had a, a smaller cognitive load for the customer. Uh, in, meaning in this case, fewer questions. And here's where the interpretability of these, of this, these gradient boosted trees came into, into play. So uh, gradient boosted trees actually allow you to look at feature importance, um, which features were used most when building this ensemble. And we found, uh, what was, which is also intuitive, that the most important features were weight, height, and stated top size. So uh, we ran uh, various uh, smaller size records, like records that use smaller questions, to see how exactly they perform in this case. Uh, so I hope you can see here, the red line for instance is that where we ask only for weight and height, and this is a, turns out to be a very bad idea. Um, on, the, on the contrary, um, two records we found to perform very well. The uh, purple line here and the orange right line here are either asking weight, height, and top size, or asking for the top size and then using brand information. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. Um, but before I continue, I'll say that uh, what was very important for us was that this top size plus brand does not involve personal data. So customers uh, are often loath to share very personal information and weight and height falls into that category. So for that reason, we've, we've, we believe that top size plus brand information is the best alternative solution to actually building these huge questionnaires. And what did we need by uh, brand information. Actually, what we did is we used those brand offsets, this mathematical tool that we developed to analyze size complexity. We use that in this case to perform a better record. Um, and now based on this analysis and this work we did, we've actually uh, have a second product live, which is called the dialogue tile. So now when a customer goes on Zalando, what we ask is, okay, look into your wardrobe and tell us one thing that fits you and tell us the size and tell us also what brand it is, because this brand information is very important. So what, what, what exactly do we do with the brand offsets? Well, we ask the customer for their, for their top size, 
but then we correct what they told us by this um, brand offset. And we can see here that it actually has a huge difference on performance. We can see it here in my previous slide, how much better the orange line is than the blue line. But here too, where we view brand offset with the full cold record, the original cold record that uses all the features. But even in that case, this helps a lot. Um, do I have one more minute, Shatala? Uh, we are actually over time. So uh, how many slides do you have left? In, I'll, go, I'll run through them. Um, so this is the information about the, the cold records. I'll, I'll just say one last thing. We have exciting new um, research where we are trying to build a classifier that uses, oh, sorry. Sorry. Where we're trying to build a classifier that uses both order information and customer information. Um, we've been able to extend the state of the S classifier, which is this meta learning. Um, I won't go into details again, you can see in the paper. But what was important, not, not only can we now build a classifier that has both order information and customer information, but also in this case, we can look into what is the best solution with low cognitive load. So, uh, Shata, uh, sorry, apologies for running over time. Oh, no worries, no worries. Uh, your work has been of uh, so much interest. You received four questions. So okay. let's uh, go through them quickly with you. Uh, and once again, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, so first question, do you have any strategy for meta user profiles? For example, me buying something as a gift. So this was not considered as part of uh, this work. Does uh, Zalando itself have strategies? I hesitate to answer that question. I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to reveal. I guess meta user profile is something that um, has to be, I guess, uh, with regards to the type of the thing that you're buying. Uh, that's right. I didn't answer. I didn't understand the question. If, if, if the question is, if they bought it for a gift. Yeah. For instance, me buying something as a gift. And uh, do you have any strategy for this uh, type of profiles? I guess. Uh, ah, to provide reco in that case. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I misunderstood the original question. Um, a, a very good idea. I, I can't say I've worked on that problem, um, but it's definitely something that sounds very interesting. So, yeah, definitely something we should look into. So the second question, uh, in production, do you switch over from cold start to hot start after certain number of orders like 25? Or do you have soft transition approach? Uh, well, the, the answer is both. So we have, well, this is not, these are not the only two algorithms that run on the site. There's a number of uh, algorithms and there's, there's a complex logic that, that switches between them. So um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem of choosing which record to serve is in itself a very uh, fascinating problem that we're working on. So, um, but we, we have looked into both those, both those uh, alternatives. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, in which way the top size plus brand is not personal data? You mentioned, I think, during your presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, per perhaps a good point. Of course, uh, we're asking about your personal wardrobe. Uh, so th there is an aspect to it, which is personal, uh, perhaps uh, labeling it as not personal is uh, slightly going a bit too far, but it's certainly much less personal information than weight and height or body type. For instance, do you have a belly or, or all these kind of questions which are more sensitive? Maybe the, the correct word would be perhaps not so sensitive uh, personal data, uh, but yeah, okay, um, point taken. Uh, in the live experiments, how do you deal with delay rewards? For instance, a customer can buy a product, but can return weeks later because of a size. Um, well, th these are, yeah, th 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 this is a known issue and, it, and it's taken care about. I mean, the, the data, again, uh, the data we use when running all these experiments, we, we are uh, sure that the, the return status is clear. So, so obviously we're not using data from last week to, to run experiments. All right, thank you very um, much. So again, sorry, it's, I'm very sorry. sorry. I, I, uh, I called you by the last name, I, I apologize. I just saw the, saw the name there and instinctively went for it. Sorry about that. No worries. Always. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Leo. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. So we move to uh, the second uh, paper. Uh, attention uh, gets you the right size and fit in fashion. Uh, which is going to be presented by Carl Jar. And interestingly, 
Uh, it's a collaboration between Zalando and Alex, who is an undergrad student, and this is worth mentioning. So I uh, leave you to present Carl. Well, actually, Alex is going to, to start presenting and I'll take over, <laughs> that, but thanks for the, the introduction. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Alex. I'm presenting with Carl. Um, this was a project I worked on while I was interning at Zalando. And our project is essentially a novel approach to recommendation systems for size and fit, borrowing from an architecture uh, that was grounded in natural language processing. So as an outline of our presentation, first we'll go briefly over the size RICO problem, which Leo also kind of covered. Next, we'll also talk about recent approaches. Um, then we'll introduce the transformer architecture, which is the kind of model that we were using for size recommendation. And lastly, we'll present a thorough evaluation of the results. So going over the variety of ways that we evaluated the model. Okay, so moving on to what is the problem we're trying to solve. So on this slide, you can see kind of uh, a summary of the problem that the model is trying to predict on. In the bottom row, you can see uh, support purchases, which is essentially a list of items uh, which makes up the customer's purchase history. And this is the data that the model is ingesting in order to make its final prediction. Um, on the upper left is the query article, or this is also you know, the article that the customer is trying to buy that we would like to provide a size recommendation for. Um, and so during training, uh, we give the model both the support purchase and the query article in order to train the model to correctly predict uh, the size. And on the right is the probabilities that the model outputs across the available sizes for the query article. So why is this a tough problem? Um, the first one, uh, first reason is that there is very high sparsity during purchase history. So customers don't buy that many items. And so if you look at, you know, the entire matrix of article size pairs, it's extremely sparse. Second uh, is noise. There's a lot of sources of noise. Um, for instance, every person has a different idea of what makes up the right size for them. Some people might want loose or tight fitting clothes. Second, there might be a lot of users behind the account. Um, like the question from the last presentation, there could be gifts. And the last one is that different brands and different, uh, different types of clothing have different size standards. So a 32 in Nike is different from a 32 in Adidas. And lastly, um, this is a, a, an emotionally engaging topic for a lot of customers. You know, people have expectations about what their sizes are. And often, if the recommendation doesn't fit that expectation, um, they might not trust the recommendation or reject it. And in fact, um, work from Vecchi et al. found that uh, customers often ignore the size recommendation and go with uh, their expectation, which actually results in them returning the item later on. So this kind of summarizes existing approaches to this problem. It's a relatively new area and you know, size and fit recommendation hasn't really had much work before the past four years. Uh, existing methods to approach this, the first one is kind of a traditional one which aggregates measurements across uh, different brands and uh, articles. And so you would consult this size table and you would have to measure your you know, foot size or your waist size or something like that and then match. Um, second, we could use customer metadata. So this is uh, engaging the customer in the process. So asking them, uh, you know, what's your certain measurements or, you know, scans of, of their body. Um, this could, you know, run into some sensitivity, sensitive personal info issues. And lastly is the approach that we're using, which is the history of past purchases uh, of a customer. Um, most work in the past few years has focused on this approach. Uh, of using purchase history because it doesn't really require any you know, private information. So um, what would we like the ideal recommender to do? Uh, most of these are fairly obvious, but I'll just point out a few. Um, we'd like it to handle existing size systems that vary across brands without having to teach it with an expert. Importantly, we'd also like to introduce new articles or new customers uh, into the entire data set without having to retrain the entire model. Um, and so we can just continue uh, using the model in an online scenario. 
Um, we'd like to use information across categories. So, uh, so a customer size of shoes should also apply to, uh, should potentially provide information on their sizing on shirts. And uh, number six, importantly, we'd like to be transparent. So since we talked about how recommendation is a sensitive issue, we'd like the model to be interpretable. Um, so going over some existing work, uh, this slide kind of uh, presents three different existing models. We chose this as a subset uh, of a lot of other work. Um, so these three just kind of represent a variety of different approaches. Per category, simply trains a model on each type of clothing. SFNet is a, a kind of architecture which learns a customer embedding and an article embedding and then adds them together. And meta learning is another new approach uh, that just came out recently. And so the green check means that it performs uh, quite well. The emoji like smiley face thing is like kind of in the middle and the X is uh, not so great. So you can see uh, importantly that um, most models kind of lack in terms of interpretability. So there's a, a kind of a problem of trying to explain the recommendation. Um, and also all three models are a bit, uh, are kind of in the middle about handling multi-user accounts. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the introducing the relevant work. Um, for this section about uh, the transformer architecture, I'm gonna pass it off uh, to Carl to talk. Okay, um, thanks Alex. Uh, can you give me the... I don't think I can, so I think I'm gonna have to click. Okay, forward. just then, then I'll just tell you, so you can go to the next slide, uh, please. So yes, the, the architecture we used is basically the standard transformer architecture, uh, where the whole history of past purchases of, of a customer is fed as input uh, to, the, to the encoder. And then this query article that Alex introduced is, is uh, fed to the decoder. And from that, we predict the size. So of course, in the support purchases, so the, the previous purchases, we have the size. Uh, and, and in the query article, we don't have the size and we want to predict it. Um, here, there is an analogy to, to natural language pro processing in the sense that we can view this problem as trying to um, translate uh, a query article into a size based on the context of the previous uh, purchases of a, of a customer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, uh, in this slide, we discuss a bit more the, the interpretability of, of our model. So in the, the attention computation, there's a, a weighing of, of past purchases that happens. And these weights are computed by the dot uh, product attention introduced by Vasvani and, and colleagues in, in 2017. Um, so we used it like the center computation that, that they introduced. And yes, as I said, the, the previous um, purchases are linearly combined. And compared to meta learning, the difference here is that for us, we have weights that are positive and sum to one. In the meta learning work, is also a weighing of the past purchases, but the weights can have any value, basically. So here, the, the, the weights are a bit easier to, to interpret. And also the fact that you have multiple attention heads, which can put focus on differently on the same set of, of previous purchases, can also help to like combine those in a single uh, explanation. Uh, for the for the customer. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, uh, if we compare to to previous uh, work or some of the previous work, let's say, um, attention and, and meta learning are are really similar. Uh, the only maybe added advantage of attention compared to to the meta learning work is the added uh, layer of interpretability, which is nice. And in a, in a, the, the next slides we'll see basically how those models compare in terms of, of the performance. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, model evaluation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so how do we try to evaluate the models? We do it on a, an offline scenario on past purchases. Then we also try to evaluate on cross-category samples. 
and multi-user user accounts. And finally, we we'll also try to, to evaluate in an online scenario where uh, the, the training, the, the, the model is fixed, the parameters don't change, but we keep adding purchases. Next slide, please. So uh, in the basic scenario, the offline one, we basically have a data set of orders, which we order by, by timestamp. And then we take the first 80% for training, then the 10% uh, following for validation and the remaining 10% for test. And basically for uh, the results we present here, we take the, all the purchases of a customer in the training sets as the past purchases, as the support purchases and the, the, the purchases in a test set as the query articles and we look at the, the accuracy. So attention and meta learning perform similarly, uh, roughly, uh, but it, we see that they kind of have a big a gap compared to, to some previous work. Next slide, please. Um, the cro in the cross category scenario, what we do is basically have test purchases in a specific category. So here, either upper garments or lower garments. And we take uh, training customers that have not shopped in that category in the training set, basically. And we evaluate uh, the performance of the models. So here again, we see kind of the step between meta learning and attention and the previous work. And we also see that uh, in this scenario, attention is a bit better than, than meta learning, uh, yeah, in terms of accuracy. Next slide, please. Multi-user accounts. So what we try to do here is basically um, take test purchases from a target gender. So either men and, or, or women articles and uh, form different test cases based on whether or not this target gender is present uh, in the support purchases of the customer. So that's why we have the three cases, a cold start, consistent, and mixed, depending on whether or not this, this target gender was, was present. Um, the attention-based model performs uh, pretty well in that case, uh, even compared to the, to the meta-learning. And again, both are like show a, a pretty good improvement compared to, to previous work. Um, so in some sense, maybe the, the attention computation helps the model um, overcome the fact that there are multiple uh, users and can try to weigh the different purchases differently in an efficient manner for prediction. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, the online scenario. So here we basically test uh, on customers which have not uh, purchased in the training set and to predict the first, uh, the first article for a new customer. So that the model is trained and the parameters is fixed and only the input changes. And for the first article, we have no information. So we use the popularity, the most popular size for the article. For the second article, we predict based on the, on the first article size. And for the third article, we predict based on the first two article sizes and so on and so forth. And we get this accuracy. So again, similar performance, but what's interesting to note here is that basically um, the, the performance is still similar to the offline scenario, the first one that we presented, meaning that this type of model can adapt fast to new customers without having to be fine-tuned. Uh, next slide, please. Future work, yeah, next slide. So as a future work, we would like to learn and look at the embeddings that have been learned by the model. Um, so customer embeddings, article embeddings, size embeddings, try to see if we can I don't know, get connection between brand, brands that size differently and, and understand why they, they send, uh, they, they size differently and try to get a correspondence. Maybe integrate richer article metadata so such, uh, such as fit, shape, and the, the type of material that's used. And finally, an important uh, direction for future work is trying to translate those attention weights into meaningful explanations for the customer. And uh, yes, that's it. Thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, we are open for questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Alex and Carl. So very interesting work, reaffirming that even with this, within this domain, attention is all you need. Am I correct? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you have received two questions. Uh, I'm uh, going through them. Uh, first question, are the attention scores taken from the first decoder layer or averaged across the layers? 
Ah, that's a good question. Uh, there, that's a very really good question. I mean, in the um, in the, in our the version of the transformer that we used for the paper, we only have two decoder layers, and we actually use the last layer, so the ones that the the layer that's closer to the prediction actually. Uh, so yes, good question, and we used the very last layer of attention to show the the scores that we displayed. All right, thanks. And um, for the second question. Uh, the decoder has two attentions per block, one intra sequence within the decoder and one uh, to the encoder. Uh, can the first one be removed since you feed just a single article in the model? That's also a very good question. And I actually, I said the standard architecture, but that's exactly what we do. Since we have only one um, query article and not a sequence as input to the decoder, we remove the the um, self-attention mechanism for the decoder part. We only compute attention with respect to the, the source uh, inputs, basically. So yeah, again, good question. And we did remove uh, the self-attention in the decoder in our work. All right, great. Um, so I would like to open up for uh, questions from the Zoom attenders, if uh, anybody has more questions for our speakers. Okay, we received the, we received the third question on Huba. Uh, in what context are you planning to use the predictions from this model? For example, boosting products in search that are available in their size? Um, not really boosting products, but more like helping customers find the right size. So if they, if, if they purchase in a brand and a a category that they really know, maybe they don't need that much help because they directly know which size to purchase. But if they're purchasing in, in a new brand, the, then we can come with this recommender system and, and tell them, we think that from what you've previously bought with us, we think that this size would fit you best. And of course, they're not compelled to follow the recommendation, but if it's a new brand and they feel unsure, um, what size exactly they should they should buy, then the recommendation uh, can be made through this uh, system that we presented and hopefully it helps the customer select the right size for them. Very good, very good. Uh, so if there is any uh, questions from attendance in uh, Zoom session, checking one last time. All right, then, uh, I would like to wrap up this uh, uh, part of the workshop. Uh, so we are following through uh, next with uh, our panel session, which will be hosted by uh, uh, Shada Jaradas. Thank you very much. And Thank thanks you. also to the presenters. Thank you. Uh, may I ask the panel speakers to unmute yourselves and to show your video, please? So hello everyone, uh, the panel members, can you please uh, unmute yourselves? We already have everyone on the panel. Uh, I think they're unmuted and their video is on. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great, so we will start the panel now that has the title Different Perspectives on Fashion Recommendation. And we introduced the panel members before, but we would like now to um, each one of the panel members to introduce herself, please. Let's start with Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica Graves. So I'm the founder and chief data officer at Sifloria. So my background comes in uh, commercializing machine learning technologies. Uh, that includes a deep learning for fashion visual search thread genius, which was acquired by Sotheby's, uh, Ralph Lauren, and Alvinon, where we work with customers like Burberry on size and fit. 
uh, kind of generating not necessarily online recommendations, but teaching them what sizes to produce in the first place. And a uh, new store where we were working on building a platform so you'd have uh, transparent in just, uh, inventory between online and offline. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Paula? Hi, um, so my name is, is Paula. I'm a senior product manager at Farfetch. Uh, we've been building our internal recommendation system for four years now, more or less. It's, it's been a strategic part of, uh, of Farfetch. Um, we've recently evolved to outfit recommendations. So it's, uh, it's been quite a challenge. The team is, is amazing. It's composed by data scientists, engineers. So it has been a great, uh, a great learning process and uh, we're fundamentally working the luxury segment. Um, but as we'll be talking about luxuries, it's quite tricky to, to nail. Mm, that's it. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Julia? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm a data scientist at Zalando and uh, I work in the size and fit team. The size and fit team is about maybe three years old and it, it really developed uh, um, very fast and uh, and it's been now a very key component of, of Zalando services. And uh, yeah, as, as you've probably understood by now today, it's a very complex topic. And this shows as well by how fast the team has developed. Yeah. Thank you. And Heidi? Hi, I'm Heidi Wolfley. I work as a researcher in the Wearable Technology Lab at the University of Minnesota. And my background is in fashion design. And I research specifically um, collecting, categorizing, and analyzing expert recommendation for outfits. Very nice. Thank you for the introductions. Uh, now we will start with the discussions. And I would like to mention that each topic that we will be discussing, it will be shown also on the slide so that the audience can follow with us. So since we have more than a member who works with, uh, directly with luxury brands recommendations, we would like to start with the question, what is the most exciting part of working in luxury brands recommendations for fashion? And also, if you can tell us, in your opinion, how can this be different from the mainstream fashion recommendations? So uh, maybe we can start with you, Jessica. Yeah, so I think the most exciting thing or and also the most distinct thing is that with luxury recommendation systems, you're sometimes um, the recommender system is facing the employees, it's not facing the customer. So we see something like that with something like Stitch Fix, but I think for the most part, the fashion industry has a reputation of not really, um, or heritage brands have the reputation of not really experimenting that much. Whereas I've found they are experimenting quite heavily with data science. They just, they generate recommendations that face employees and not necessarily the customer directly. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And uh, Paula, can you give us your opinion on that? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I think, as as Diog said in in the, in the talk, so uh, the way individuals consume uh, luxury fashion is very similar to the way they consume art. And so there's uh, an emotion there. There's desire. There's uniqueness, and that's very very hard to translate into business rules, or to even to try to understand, uh, even to explain the recommendations that the users are seeing. Um, I think that's the, the, main, the main challenge of the luxury uh, recommendations. And there's also this part of, uh, there's, luxury has been created through, throughout time. So there's this, uh, this component of tradition. And um, when you're talking on the online, as Farfetch is an online, online market, marketplace, it's, it's quite hard to translate that into recommendations. So you, may, you can recommend products uh, that, can, that can be considered pure luxury, but then you have things like collaborations, like you have, I don't know, Stella McCartney with Adidas, for instance, or Dior with Jordan, and that's, that takes, that complicates a little, things a little bit. So I think that's the, the, the problem with luxury is the, is the expectation. Um, there's, uh, there's lots of expectation around luxury, whereas on mainstream, things are a little bit more immediate. And so recommender systems probably have to account for different things that not this particular uh, brand affinity, the loyal to a brand, the creative designer that typically our fashion lovers tend to follow. Um, so there's things that uh, the exquisiteness part of it is very hard to translate into, a, into an algorithm. Oh, interesting. Um, do we have also from the other panel members if they have opinions related to this uh, topic, luxury brands, if, if you have worked with it uh, or something like that? 
Um, actually, I would have maybe a, a, not a comment, but a question. Um, how is it uh, in luxury? I expect that there's a lot of um, expectation around fabric as well and um, how, how high quality the fabric is. And this is something that must be really hard online to convey. And I was wondering if that was also something that you looked into or. I definitely see, I mean, so I've definitely seen experiments at places probably years ago at List where it's just really difficult to get a machine to understand what a texture was going to be like. Um, sometimes even to understand what the fabric was, <laughs> let alone like what it could feel like. So. I know that's something that's pretty difficult to embed. Um, but again, I think, you know, kind of echoing what was said before, I think a lot of it is kind of moving towards how do you recommend things to the stylist or to the, you know, customer service people who then are going to, you know, they might have additional knowledge about those items. They might have additional knowledge about the tech fabrics and textures. They might have additional knowledge about the customer preferences. Um, so especially if it's super high end, then we're, you know, people are not going online and clicking. They're like, they will literally call you and say, can you click on this for me? So um, you probably want to serve that to someone who has deeper product knowledge anyway. Very nice. Thank you for the, the feedback about this first question. And um, the second question is very related also to what we had in the previous sessions. And it is related to this challenging area of size and fitting recommendations. So um, since we have an expert in this domain, Julia, maybe you can uh, tell us about the biggest challenges that you find while working in this context of size and fitting recommendations. Yes, um, actually there are many, many, many challenges and uh, I will maybe um, list them, but I will only go through maybe two of them that, are, that haven't been talked about so much so far. So the list of challenges is very long, like size systems, of course, that's been mentioned, uh, manufacturing issues, so uh, where the garment is made and how, um, the representation of the article for the customer, also fit, uh, fit comes into play and adds complexity. Then we have the lack of informative, formative data, which I will go into in a minute, uh, together with sparse data, very sparse data. Uh, very big on the list is emotional cost, and I will get into this as well. And, um, and of course, um, common things to recommendation systems that our uh, uh, users have uh, different sensitivities when it comes to sharing data. They have uh, different maturity on the, on the platform and so on. So we have to adapt our products all the time and of course, multi-user accounts and so on. So, but this is more shared across recommendation systems. But I would like to say maybe something about the, the informative data, which is a bit missing and the emotional cost. Yeah. So about the informative data we have, so size is a number, basically. I mean, uh, there are thousands of them, but let's see them as numbers. And, and it's a very coarse way of presenting uh, the feel of the garment on your body. And of course, fit comes into play. And there are many ways uh, that fit can, can change the way your garment feels on you. And right now, uh, in most of the industry, what we have as, as um, scalable data is return data. And often it's too big or too small. And this is very, very coarse. So it's really hard to uh, make any sort of um, uh, tailored inferences based on this data. And uh, this is what I mean by lack of informative data. We don't like data, but we need to collect the right data. And so far for size and fit, this is, uh, we are at the beginning of the chain. And uh, additionally to this, uh, we lack a lot of data around sizes that are at the end of the spectrum. So um, this is really difficult to uh, make confident recommendations for the sizes because um, as Raf mentioned in his talk, if you think RECO is sparse, try size RECO, <laughs> which is one order of magnitude sparser, and especially in those sizes. So there's a bias in which uh, top selling articles and on top of it, top selling sizes, right? Mm -hmm. And the second uh, main challenge that I would like to get into is the emotional cost. So sizing has this very uh, uh, core particularity that uh, it can do a lot of harm before doing a lot of good. <laughs> And um, you can trigger anxiety, eating disorders, or depression. So you have to be very careful um, how you handle uh, size advice. 
And, um, but at the same time, it also, um, you can also do a lot of good because um, any size and fit experience is basically related to self-worth. We find this in our user research, right? And then of course it can be bad, but it can also be good. If you, if you manage to give a good size advice, then you make the customer feel very good about themselves. So they are proud to wear something that fits them. It flatters them and, um, and yeah, so it should be handled with care, but there is also, it's also a big opportunity. So if you make them happy, then imagine the loyalty that you can uh, yeah. build on. Thank you. Very nice. And uh, maybe we can also hear from the other members about uh, their opinion re related to size and fitting recommendations. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, suggestions or opinions related to this? Yeah, I would definitely say, I mean, having working, worked for a size recommendation company, so, you know, we had body scans of people, so it wasn't that we were guessing, we just, we kind of knew what general population sizing was like. Mm -hmm. uh, we, there's, the, the hard thing, I think, from a data point of view is that there's technical fit and there's aesthetic fit. So just because it fits my body doesn't mean I want that aesthetic fit. Um, so I think there's this challenge where we think there's one correct size, but there's actually maybe a spectrum of correct sizes depending on what aesthetic fit that you want. Um, also with measurements, you know, you can be distributed very differently with the same exact measurements as someone else. Um, and the second thing I would say was the reason sometimes the data doesn't work is because the sizes aren't produced that match the size of the population. So, you know, we, the average person, I would say the average American woman, if she walked into the biggest mall in America, like about half of them couldn't buy pants like they do not carry their size it's not produced at all so it's not in the data um, so i think that's a really big challenge as well as just mentally shifting companies to start producing sizes that actually match the reality of the human body and not just the kind of hyper idealized body right sure yeah that's actually a very good point and we also see this um, in the way uh, articles are represented on websites Right. It's not very helpful for customers to see always the same kind of body and you, customers go to great length to calculate in their mind based on what they see, uh, if it might fit them, you know, okay, my shoulders are a little broader, so, uh, and it looks loose on the model, so maybe it fits me, but, you know, and all this uh, intellectual gymnastics is, um, I mean, this incurs a cognitive load that could be avoided as well with better representation, I would say, or more diverse representation. Nice. And uh, now we will also have this uh, discussion related to outfits recommendations. And um, I'm interested in uh, hearing your opinion about the role of stylists and designers here uh, and the integration of their expertise, we can say, in outfit recommendation algorithms. So uh, maybe we can start with you, Heidi. Uh, as we said, you, uh, you are both a fashion designer and also you work in uh, outfit recommendation algorithms. So maybe you can tell us about your perspective on that. Yeah, I think that um, incorporating expert advice is really important, but it's also really complicated because expert advice is extremely subjective. So experts don't always agree with one another. Um, they often have very different opinions and their opinions are often accepted as truth um, without that advice having been tested. Um, so I think in order to best incorporate it, we need to determine whether or not there are any consistent truths um, and develop methods to test that advice. Um, if there are consistent truths, we might be able to better use that as a basis for the recommendations and better to predict trends and deal with changing styles all the time. I actually actually like to, to share that what we've seen at Farfetch because uh, having uh, what we call a human in the loop on our algorithms and the, the, the stylists have doing this, this um, uh, part of the job with us has been critical. Of course, at Farfetch, we, we do have a brand, so we do have a, a segment. And so probably our problem is a little, a little bit more limited. But actually what we found when we, we worked uh, with, uh, with our stylists to find and to build um, uh, an outfit recommender actually, and a very complicated and quite uh, dramatic uh, algorithm that recommended outfits. So we tried to, to, to uh, 
to teach a machine the, the, what was a far-fetched uh, uh, style, which is quite subjective. And we, we had to have the help of our stylists. So we have visual merchandisers that curate what you see on the website. You have the personal stylists. We have the stylists in the production. Um, we also have within the product team at Farfetch, you have people from style.com, from Netapote, so even from DeepMind. So we have all of these expertise embedded in Farfetch. And what we noticed is that when we used, uh, we actually built a little tool, uh, internal tool to, to, to try to get this, to pick the brains of our, of our stylists and fashion experts, uh, we got a very surprising conclusion that up to 80% of them were quite... Um, they, they were very, they gave the same, the same, the same answers, uh, more or less, of course, there was some, some deviation there, uh, but it was quite surprising. But uh, that actually helped us because we were expecting something much more, um, uh, much, uh, much less focused. And so would, would, which would mean that our algorithm would be a nightmare to train <laughs> and to, to have something by the end of it. Uh, and it was quite, uh, quite um, surprising that we saw that our fashion experts were, um, were a bit, um, you know, I don't know if they were, if they were, uh, if they, it's a matter of training because Farfetch has its own style, or if it's a matter of uh, the, the brands themselves, the luxury segment. But there was some consistency, uh, and that was quite, uh, that was quite surprising. And I think that it, it really may depend on the segment that you're that you're working in. Uh, Jessica, do you have uh, an opinion related to this? Yeah, I mean, I give a lot of talk to talks to students who are fashion design students. Um, I've also seen the fashion design process from the other side at Alsa Renta and other places. And I think it just creates a big question mark around what the future of these roles look like for design and merchandising, for example where, you know, we've seen, I think it was uh, Amazon and perhaps also Stitch Fix are starting to use algorithms to like design clothing or propose what should be in the next collection based on data. And when you say that to a room of fashion design students, they're just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like it's, it's, that's my job basically, or, or how, how is that interacting with my work? And I think from the art world, we'll see, we see people like So Gwen, who's an artist who works quite closely with the, um, with the machine arm, but she needed to produce like 500 plus drawings to even train it. So I think we're going to start to see an interesting thing where, you know, big corporations can leverage their employee expertise and internal expertise or sophisticated data tagging to create some of these systems. But then as uh, the independents get aware of it, they're going to start using all their artwork to train their own algorithms and perhaps make that part of the design process. Um, when I first started doing this talk a few years ago, it was definitely super resistance to it. Um, but in the more recent years, in the past, you know, past nine months, I definitely see machine learning and AI going into the fashion curriculum where people are starting to experiment with their own tools. So we're getting at a place where it's scaled enough for small independents to start thinking about how do I want to include this in my practice? And it's, it goes kind of beyond the big corporates. Yeah, true. And uh, I think in the context of size and fit recommendations also, uh, Julia, that uh, the role of designers and the stylists can play a great role, especially if they uh, can reflect the customer feedback uh, on this kind of whole uh, cycle of ma manufacturing. Uh, can you tell us your uh, opinion about this, Julia? Yes, of course. Actually, it's a, it's a significant um, effort uh, that is part of our team to um, bring back the feedback from customers that we have to brands and to show them how they perform in a multi-brand environment, which is uh, a unique position for us as a platform. Most brands are blind to what's happening to the rest of the brand, so we can offer this, this size intelligence to them. And of course, we try to build uh, trust relationships with those brands so that they end to maybe not influence, but help them adapt um, uh, what sizes they design for and what there's their perception of sizes. And, and um, actually with this, we are, we are really looking forward and super excited about the um, 3D design techniques that are, that are coming. And uh, we very much hope that designers um, are excited about this as well. <laughs> Um, because imagine if we had this in the first place, we could get like feedback much quicker and this loop would be very short, right? So um, 
We could um, also use this data to make much better recommendations. Uh, users could play around with the, with the design and uh, see the article in 3D. And uh, yeah, so that would be um, that would be one way of, of very, really shortening the loop. Very nice. Um, now we have a discussion that's related to or inspired from the current situation. So uh, with this COVID-19 that had an impact on uh, the fashion industry and uh, many retailers started to maybe move more to the online sales and uh, possibly reassess their uh, physical stores. So uh, maybe we can hear your opinion on the impact of the situation in the online recommendation systems or possibly if you have encountered related problems recently in your work. Um, the question is, uh, is for everyone. Shall we start with you, Paula? Sure. Um, so yeah, we we have seen uh, an increase in in the online the online uh, usage um, during during COVID, of course. But uh, at Farfetch, because one of the pillars of Farfetch and the strategy co uh, comes precisely with this re relationship that we have with our curators and our and our creators. So the boutiques that we have a very a very close partnership with. Um, uh, that uh, there was actually re reflected in an initiative after a couple of close uh, a month or so after after all, all of this uh, craziness started uh, that was called support boutiques and so we were we were supporting them by uh, not only um, helping them with their stock g coming online because the the the, the way farfetch works is well we do have the marketplace where boutiques can showcase their items online but we do support them also offline and they have their own boutique and we expect them to do that uh, that curated work that cannot be replaced uh, and and that's actually the value of, of the of the, the marketplace and so what we did during covid times and we're doing that now and it actually is now embedded in the current strategy of farfetch is to support boutiques um, to help them with our stock, uh, the, with the production centers, our production centers never stopped. Um, and so it's, uh, I, I don't think it had a, a, a huge impact, at least in the far-fetched reality, but uh, things shifted a lot, yes. Um, but now we have, if anything, we have boutiques even closer to us um, because we, we were able to support them though, during these times. We're still supporting them. Uh, during this time, and obviously in our recommender system, we had to, we had we had like a month <laughs> to, to also accommodate all of these changes. We had to change uh, thing from algorithms, APIs, data processing, because we needed to accommodate this uh, all of this new stock that was coming in, all of this new reality that we're we're facing. And uh, of course, we had um, we we were hoping that this was uh, fortunately temporary. Uh, but now the the great thing is that it's becoming a, a very solid part of Farfetch and boutiques. Uh, you'll see at Farfetch with a rebrand of Farfetch that were was announced like two weeks ago or so. Uh, we will have uh, uh, lots of um, this bridge between online and offline uh, even more more stronger than than it was before. So I would say that impact uh, it was positive. Uh, I don't, it's it's strange to say this in pandemic times, uh, but in fact, overall, um, we we could we could manage that, and it was it was it was a good thing. We learned from it, of course. Um, I could add to this by saying that I think Zalando had a very similar experience to uh, what Paula described, and. Um, uh, we we also try to support and one one thing that was um also surprising for for the company is that uh we kept i think we kept being quite operational with home office and so on because you were asking about the impacts and uh surprisingly we continued to deliver to customers at, at quite a good pace and also the one of the positive impacts that uh, we had was that this acceler acceler sorry accelerated digitization of processes so um, as was said, a lot of shops had to suddenly go online, which uh, was for some of them quite new and uh, they adapted uh, more or less uh, by necessity, but um, this, this means that now a lot more is digitized and a lot more is possible. So I think um, there's, also, there's also been a realization that it's, it's not so evil, not so difficult to be online, that it's possible and that now maybe the mindset changes. 
And uh, I also wanted to add that um, some interesting things happened for us regarding sales. Uh, so that distorted our KPIs, but for example, um, of course we had a, a drop in sales at first, but then slowly it went up again and the shift, there was a shift uh, from categories to others. So people started to shop more for sports and shop more for kids and shop more for discount articles. And that was quite interesting to see, but of course this also affects our KPIs. And uh, so I wouldn't say it's negative, but it was quite interesting to see um, during this period of time. Yeah, the, uh, the design side of the industry, I think, has been really, really slow to adopt technology and just really, really slow to change in the past. So I think the hope is that with the pandemic, it's shown people how important it is to work virtually and hoping it'll convince more designers and design teams to do more 3D modeling, to do more designing, patterning, sampling, all virtually, because all of those things um, would help recommendation systems as well, if all of the designing could be done in that way. I think probably from the point of view of uh, heritage brands that have lots of stores, um, the thing about the catalogs, they're typically completely disjoint from the e-commerce catalogs. So your store, even though you might have hundreds of stores or even more, um, the inventory is not transparent to each other and the inventory is not transparent to online. It's very difficult, messy, the pricing is all different. Um, the same product is called different things. So the biggest challenge I can imagine was um, just suddenly having lots of tiny catalogs and wanting to do something with it and really needs to think about localization as well, as in where where is an item gonna ship from because you know, mail slowed down. Um, we also saw, you know, lots of very popular products online that were unexpected, might have issues with getting things like buttons or zippers, so they just couldn't finish them um, because we're in such a globally distributed production system. Um, there are things that people could anticipate were doing well or were doing well, but they could not deliver on them. Um, so I think what, we, what I saw and noticed the most was just um, kind of a hyper localization of how they were talking to customers, what items were available, what needed to be available to what person browsing, because um, there's just so many disruptions. Uh, Jessica, are you still connected? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done though. <laughs> I don't know where it cut off, but. Very nice. And uh, now a topic that is very interesting uh, and related to fashion, which is like sustainability and it's, it's a link to fashion. So uh, we would like to hear your uh, perspective on improving sustainable fashion with respect to recommendation systems. So uh, who would like to start? Uh, maybe I can say a few words. Um... So about currently on the size and fit um, perspective, about 20% of items are, uh, that are purchased are returned for size and fit issues. So that's a lot of packaging and a lot of transportation that we would like to avoid. And um, currently with our size advice, we already reduce and we already uh, help on that bit. Um, our, the size and fit intelligence that we provide to brands helps in a certain way as well, but really what we are uh, really, really looking forward to is, is this 3D digitization of, of design and, and further down the line, of course, maybe 3D printing. And, uh, and I think from a size and fit perspective, the ideal would be to produce the garments on demand for the, for the size of the future customer. That would be, this is like the, you know, 10, 20 years uh, outlook. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can definitely say that I think what is not happening at all right now is recommendation systems in the context of what to produce and in the context of how to optimize the materials to produce. So it'd be really interesting to see, you know, now that we have like GANs that are, you know, recommending what items to produce, what if they can take into account data, like what fabrics are left over, um, what kind of waste fabrics are available on markets, um, and I think in terms of, there's just a lot of data in production that's not digitized. There's a lot of it's in PDFs sent from the factory with very specific terms that 
if you could optimize it better, you could both, you know, save money as a corporation, but also you could produce more efficiently. And so I totally agree with, you know, we, we definitely need to see a move towards on demand or closer to on demand um, or shorter production cycles, but we also could do a much better job of predicting what we're going to need in advance and stop bulk ordering giant amounts of fabric that don't get used up and hope that there's a secondary market for it. Um, those are probably the two, those are probably the main areas I think are kind of the, missing out the most right now for, for sustainability. Um, yeah, like Jessica said, I think um, using recommendation to recommend what to produce specifically to help designers design clothing that people are going to wear. Um, designers certainly don't want their jobs replaced, but they also don't want to design things that nobody's going to wear. Designers want to see their clothing being worn and enjoyed. Um, additionally, using recommendation to help people wear the clothing that they already own more effectively. Um, so most people don't wear the majority of their wardrobe. They have too many options and just don't know how to put together outfits. So using recommendation to help them put together outfits with things that they purchase and things that they already own so that they're wearing less, um, sorry, wearing what they already own more, um, buying less and making better decisions about what they are buying to eliminate waste, to eliminate all of the garments that are being purchased and not worn. In the, in the, in the sense of classical recommendations you all had or uh, using um, approaches that we already have, you have things like Good On You, for instance. Good On You is a, a quite new company, is a startup, uh, and they are very focused on sustainability. And what they do is they kind of give uh, recommendations for, for brands, so related brands, um, with uh, with that in mind. So they, you can uh, you can actually uh, like a brand, but you would like to explore other brands that are uh, equally sustainable or they have that they have that commitment uh, and recommender systems are already being uh, being used quite classically because it, it would be just a, a related brands algorithm um and they they're but they're being used like that and there's there's also uh, there's another another approach to it which is the uh, as jessica mentioned the pre-owned uh, of course we ideally we didn't want to 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 even produce it in the first place uh but uh, once it's produced, there's lots of things that we can do now, and there's this a new focus on pre-owned. Um, that's uh, that will uh, definitely, uh, particularly in a luxury fashion, because things uh, you you have a Gucci handbag that can quadruple in price uh, if it's pre-owned. So it's uh, there's this component also of sustainability that's quite implicit to to the luxury world. Um, that uh, that's already being being embedded in in the recommender systems, uh, but of course there's lots of other things that can be done. And and uh, well, once we have materials nailed, which is quite tricky <laughs> to do, I think it will be it will be even even better. So uh, now we would like to start with the questions and uh, from the audience. Uh, and also from the Zoom participants. Humberto, if you can help with the reading some of the questions uh, that, that we received. Of course, just a reminder that you can ask questions directly in the panel Q&A. Uh, and even better, if you unmute yourselves and, and want to ask a question directly to the speakers, uh, that is welcome. We have a few a few questions here, but let me wait uh, to see if anyone wants to start with the Zoom talking. Uh, okay, uh, I will start uh, and I will make a question linking uh, one of the main themes of the this Hexis uh, conference this year that is uh, conversa conversational recommendation system and that stuff. And uh, I mean, what do you think about that and what, how this could impact the fashion recommendation scenario? Um, so I, I can maybe start. <laughs> um, well, actually, so we, uh, in Size and Fair, we, we talked briefly about the emotional costs and we, um, Carl and Alex also in their talk, talked about explainability and, 
and interpretability of models. And um, we think to alleviate this emotional cost, it's really important that if we give size advice, we are able to down the line explain to the customers why we think that this size advice is the correct one beyond just saying that uh, it's based on previous customers, uh, other customers' purchases. But, um, and uh, there we could also engage in a dialogue box, right? And uh, we could also ask them about their fit preferences and, and ask. So I think if, if research uh, develops in that area, that would be really useful also for us in a sizing team perspective and really uh, in consideration of this emotional cost, that would be quite a, quite a gain, I think. have a question from the audience. Uh, how can we enable users to influence their recommendations? What are approaches beyond thumbs up, down, or observing actions uh, like views and purchases? Who uh, would like to answer? Uh, if I understood correctly, the question is around the, how users interact with recommendations and the control over recommendations, is that it? Uh, yes, and to, to yes, uh, the approaches to, to decide the influence uh, based on the recommendations. Okay, what? Uh, no, that, that how the users can influence the recommendations, like the approaches of the views and the purchases that can help in, uh, in getting better recommendations or better, more personalized recommendations. Can I clarify? Because I, I, I was asking the questions. Um, so, in general, like, so vanilla recommendations are just happening when you come to a website, for instance, or when you're using an app. But uh, of course, we want to put the user in the driver's seat, right? We want to give them a feeling of control and, and that they can that they can work with uh, with the system so that that you that you really have a like a, a positive experience. And the, the simplest approach is basically allowing the, the, the user to give feedback, like thumbs up or thumbs down, or even simpler is like to not give any feedback options and just uh, observing them and then and then and then uh, derive uh, changes to the recommendations from that, but but of course that may not be so satisfying for for the user. So, what are what could be good ways, um, in particular in fashion, uh, to 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 let users control their experience? For ex like I mean, a simple example would be like you they they can follow brands or they follow certain categories and so on, but there may be kind of like smarter things there, right? Yeah, I can, I mean, I can definitely say one of the biggest misses we have right now is there's no explicit measure of negative preference. So we have a lot of inferred uh, preference for things from clicks and views and hovers, but we don't really explicitly ever measure that someone does not want to see something. Or, or it's 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 um, it's something you could build into the interface. It's kind of difficult, I think, for if you're an existing kind of e-commerce or you're not an app, um, to think about ways to build that in that fits with the user expectation of that interface. Um, but for example, if you swipe left and right um, on different items, maybe you don't need to work as hard to understand exactly what aesthetic the user likes directly. Um, I think that's, that's definitely a big opportunity. I think there's a lot of research also on context aware recommendations. Uh, I've seen that at a few workshops where, you know, you set up the Rexis to basically try to guess what context they're browsing in before you kind of go all in on what you think they should see next. And I think, again, like it's not necessarily exposed to the users, but there's, I, to me, there's no reason not to. Um, you could definitely ask if someone's discovery in discovery mode, if somebody was, wants to purchase a specific thing, if they have a specific reason uh, that they're shopping that day, um, it could be helpful to have conversational commerce around that. It could be helpful to have human stylists around that. But uh, yeah, currently there's just nothing is, I think we, we do a lot of guessing what the user wants and, and not giving a ton of control over the experience. Um, and also keeping in mind that sometimes the user's not shopping for themselves in the first place, but they might want to switch out of a certain mode. And now your, your model for them puts them in a, in a certain mode forever. I would have that the personalization aspect of recognition systems is, a, I would say, a conference in its own. Because it's, there's so many things around it. And we've seen, for instance, uh, as you mentioned, Jessica, we've seen the interface part of it. We've tested it, the, the negative part, like, you don't, I don't like this recommendation. It doesn't work. 
because users they're, they're expecting maybe because they're within uh, well within farfetch and within the, the luxury segment and they're they have high expectations they won't they won't spend time say, saying that they don't like something they just move on and so we cannot trust that data <laughs> that, that's what we found out it's like it, it's not worth it to to, to develop the, the interface for that um the what we found that works is to give more and more um emphasis to the, the 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 more recent actions of the user because then you have things like users change their minds they they they, they can change seasons for instance you can have a, a floral pattern being being a trend a trend for a season and then you have a user i hate flowers don't show me flowers never again but then gucci just <laughs> launches a, launches a, a season or, or a collection with full of flowers and then suddenly the user loves flowers and that's really tricky to if you if we just nail that and if we just say okay the user told, told us that he doesn't like flowers never showing flowers we will we will be missing uh, on, on on the experience we will be we will be not showing lots of great things to him so we chose to explicitly uh, separate um preferences and inferred preferences so preferences as explicit when you go and you say i like this this and this and designer and then you have an aspirational side of it as well you can have uh, users telling you that they love gucci well everybody loves gucci in the luxury world but not all of them buy gucci or not all of them interact with gucci they like to be inspired by and uh, there's this uh, there's also because there's the emotional part of it as well particularly in a luxury fashion so there's and that needs to be taken into consideration because if recommendations were, were just based on what the user explicitly told us that he likes we would fail a lot we would be quite useless so it's really tricky to get the personalization aspect of it uh, right and um, what i would say is that if, what we've been doing and well sometimes we hit it and sometimes we don't it's to focus on the recency of the user we invest in real-time recommendations we invest in context aware recommendations so that's uh, focused on the, on that session of the user and that's what the user wants in that uh, in that moment in time because eventually seasons will change and their preferences will change but they won't be telling us that it changed and so it's really tricky to get that that part right but again it's i would say it's a personalization is a whole other conference <laughs> so yep yep i'd also just throw in that um guilt quite a, quite a while ago explicitly left one aspect of the recommender system completely random so looking for ways to bring serendipity in again just like you say you don't want to get stuck in well i hate flowers but actually tomorrow they love them um so they explicitly left the place where it'd be almost completely random what they would see in that spot because they didn't want to get the data kind of stuck into a corner uh sorry i'm trying to see if there's questions both in the audience or in the in the Woba, uh, chat so i'm going to give another opportunity for people to ask questions uh, directly here, just you mute, unmute your camera, unmute your video, uh, or your mic, sorry, and you can ask the questions. Okay, people are a bit shy, I guess. Uh, let me refresh, and there's a question about uh, are brands per country usually consistent? in sizes or are there brands who are particularly bad at being size consistent? So I guess this looks at size consistency both across brands and and countries. Um, so we won't name any brands here. <laughs> there will be no surprises. <laughs> but um, there are brands that are better than others or worse than others. Um, the key component to, to uh, see here is that um, it's multiplied by country and by brands. So um, uh, there are differences between countries that come from, uh, that come from just different ways of, of measuring things and uh, different ways of encoding things. And then there are brands that are, um, sorry, on top of this, there are differences that are brand specific, even though brands usually are within one country. But, um, and on top of it, um, there are cultural preferences <laughs> that also come into play. Um, so it's really a big mess. And, um, and yeah, so actually if you add some numbers, but like 
uh, I think per brand you might have as much as many as like 500 sizes in one brand, you know, uh, per, per article you might have as many as 100 sizes and it's really difficult and these sizes are completely different from the next article. And even within brands, it's not even clear that um, articles come from the same factory or the same designers. So they might be sized completely differently. So even within the brand, you have a lot of variance. So, I mean, the, the brand is already quite a good indicator, but it's, it's not a 100% uh, predictor of how the sizes um, behave. So, um, yes, it's, it's really a mixture of very different uh, very different things and country and brands add up um yeah yeah definitely from the perspective of kind of helping brands decide what sizes to produce in the first place they did try to be very regional specific um but sometimes a certain region might work well and one that they didn't expect kind of overseas um i would say there's also cultural differences in how you even separate the makeup of the people of a country. Like there's a whole other <laughs> lot of questions you can ask about who decided a country is sized in different ways. Like who's kind of making up that population? How do they categorize themselves? Um, what, what's a body type? How many are there? Um, so there's so many questions around that, but brands would try to localize and, and try to do something that's relevant to the guess like the, the median kind of size of the population um within kind of the bounds of what they were already doing so they weren't necessarily going to extend sizes like crazy or reduce them like crazy but they kind of look at how do we shift our medium to match a little bit better the medium of the of, of the potential customers here um i would say the other thing though is kind of like just like just like what you said like there's so many different size standards you can use even for the same item but the other thing to keep in mind is a global brand is not necessarily all coming from the same place. It's not even just that there's multiple factories. It's like they're licensing the brand name and someone else is taking over that country or that region. So you might not, there's no central office for you to kind of set the size standards. It's like that brand name is licensed to someone else who's running that region. So there's no communication um, at all sometimes. I would also add to this, uh, it's a great point, Jessica. I would also add to this that, because uh, you mentioned the M size, that many brands, especially in fast fashion, only fit that one size. And then they sort of infer what the measurements should be for the other sizes. And so this also explains like a lot of problems when you deviate from this medium size. So the, the more you deviate, the more problems we experience. And on top of it, the more sparse the data is. <laughs> And, um, and even if we had perfect size advice, it, it's not guaranteed at all that the garments would fit because of, of such issues. And um, yeah, that's... I see there's a, a few more questions, but I, I want to ask one myself to perhaps Haiti, because I, I think you bring a unique perspective of, let's say, working more with the users uh, rather than the platforms or e-commerce platforms that are widely represented both in the workshop and the conference and uh you know from your experience what do you see is, is missing uh or what is the biggest disconnect between between users and platforms um well i don't know that i so much as like work with the users directly i definitely don't work with the platforms um my research is kind of in just understanding how to make good recommendations and lasting recommendations um so I think what's missing is just that, um, the ability to adapt quickly for trends, for different preferences. Like we were talking about earlier, how um, one day someone might not like florals and the next day they might. Um, those types of things change so often with trends and it's not something that you can just easily ask users about. Um, I think most users probably aren't even aware that they're being influenced by things like that that they get biases from seeing things all the time so they might not desire to be trendy or think that they're following trends but they are without realizing it um, so the platforms have to be able to adapt really quickly all the time um, recommendations can become outdated really quickly additionally there's um in addition to building there's an outfit building an outfit there's also the way that an outfit is styled so for example are you tucking your shirt in or are you wearing it untucked um really subtle things like that that um is hard to do and just pulling things together on a platform 
Anyone wants to bring some additional comments around this? Maybe how you want to plan to address this or, or could potentially address these problems. Okay, we'll put them as more long-term problems perhaps. Uh, there's another question which is, uh, do you see scenarios, it, it's around the domain knowledge. So uh, either do you see scenarios where uh, domain knowledge can be used, I guess fashion domain knowledge can be used uh, on the ML modeling side of things and have you got experience with that? And I think we, we saw a paper, uh, we've seen a few papers already in the, in the workshop where there was at least some kind of input from, from different professionals in the field. What do you think is the main area of collaboration or, or domain knowledge that can be applied to ML? Um, so I, I'm sure there's uh, uh, tons, but I, I would like to say that even in size and fit, there's like a lot of expert knowledge going into our models. So we have a whole team, a whole sub team, sorry, which is dedicated to understanding exactly how brands behave and to help us uh, make sense out of conversions between countries, brands, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And without this expert knowledge, the team would not have been built. And uh, it was really, it's really important. And we continue collaborating with them. It's, uh, it's a joint effort all the way. So even, even in that aspect, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, if, even just to generalize, I would say often you're seeing it either at the back end where you're training algorithm using expert knowledge, or you see it as like the last layer before it hits the customer. It's like kind of a safety layer or a kind of humans in the loop system. Um, those are kind of like the two broad ways that you would see it done. Um, I've mentioned before, you know, you see Zara does optimization of what items should go to which stores based on feedback that can kind of be overridden by their individual um, store managers. So it's interesting how they, you know, build systems that will take all that into account. But that's that's pretty much where you see it. It's like we're gonna train something or we're gonna let, you know, let people overrule if they think the algorithm's out of control or wrong. Um, I know we also had efforts in in, uh, in one of our offices around um, building ontologies uh, in fashion. And I think this like um, I mean, we had um, we had experts around this, and this really helps us in our recommendations as well. So to understand like uh, how um, categories uh, relate to one another, and how keywords like winter, uh, summer, or party, what does that mean? What kind of categories we're supposed to go for when we see these terms, and um, and all of this was put together in collaboration with, with experts. Um, so that's also one direction that we can, uh, that we heavily rely on and experts on. All right, does uh, anyone has questions still in the Zoom where we're active here? You can just unmute yourselves. Hi, Reza here. I have a question. Thank you for the great discussion uh, from the panel. Uh, if we zoom out for a minute, I would like to know how the panel thinks about the future. What do you think that could be disruptive to fashion in the next two to four years? Uh, which trends that you may have seen in your experience that could really disrupt this industry? I mean, one of them happened with uh, COVID, but that disrupted many industries. Uh, so not at that scale, but in your experience, have you identified some trends? Thank you. I'm definitely seeing a little bit, I don't know how, how big it will get or not, but I'm definitely seeing digital fashion getting a little bit more interesting where people are buying virtual garments. Um, I'm, I, I had people starting to ask me about this a few years ago um, in their kind of fashion theses, but now I'm actually seeing people go out and purchase their virtual garments that they can only basically wear on social media, which is amazing. Uh, I think we're going to keep seeing the fashion and the gaming industry playing together a little bit better uh, where, you know, especially right now where people are stuck at home and online, um, we're starting to get closer where it's getting really cheap to have an avatar and it's getting really cheap to buy a virtual garment that it can wear. Um, I'm, I'm curious what that landscape's gonna look like when those two places start to collide. 
And I would also say life cycle analysis around virtual garments or even just, you know, virtualizing the production process and the design process. Like we've talked a lot about digital being cleaner than how we produce garments now, but we actually have not done very many life cycle analysis of, you know, what's going on with the, you know, training algorithms, like how much compute power is being spent, like what is the actual carbon footprint of virtual garments or virtual production process. Um, so I think we're going to start to see people asking for more data around what's the kind of life cycle of these, of these kind of digital things that we're doing as well. I, I was going to say it's probably not um, disruptive, uh, but I, I think that one of the main challenges would be because uh, given that the last, you know, last year or so, the, the, most of the luxury growth um, what happened around with uh, very young people, running people, it, they, they have a, a different way of interacting with, with, with fashion. And now that you had a couple of, uh, 20 years ago, we had online stores, which were quite, <laughs> quite sparse and uh, offline stores, uh, offline retail. Now everything's mixed. We know that it's not all everything moving to online. So we will have to account for both. Then you have uh, things like luxury and mainstream, but now you have collaborations happening all the time. Uh, and so everything is is mixed, literally is mixed, and it's it's a and th there's this rise of the personality of the individual, and I think that's uh, that's probably one of the the most challenging things for for recommenders and, and for personalization as well uh, is to make sense of all of this. How do we connect online, offline, and uh, luxury brands and mainstream brands? Um, and then uh, I think if, even if you even if you have um, a clear understanding of okay enough data on all of this just because things change over time that in itself it's a it's a great challenge i'd say um i would also like to see more in the future um social digital shopping so i think especially for fashion so traditionally a long time ago you would maybe sometimes go shopping with friends and get their opinion about um uh, how the garment would fit on you and so on. And, um, and there's a very strong sense of, of group uh, um, when you wear fashion. So of course, a lot of individuals want to be very uh, distinct and they use fashion for this, but also a lot of individuals use fashion to uh, belong to a group. And, um, and I think it would be great to connect people like this on our, on our platforms and, and bring back the social aspect. And this would also um, help a lot with recommendations, right? Because you can follow these people and uh, you can also follow influencers. There's already work around this at, at Zalando. But uh, so you can follow your friends and what they're interested in. And, uh, and also you could follow, for example, people who are similar to you, not just in fashion sense, but also uh, size. You know, you can realize on the reviews or comments that they're similar to you and follow them. And I think all this aspect is, is currently a little bit missing in platforms and that would be really great to see this happening and and on top of this adding uh, dialogue systems uh, that to be assist to like have real assistance that would also be for me an interesting avenue for the future um i think in addition to all of that i think the younger generation is a lot more interested in sustainability um, regarding their clothing than previous generations and i think that makes the focus on pre-owned, all the more important. Um, I think people want to feel like they're they're doing better with their clothing. So um, using things multiple times, I think there's a lot of interest in selling clothing um, and rewearing it. I think there's also a lot of interest in transparency. I think a lot more people want to know a lot more about their clothing and where it's coming from and what went into producing it. I know a lot of brands are starting to give specific numbers and locations of factories um, and what it costs to produce things. And I think as that becomes more common, um, consumers are going to be wanting to see it more. Very interesting perspectives. I think we've answered most of the questions that were, were raised by our our community here. Um, we're kind of entering into the last part of the panel. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, if you have any closing remarks, uh, uh, either future looking or, 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 or looking at the past that you want to share. Uh, and then we'll, we'll probably continue the conversation in our, in our break on the Gather platform. 
which uh, is like a virtual environment, but unfortunately is one where the customization of outfit is not there yet. I wish it was more like Animal Crossing. Uh, and then we could all have better looking outfit, but uh, unfortunately that's not there. So maybe Paula, we can start with you. Uh, any closing remarks you want to share? Uh, it's a, a little bit of what I said um, before is it around, um, at least on, from, from our side and the perspective of the recommendation systems that we've been working on, it, it would be really, really cool to see how this, all of these fast changing and fast pace uh, changes are, uh, have, where will they lead? Because you do have this luxury, yeah, Farfetch operates on a luxury segment, but um, what is luxury? Will it change? Will it not? So um, users are much more, as, as really said, it's uh, about the individual. That's the, the social part of it as well. How, the, how are we going to take care, uh, embed all of this information, all of this data <laughs> into a system and still give um, uh, relevant recommendations? I think that's, that's, the main, that's the main challenge, I think, for the next, I don't know, five years or so, even sooner, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, so for me, what's what's going to be really interesting in the next few years is how we adapt uh, our recommendations to different people. Um, okay, we can talk about the size and fit perspective, but in general. So for example, people have very different reactions to new technologies. And actually quite a lot of them are very positive about it. But these new technologies, it's also a lot about collecting data. So I'm interested to see, I'm interested in seeing what's going to happen um, uh, on that front, because collecting data is also a major issue at the moment regarding privacy and so on. So how these things will interplay with one another, um, how the new technologies will, will change fashion. So we talk about 3D avatars, but also 3D printing and, and, and so on. And uh, yeah, I think for fashion at the moment, it's really exciting. And of course, Heidi talked a lot about uh, sustainability, which is, which is a major and necessary change. And um, there are efforts as we see um, Zalando as, uh, as well is part of it, but uh, across the industry in general, because fashion uh, is one of the most polluting industries. So it's, it's really urgent that, that it changes. So all of this is coming together and it, it's really an exciting time for, for fashion, definitely. Any, any, any last comments, last remarks from your side? Yeah, I'm just I'm just really interested in seeing how recommendation can be used to improve the sustainability of the industry. And I just hope that we can see people from all sides of the industry start to adopt technology and use it more to just make everything better for the consumer, for the designers, for the planet. And Jessica, any any last remarks from your side? Yeah, I mean, I would just probably echoing what we were saying before, but I would say that we definitely need to realize that we don't need to leave behind like the probably hundreds or thousands of companies that were not born as tech companies have a lot of data that's not being considered. Um, there's a lot of data around sustainability that's just completely missing. So we see um, Google and Sal McCartney put together, starting to put together a satellite based recommendation of where people should source materials from. Um, we're going to definitely need to see more initiatives in that space where we're actually creating the data that's missing in the first place. About for sustainably. Um, I think we definitely need to keep in mind that recommender systems can also serve in peace. So it's not just um, customers as the user, it's also employees that have to make decisions. And sometimes it's, you know, the way that we use employees now is often to tag data or to train data or in some kind of human loop system. But we need to also look at how can we start to build recommender systems that affect the decisions that the employees are making on a regular basis. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably the biggest thing is just enterprise and legacy companies have completely different challenges. They do not have everything digitized. They do not always have inventory transparency. They have, um, uh, really old databases where one might be in there 17 times in different ways. And we need to also look at the kind of not, not interesting, not kind of publishable uh, methods that help them clean up some of this data and, you know, look at pulling things out of PDFs, look at pulling things out of their old catalogs so that they can turn all of this, they can actually like activate on 
the research we have coming out of data science and machine learning at tech first companies. Um, so that's what I definitely would like to see for, for the future is like more of that, okay, what's a recommendation system when it's facing inside and not just the, the customer. Very interesting. I think uh, this has been a great panel and I'm gonna ask something a bit unorthodox, which is for everyone to unmute your cameras and to virtually clap and thank our, our speakers today. See if we can, if we can manage to, to see people uh, saying thank you. I guess this is as close as to a, a, a warm uh, thank you from everyone. Your views, your views on the topics. And right now, I'm going to say uh, we're going to have a break uh, for close to one hour. Uh, I think, uh, let me check. It's like today's moving quite fast. So we have a break. You know when we'll come back because it's on the agenda. And on the meanwhile, I'll, I invite you all to go to gather um, and I'm going to just stop recording for a second. And we can start now. Welcome everyone back. Welcome back everyone. So uh, moving on to the second uh, keynote of the workshop. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker, James Caverly. Uh, James is a professor at uh, Texas A&M University. And uh, he's uh, one of the most visible scientists in social computing. As you can see, he focuses on topics that range from recommender systems, social media, information retrieval, data mining. Uh, he has uh, had uh, a lot of uh, uh, grants from uh, various uh, uh, known uh, bodies in uh, research at uh, including Amazon, Google, to name a few. And as you can see, he has uh, been uh, contributing to the community through very visible uh, venues such as TKDE, uh, social networks analysis and mining, and as well as uh, co-chairing uh, uh, Wisdom 2020. And of course, uh, he has track record of publications at uh, conferences such as KDD, Sigir, Wisdom, IC, WSM, and CIKM. So without uh, the, uh, further ado, I leave it to you, James. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh... Okay, cool. Uh, just a quick thumbs up. You guys can see this and hear this. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you, uh, Nima, so much for that uh, very, very kind, uh, kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about opinion leaders in fashion. And, uh, and so this is a topic. So I've been publishing and kind of our lab has been working and publishing in, in recommenders for probably the last five or six years. Uh, but, but fashion is a fairly new topic for us. And, uh, and so I hope you can kind of appreciate uh, some of my perspectives may seem a little, um, I don't know if sort of, uh, I don't wanna come across too much as a noob, but I, I own it and I claim it. And uh, hopefully I can uh, still, still bring some insights uh, to us today. Um, before I get started, I wanna give a special thank you um, certainly to all of our organizers. Uh, it's been a super fun uh, workshop today. Um, in particular, all of the participants. So I've already, like I mentioned, I'm fairly new to the fashion space. Uh, so I feel like I've learned a, a ton already and I've really appreciated all the talks. Uh, the, the earlier keynote was very, very good, the panel uh, as well. So I've got a lot of things to add to my queue uh, uh, in our lab. Um, so the work I'm gonna present today has primarily been funded by the NSF. So give them a special shout out. Um, but in particular, I wanna give um, major credit to my students and in particular, uh, one of my students, uh, Yin, 
so the topic today is again on fashion and opinion leaders. And so in our lab, I kind of treat Yin as our fashion opinion leader. She's the one who's really been driving this work, uh, really pushing for its importance. Um, and so it's done a really awesome job. So I hope it, I, I can do a reasonable job of presenting uh, a lot of what she's been up to. Okay, so with that, let's get into it. Uh, so yeah, the talk has kind of two main thrusts, right? Fashion and opinion leaders. And so I would imagine, you know, for this, for this audience, uh, you know, fashion, it's, it's obvious that it's important, but you know, for me as sort of new to the area, um, I found this quote, which I found quite inspirational. Uh, and essentially, right, you know, fashion has, you know, always been a factor, but it's never been more forceful, never more influential than in the last decade. And it's gonna grow even still more important, okay? So what I love about this quote is of course, it comes from 1928 uh, from Paul Nystrom, who uh, in, in, his, uh, in his work, The Economics of Fashion, uh, and so I just love this, you know, almost 100 years ago and, uh, uh, you know, recognizing the importance of fashion and certainly in today's uh, sort of worldwide connected uh, sphere, it's even more so. So to me, this is like very, very exciting, okay? Um, on the other hand, we have opinion leaders. And so there's been a lot of research uh, in a lot of spaces looking at, you know, do they really exist? Do they really exert influence? And if they do, to what degree? Um, but the main idea is that there may exist, uh, you know, sort of a certain class of sort of super users or opinion leaders who can, uh, you know, help shape our views, you know, what trends, you know, our patterns of consumption and so forth. Um, and there's been some literature, you know, particular, particularly with uh, all of our kind of modern platforms, trying to characterize um, and trying to assess the degree of influence uh, and so forth. Okay. And so in this work, what we're trying to figure out is the connection between the two. Okay, so fashion plus opinion leaders. And of course, this is a topic that's been around for a long time. Um, here's another paper I read, this is from the 70s, um, basically talking about the importance of fashion, uh, and in particular, how we can study the diffusion of ideas, right? And so to me, that's where I get very, very excited. Uh, and how it also reflects our changing relationships, right, between sort of us and our culture. So to me, it's this like super, super rich area. And so what I tried to do is uh, Ralph earlier had a very nice figure where he was showing uh, uh, sort of brands and fashion and so forth. And so I have something in the same vein. Um, and again, to sort of give you my perspective on things. And so what I'm showing you here on the left is, you know, sort of these sort of important kind of super users, these sort of opinion leaders. And you can imagine, you know, depending on the fashion or the clothing items they adopt, it could potentially sort of downstream uh, impact kind of our downstream users, our downstream consumers, you know, just sort of regular people. Uh, like you and me. Uh, but of course, it's not so simple, right? Because of course, the regular users can also impact the opinion leaders and potentially uh, with the sort of uh, modern platforms we have, you know, regular users could potentially arise and become these kind of super users, these opinion leaders. Uh, but of course, it's not the whole story, right? There's also uh, interactions amongst our regular users, right? And how they create fashion and create style and amongst our opinion leaders. So you have for sort of this interesting network effects and how they influence each other and sort of the diffusion of ideas both within those two communities. But all of this, of course, may be mediated by platforms. And so I just list a few here, but there's many, many more. We have brands, right? Uh, and so already I'm excited because we have lots and lots of kind of competing interests and competing factors, which hopefully by the end of this, you'll see sort of this sort of mess of arrows and you'll just, from my perspective, just appreciate sort of the complexity of this space. And so of course, you know, brands are very much interacting with and concerned about consumers, also interacting with these opinion leaders. We also have relationships between the platforms and the opinion leaders, between the platforms and our regular users, our regular consumers, between the brands and the platforms, okay? Uh, and not only that, right, all of this is mediated by our culture, right? And when we observe all of this, excuse me, where we observe all this, you know, where on the planet we are. Uh, if you can, hopefully you can see it's quite sunny where I am. It's in the afternoon and very, very hot. So I appreciate all of those of you, uh, perhaps in Europe, who is late and chilly. Um, and also the time, right? Like when all of this stuff is happening. So all of these factors to me, again, sort of as a, as a somewhat of, a, of an outsider to the space, just tells me that kind of fashion and more specifically fashion plus opinion leaders is this like really, really complex space with, to my eye, lots and lots of opportunities to kind of untangle uh, this web. Okay, so what I wanna do in the rest of the talk is focus on these fashion-focused opinion leaders. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just for shorthand call them fashion bloggers, uh, but I hope you understand what I mean. 
Um, and I'm going to focus a little bit on Instagram. And so this is, for example, one of these kind of super users on Instagram uh, who has, at least at the time of the screenshot, you know, 17 million followers, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of posts. And if you dig in, you'll see uh, receives lots and lots of feedback, comments, likes, and whatnot. Okay, so I'm going to focus on Instagram. But these kinds of fashion bloggers, these fashion focused or fashion uh, sort of centered opinion leaders are not just on Instagram, right? They, they span platforms. Um, and uh, you'll see here just sort of a sampling of the kinds of platforms you'll see them on. Um, and these fashion bloggers, I think, are quite an interesting kind of case study and uh, sort of an interesting avenue of research. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, they're quite popular. So again, I'm showing you a handful of of these uh, super users here, one with uh, 17 million followers, another with a million, another with half a million. So they're quite popular. Um, and there's been sort of interesting research that's shown, right, that these uh, fashion bloggers can link high fashion with our daily wear. And so uh, cite some literature there at the bottom. Uh, but what you're looking at here, sort of, you know, imagine sort of high fashion kind of runaway, kind of out of the reach of normal people can then be translated by these Instagram uh, fashion bloggers into a relatively cheaper, you know, relatively more accessible version of that high fashion that we can use for our daily style. Uh, and oftentimes you'll see these kinds of posts uh, annotated with a hashtag like outfit of the day uh, or these kinds of things, okay? Fashion bloggers, um, they also can definitely impact purchase decisions. Um, and so there's some literature, I've got a couple of references there at the bottom um, that people have studied this in, in particular, but I gave you an anecdotal example here of in the comments for this for this post, right, you see that there are users saying basically like, I like this, I want to buy it, right? Where do I get this top? Uh, and already I, I'm hoping you're appreciating, and you know, particularly for those of us who are at an academic institution, it's quite challenging to get access to this kind of data. And so, you know, what I would like to have is this sort of beautiful collection of uh, fashion bloggers, uh, as well as the purchase decisions. You know, it'd be nice if it was all bundled together in a, in a nice sort of downloadable data set. Um, but that's one of the key challenges that I'm gonna get into, which makes this a very, very hard space uh, to begin to study. Um, these fashion bloggers evolve from day to day. And so I'm just showing you a handful of the posts so you can see the sort of the style and the seriousness um, uh, uh, of what they're wearing changes uh, over time. And it can also change from year to year. And so the, the fashion blogger I've shown you already, uh, that screenshot is from a couple of years ago. Um, but if you check it uh, today, uh, right, she's had a child, and so now uh, a lot of her posts will feature the child, right? And so you're having this nice uh, sort of localized uh, temporal evolution, but now you have even over longer time spans, um, which can make it quite challenging if we're trying to model um, kind of fashion and trends and styles and so forth. Um, okay, so we have these ideas, right? So fashion, we have opinion leaders. And so sort of a number of questions fall out. And in our group, we're beginning to sort of try to ask some of these questions. We don't have answers for most of them. Um, but naturally, you know, there's simple, you know, sort of straightforward questions, which, you know, how do these leaders drive fashion trends? And sort of related to that, you know, do they drive fashion trends? Um, can we measure that at sort of a very fine grained scale to an even longer term scale? How do these opinion leaders uh, incorporate emerging trends? So for example, you know, are, you know, are they mining particular sort of, let's say, less popular users to find interesting styles that they, they, they can then incorporate and then uh, broadcast out to their followers? Other questions like, you know, who are the key opinion leaders? How can we measure their influence? How can we quantify it? Um, what impact do they ultimately have on downstream users? And, uh, you know, sort of more connected to the themes of this workshop are then, you know, can we build new recommendation algorithms that can bridge fashion and opinion leaders and integrate them together. Um, and so just as sort of a quick side note, this idea of opinion leaders and recommendation systems is an area that we've been working on in, in my lab for the last couple of years. And so I'm not gonna get into the details of this paper. This is a little bit of a uh, quick self-promotion, um, but another student in our, in our group, uh, Jun Ling, has been looking at how uh, these uh, sort of elite opinions diffuse in graphs. Uh, and in this case, uh, she's been looking at this diffusion First, you know, sort of directly, uh, and also sort of these indirect uh, influence pathways between users and items. Um, but what she's been studying is not fashion at all. She's been looking at Goodreads, a, a book reading platform, and ePinions. Um, and so she's proposed a sort of very nice end-to-end -end, uh, graph-based neural model, and shows really, really nice results. 
And, and the main idea is again, to kind of try to explicitly capture who are the opinion leaders and then treat them sort of very carefully in the model. Okay, so if this seems like something you're interested in, I just wanna point you to that paper. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about it anymore, um, but it kind of gives you a hint of the kinds of things that we're working on in our lab. Okay, so back to fashion. Okay, so we're asking this question, which is right, you know, can we build these new recommendation algorithms that can sort of integrate fashion and opinion leaders? And so we can imagine modeling this as we have these fashion bloggers. We have many of them and they're making posts over time uh, and we can track this behavior, okay? Now, if we can do that, then we imagine sort of a number of example scenarios that could benefit from uh, specific, you know, modeling these opinion leaders uh, in recommendation. And some of those will, I think, connect to the themes uh, of, of some of the other papers that we've already had and, and will have uh, in, in the workshop today. And so, for example, right, you know, we can directly try to figure out, you know, what are the trendy items, you know, based on these fashion bloggers and then feature them to our downstream customers. It's a pretty straightforward application of this. Um, another idea is to then explain those recommendations uh, using those fashion bloggers and these posts, right? And we're recommending this to you because uh, it's trendy and I'll show you the examples of why. Okay, so you can better appreciate and know why the, the method is presenting those. Um, there's a lot of work in like completing the outfit. And so I can imagine a version of this that's completing the outfit, but it's explicitly modeling these fashion bloggers and then sort of, sort of biasing uh, the outfit completion to sort of these fashionable versions or sort of trendy versions that, uh, that uh, kind of correlate with what uh, fashion bloggers are posting at that time. Um, Another idea, right, is not just to think about our downstream users, but also to recommend new styles back up to our fashion bloggers, you know, based on their, you know, imagine their, their previous history of post and what else is happening in the community. Can we then, you know, partner with these fashion bloggers and recommend to them what we think are interesting new styles to feature? And I'm sure many of you can sort of imagine many of the topics you're working on and hopefully kind of imagine a connection where if we can pull uh, these, these opinion leaders out, they can uh, uh, impact the development of our methods. Okay, now, what I wanna do right now is talk about this work uh, that my student Yin has driven, uh, which is in particular trying to improve recommendation to consumers uh, based on fashion bloggers, okay? So let's get into some of the details. Uh, and as we look at it, hopefully I'm gonna raise some, what I think are some interesting challenges that I hope we as a community can, can kind of work together uh, to kind of overcome, okay? Uh, okay, so what we can imagine is we have um, we have these bloggers evolving over time and they're, they're posting different kinds of uh, images and sort of demonstrating different kinds of styles over time. And you can imagine there are these downstream consumers uh, and it would be just beautiful if we knew those downstream consumers exactly what they bought, right? So we can see over time what they bought, but we could also link it back to particular interactions with the fashion bloggers. So for example, uh, for that very first item on the left, you could imagine, you know, that first blogger has posted something like that. The user has liked it and said, I really love it. And then we have a record that they went and bought it. Okay. That is the dream. <laughs> Sadly, it is a dream unfulfilled that we, we don't, we don't actually know how to do that, at least uh, in our lab. Um, and so we're gonna have to work to try to figure out how to do that connection. So kind of the first big challenge that I see, um, and this connects to the sort of fashion blogger space, but broadly into, um, into fashion, which is there are some really good data sets out there, um, but there, of course there are limitations and there are big, big challenges. And so the challenge we face, right, is you know, I have this sort of hypothetical situation, which is um, the, the last user says, you know, anyone know where this top is from? We would love to have that connection to, oh, and then that user actually bought the item, but we don't have it. And so that's the first big challenge. And I think it's been a real limitation to kind of advances in this area because it is so hard to study, right? It's so hard to have anything that's sort of reasonably valid um, for setting up any kinds of experiments. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna kind of make our, one of our first big assumptions is we don't have that connection. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on what we call implicit influence, right? So in essence, we're gonna treat fashion bloggers as kind of sort of sensors or, you know, they're kind of reflecting the kind of the current mood and the current fashion style. Um, and the good news is those sensors are evolving over time, right? So if I could look at these fashion bloggers from month to month, 
I'll have hopefully a reflection of different styles from month to month. And we can use that as an, an, imp, as an implicit influence channel in the kinds of purchase decisions people make, okay? So to actually kind of instantiate this, what we've done is we've tried to connect uh, Instagram to Amazon, okay? And so what we did on Instagram is we went and sampled a bunch of uh, top, female, uh, excuse me, top female US fashion bloggers. And we collected all of their posts over many, many years. And so we end up with about 130,000 posts, okay? And then what we do is we time synchronize all of those posts with a large Amazon data set of women's clothing category where we did some slight filtering and you can see the related paper for the details. Um, but we're using essentially sort of as a the sort of our signal for did someone buy an item is if they rated the item. So we then we have fashion items on Amazon that were actually purchased and that have a rating. And so we end up with about 60,000 ratings, okay? And so now what we have is a time synchronized data set where we have uh, Instagram posts, and then we have uh, 60,000 purchases on the Amazon side, okay? And so, and then hopefully we can capture the sort of implicit uh, influence channel from one to the other. Now, if you're interested in this data set, uh, we are sharing it. And so this is the email for my student, Yen, um, and I'm sure she'd be happy. She may even, I, I'm not sure I can look into right now to see the, if she's online, but she may even be uh, uh, you know, in the stream right now, but certainly she'd love to hear from you. Um, and we'd be happy to share that data set, okay? All right, so basically we go back to our original picture. And so we have these posts, right? They're evolving over time. And we don't, in, we don't in fact have that explicit channel. Instead we have what we call this implicit influence funnel, which is we don't, we can't directly connect, but what we're gonna do is treat those bloggers as again, sort of these sensors of the current fashion style and to see how that then trickles down and affects purchase decisions. Okay, so uh, a second big challenge that we face, right? And uh, I'm sure this, this one is sort of close to the heart of many people in this community, right? Is just how do we model the fashion features themselves, right? So we know that uh, for each blogger, right? The fashion features are gonna vary across time. It's so when I talk about fashion features, right? It could be the texture, it could be the cut, the style, the color. It's gonna vary across time. And of course, it's going to vary across bloggers because you'll notice here, you know, these two bloggers have quite different styles. Um, and as a result, we need to treat them, you know, quite carefully. Um, and so what we take in, in this work is, uh, to me, sort of a very kind of a sort of intuitive approach, which is what we're going to do is basically for each fashion blogger, we're just going to chunk all of their posts by some uh, unit of time. Okay, so it could be by day, by week, by month, etc. Uh, so in this case, imagine these are, you know, a sequence of posts by one blogger. We can just chunk them by the week in which they occurred in. And so now we have kind of three chunks that we can use to model. Um, and, in, and then in this case, what we'll then do is find an embedding style vector for each blogger for each time period. Okay. Um, but when we do that, so one of the challenges we face is that uh, oftentimes, you know, if there are only a handful of posts by a blogger in a particular time period, it's quite noisy and not kind of reflective of kind of the kind of overarching fashion. Um, and so sort of in our experiments, we discovered that can lead to lots of problems. So we do is basically we have to sort of smooth these representations. And so that's exactly what we do in sort of our next step is we take, for example, in this case, we've chunked all of our bloggers by one week. And imagine we're trying to find some fashion feature vector to represent this user at the top, or excuse me, this fashion blogger at the top. And so what we'll do is we'll look at also the post of quote sort of nearby bloggers as well and incorporate them into our representation for the, for the uh, fashion blogger on the top. And so then ultimately we'll have this sort of fashion feature vector H for blogger K at a particular time T that in essence is kind of smooth with sort of the local community, okay? Now, the issue here is, of course, you know, what is sort of under the hood and how do you actually do this? Um, and so we've done, this is work from, again, uh, I think the initial sort of work on this is from a couple of years ago. So we just took a sort of a standard um, pre-trained CNN to generate those individual style vectors. Um, but you can imagine, uh, you could just swap in any other kind of representation here, not a problem. And then we use a by LSTM to smooth by the community. But again, you might wanna choose a different uh, a, a sort of a different architecture uh, if you were working on this like from scratch today. But at the end of the day, right, we now have gone from fashion bloggers to some representation of them for each time period. 
Okay. So again, right, we're, we're sort of assuming we have this influence pathway. It's implicit, um, but it's going from these fashion bloggers down to these uh, downstream consumers, right, who are on Amazon in this case. Um, and what you realize, of course, is on Amazon, you know, there are lots of people who may have bought items that have no idea that these, these fashion bloggers exist, right? So, right, they're not even aware Instagram exists, okay? Um, however, we, our assumption is that, uh, that, number one, there are some users for whom they are definitely aware and they definitely follow them. Uh, there's also users who aren't aware of these fashion bloggers, but that the fashion bloggers are sort of representative of the kind of style of the day. And so those users may be aware of that. And then we have sort of our third group who was sort of unaware and unaffected. Okay. And so what we need to do now is try to figure out kind of this personal implicit influence from the bloggers to the users. And so you can imagine, right, we have those style sort of style vectors for each uh, fashion blogger to show the distributions here. And you can imagine these downstream users might sort of sort of sample from different parts of that space, right? Oh, I'm, I'm more influenced by this one and slightly less from that one, okay? And so what we're trying to do in this next piece is try to figure out that connection between the two, okay? So yeah, and so the assumption here is again, um, that basically, you know, a purchase, right? So this downstream purchase uh, means that you're sort of visually connected back to uh, uh, that, that fashion blogger. Okay, so how are we gonna do that, right? And so what we do here is, um, you know, like, like uh, several of the works we've seen so far, we're gonna use attention, it's uh, quite helpful. Um, but we, what I'm showing there is H1, H2, H, HKs. Those are, are these, um, these uh, f uh, fashion blogger kind of uh, style representations. And basically what we're assuming is that there is some pathway down to these downstream users, right? They're sort of picking from sort of weighing different fashion bloggers. And so what we do is we, we, we create this thing called an influence aware visual vector for a user. And so there's a formula there that's H of UT. And basically what we do is we use attention to now personalize from the blogger that H of T to use attention to give us an H of UT, basically the visual vector for each user Right, it's sort of a function of all of the fashion bloggers and their particular styles. And then we do is we take that HU of T and then we try to minimize the distance between it and that user's previously purchased items, right? So the idea is, okay, I know what you've purchased before and we essentially try to align it with um, our different uh, uh, fashion bloggers and minimize that distance, right? So in, this, in essence, we're gonna figure out which fashion bloggers are kind of most influential on this particular user, okay? That's sort of the big idea. You can get the details in the paper. Um, okay, cool. So uh, kind of the last big question is again then, now that we've done all of this, we then need to incorporate uh, all of this you know, fashion bloggers and these fashion features into recommendation. Uh, and so what we've done in this work is we've adopted a variation of RRNs, these recurrent recommender networks. These were introduced a couple of years ago. Um, and basically the idea is that like, you know, the state of a user at a particular time is decided by you know there's some previous hidden state and some current or fashion aware dynamics okay and so basically what we've we've done is we've taken uh, our ends we've added in sort of this fashion awareness component okay uh, and again you can imagine right if we were going to start this project from scratch today we might adopt a different kind of framework uh, but but the idea is still quite quite the same um, and so what happens is ultimately we end up with this optimization scenario right where again, we're doing a ratings prediction, right? Because our data is we know on Amazon what the rating is each user gave to an item. And so basically, right, what you can see on the bottom is the optimization is this rating prediction component. Um, and then we have that visual influence component, which we just talked about, which is trying to sort of minimize this distance between this sort of influence funnel from the fashion bloggers and what the, what the user has, has previously bought. Okay, that's kind of the big, the big setup. Now, Okay, and so in, in, we call this thing FERN, which is a fashion visual influence aware recurrent network. Okay, so FERN is what we've proposed. All right. So I'm gonna show you a few uh, experimental results um, and then pull back maybe for a little bit of, uh, of discussion on, on what we've talked about. Okay, so in terms of evaluating all of this, um, 
uh, again, at the time we were, we were trying to evaluate to what at the time were kind of state of the art baselines and you can imagine, so there's a, a fashion based SVD um, and, and a number of others. Uh, you can imagine replacing them again with sort of newer versions. Um, and we're going to follow with a lot of the recent papers in this space that also use RMSC. Um, and again, this is one of the big challenges, again, like I alluded to before, which is that, you know, we know that, you know, sort of implicit recommendation is, is you know, where a lot of the action is. And so one of the challenges uh, here is getting good data to support those kinds of experiments. Um, but the idea, as you can see here, is, you know, you know, these are personalized, you know, some of them consider time, some of them don't, some of them consider uh, uh, they're visually aware, and some have this influence pathway. Um, I just want to make a note, when we talk about visually aware, what we've done for those last uh, two baselines is basically uh, use the fashion bloggers as the visual signal rather than whatever um, data sets that those you've used before. Some of them have used, for example, like purchase history. So we replace that with um, um, uh, uh, data from, from these fashion bloggers. Okay, so let's just hop into some results. And again, I th should <laughs> throw you th this huge table to look at. Um, what we're reporting here, again, this is RMSE, and uh, each row is a different way we've sliced it. So the first row is basically saying, if we chunk the, the, the bloggers by one month to build our models, versus the bottom row is we've chunked them in six month periods. Um, and so what you can see as you sort of move across, right, is that for the most part, uh, kind of, you know, in time aware, the RRN, the one that we're built on top of, does the best of the time aware. Um, and then FSVD does pretty good, again, using our data, but also is capturing temporal dynamics. Um, but we see some nice improvements uh, uh, through our model, right? And so we're pretty happy with that. Um, kind of an interesting sort of side note here is you'll notice that depending on how you sort of chunk, is it one month or two month, you do see some variations, but not huge ones. And so uh, we attribute that partially to kind of, again, the quality of our data, sort of the density of our data. But we'd imagine if you had a much denser data set, uh, you might see uh, uh, some more kind of variation there. Um, so kind of good news, yep, see some pretty, pretty good, good results. And we see some good uh, results in comparison to these baselines. Um, then we had this other idea, which was, again, right, there's this big assumption, right, which is that, uh, you know, these Amazon users are somehow affected by these fashion bloggers, be it directly or be it um, based on the fact that the fashion bloggers are sort of representative of kind of the overall fashion trends. Um, and so what we did then is we said, ha, let's actually look at all of these Amazon reviewers, but let's sort them uh, and try to find the ones who are actually the kind of the most in tune with uh, uh, our fashion bloggers, okay? So that's exactly what I'm gonna show you here. We call these our most fashion sensitive users. And these are the ones whose previous purchases are kind of closest to these fashion bloggers. Um, and so what we think is kind of neat about this is, you know, we've kind of done this sort of blast mode, which is, okay, we're gonna use these fashion bloggers to help uh, uh, do recommendation for everybody, you know, including people who are totally checked out and have no notion of kind of what's happening in, in the fashion world. Um, but what this is showing is, right, if we actually focus in on Kind of the most fashion sensitive users, you get like a really nice improvement, right? Um, and so kind of our, you know, kind of, you know, to the, you know, the users who are buy, buying items like these fashion bloggers, right? We're seeing big, big improvements compared to other methods. And to us, that's kind of really inspiring, right? And it kind of tells you, you know, that there's real value in how we segment our kind of our customers, right? Or in this case, these Amazon users, right? You know, some of them have definitely displayed, you know, I am fashion aware, I am kind of with it. Um, here, we're going to definitely target them with these kinds of recommendations. Um, and then for the ones who do not, right, there may be a pathway to try to kind of bring them into this space, right? And so from our perspective, this is kind of an exciting space where we can use this partially to help us do some kind of segmentation uh, of our audience, okay? Now I want to show you just a couple of case studies. There, there's more experiments in that paper that I mentioned before, um, but I'll show you kind of a few kind of case studies. And so what I'm showing you here is a user that our model did a really good job on. So have very low um, RMSE. And uh, what you see there, kind of the, the top at 2012-12 is just that's the year 2012 and the month December. So we have, uh, this is a user's purchase history over time, okay? And what we can do is, so for example, if we zoom in um, uh, on that particular item, 
what we can show you is like, what is the most influential blogger purchasing at all of the same time periods? And what's hopefully nice is you're gonna see is like, you know, the black uh, kind of dresses to the right are kind of synchronized with what that most influential blogger is posting to the right. This uh, kind of yellow top dress with kind of a black, um, uh, black and white bottom, you'll see is synchronized up with the, the, the yellow top and kind of the black and uh, possibly yellow synchronized uh, 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 bottom. But you can also look at some of the least influential blogger, right? And so at the same kind of time period in 2013 in November, right, the sort of the least influential blogger who falls out of our model, you know, is wearing kind of, you know, uh, jeans and kind of like a, a, like a long sleeve uh, a horizontal striped shirt. Um, and so just sort of an example, right, of how this, this model we proposed is learning features that are similar to, to what the users are interested in. Um, and it's mainly driven through this attention mechanism. So it, like we've heard from some of the other talks, you know, attention is quite valuable. Um, and this is just sort of a demonstration uh, of how it works here. I'll show you one more. So this is a different user. So the user on the top, again, I'm showing you all of this user's purchases over time. Um, and this is someone actually our model did not do a very good job on in terms of RMSE. But even so, I want to show you that the kind of recommendations we generate, we think are quite reasonable, you know, subject to some additional uh, investigation on our part. Um, so what you can see is, for, for example, in uh, 2013, in October, I don't remember my months, yeah, that's October. Uh, but if you look over the whole history for this user, right, you get the sort of sense of this kind of, uh, 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 kind of uh, sort of the, the sort of the mid-length kind of dress where it hangs on the shoulders. Um, there's sort of a there's sort of a, a general kind of um, sort of footprint we see there. But in 2013, right there's there's sort of this uh, more pattern, maybe a paisley kind of uh, a dress. And so what you'll see on the second row is all of the rec you know sort of our top recommendations that fall out. And so what we're kind of happy by is that you know we're suggesting also kind of the sort of patterned dress that we think fits into what the user has purchased before. But even if you move along the second row, you'll see that all of the items there we think are either, you know, by style, or, you know, by cut, uh, or, or, or by the pattern are quite similar to what the user has purchased before. And what's neat is in terms of, if you look at where, again, the attention mechanism is focusing, right, if you look at all of the blogger posts kind of at that same time, which is what we're showing on the bottom, uh, the attention me mechanism is going to focus in on this particular dress, which again has this pattern. Um, and so just again, just a, sort of an anecdotal piece of evidence here, we think it's nice showing how sort of careful modeling of these fashion bloggers can potentially help, uh, help our recommendation. All right. So, yeah, cool, 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 cool. So all this work um, we've been doing, we think is really fun. Um, I think there's a lot more to be done. Uh, in terms of taking advantage of these fashion bloggers. And, and I hope that earlier in the talk, I kind of gave you some, some kind of ideas about directions we might want to go and, and you know, some things in our lab that we're thinking about as well. Um, but we're really excited. We think that you know, careful modeling of kind of the, the, the posts they make can give us this dynamic visual signal that we can help use our, you know, help improve our recommendation. Uh, we do have this nice data set that we're happy to share with you. Um, that connects those uh, Instagrammers to these Amazon purchases. And again, it's synchronized in time. So you can play around with that. Um, and then we propose this model, right, that, that manages to in incorporate these temporal dynamics. Um, and so we think that's kind of a fun, uh, kind of a fun uh, application of some of these ideas uh, into the space. Now, at the very beginning of the talk, I kind of drew this uh, uh, kind of a bird's nest of uh, arrows and whatnot. And, uh, and again, from our perspective, we think that you know, fashion plus opinion leaders you know, is an exciting space. We think it's super complicated. And what I've tried to do in this talk so far uh, is give you a hint of, you know, sort of a flavor of, of kind of one approach. Um, but I would imagine there's many, many other ways that we can deal with these opinion leaders and, they, and the opinion leaders can help drive uh, some of the applications that we develop. Um, so I'm really kind of curious to hear your feedback uh, and I'm also curious to, to hear, you know, uh, uh, what the other uh, talks have to say uh, today. Um, so with that, uh, I really appreciate all of your time. Um, I just want to give one quick shout out to, again, my student, Yin. Uh, there's her picture and her email. Um, uh, and I do want to just say one quick thing about her. So she, uh, she has uh, just finished a, uh, an internship uh, on the recommendations team at Google Brain uh, over the summer. 
And uh, I know she's very much interested in fashion. And so I know there are a lot of people in industry, uh, in the fashion industry here today. So she's definitely someone worth talking to. And so I highly, <laughs> I highly uh, recommend her. And so I would be happy to, to see something come out of that. Um, but with that, I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, yeah, and I'll, and I'll stop it there. Thank you very much, James. Very, very interesting uh, talk and content. It was really good to uh, watch and learn, of course, from your nice experiment. I think uh, the audience shared the same uh, sentiment as well. So I would like to bring uh, to your attention uh, two of the questions that people have posted. So first question. Are we on Whova now? I've got, I've got my Whova app. I've got to fire it up. Yeah. <laughs> then you can read the question as well yourself. Okay. So um, was the Goodreads model evaluated online or offline? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So we had this other paper um, that was at Wisdom earlier this year. So I don't know if any of you managed to, to get to Wisdom. It was in Houston. Uh, and I know for a lot of people, it was basically the last conference we all got to go to. Um, I, we, we worked to, to actually host that conference, you know, for over a year. We're losing our minds. The conference ends. And then, you know, none of us have left our house since then. Um, yeah, so the question was, was Goodreads model evaluated online or offline? Yeah, it was 100% offline. Um, so we, uh, that student, Jen Ling, has collected a large uh, Goodreads sample. And she, I'm, she may even be interested in, in sharing that as well. Um, but yeah, so, so that's one of the challenges we face uh, in the university is uh, we basically, a lot of our experiments are this style of, you know, we collect lots and lots of data and then we try to create these kind of offline scenarios in which to evaluate them. Um, the, and I know for, for many of our friends in industry, in, I took a sabbatical some years ago and I faced this exact same challenge, which is, you know, you can develop some beautiful model offline that gives you some beautiful result. And then you try it uh, online, right? Your A-B test show, you know, flat line or, you know, nothing or down. Um, so that's a big, big question. We've got, you know, does it really work? I don't know. I hope so. Um, I see another question. I'll just read it out. I'm, I'm using Whova now. Sure. Um, hey, I wonder when you selected different periods of times, you saw some effects to do with the typical fashion cycles, autumn, winter, and spring, summer. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, part of the challenge to this uh, for our group is, again, uh, I particularly don't have any expertise, or have historically not had any expertise in fashion, so I'm not really aware of fashion cycles, okay? Like when you know, you know, new items are introduced and how it kind of filters down. Um, my student might have some better inclination, uh, but what we're trying to do is, um, I think as we look at over time, so there's a question which is, you know, sort of if we evaluate the model, not in sort of the aggregate over all of it, but if we sort of evaluate it incrementally, right, would we see a variation in the quality of the results? And that's an experiment I don't think we did, but now that you mentioned, I think that's quite, uh, that, that would be kind of a fun experiment to do. Um, could be quite interesting. So I'll mark that down as a great, uh, uh, that's really great, thank you. Great, great. Uh, so if there is any uh, more question on Huba, it doesn't sound like it. So maybe like we can open for uh, Zoom participants, uh, if anyone there would like to ask something from James. And don't be shy. If you don't have a question, I'm going to ask a question of the audience. So <laughs> that's also fun as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions from the audience on Zoom? Doesn't sound like it. So let me put an audience a question to the audience then, which is: Does anyone have any um, re, uh, uh, fashion resources? So we've we've been looking at Instagram a lot, and so we're always looking for other resources that we think are valuable and that we can get access to. Right? We've heard a number of talks from some companies earlier where they, you know, my hunch is, you know, they have beautiful internal data. And so I want to push it back to the audience. Do we have any good as a community, good data sets or good resources where we could collect data that uh, might touch on some of the things that I've talked about today? Uh, hi, James. Thanks a lot for your talk. I'd like to partially answer your question. Because um, I think we, as an organization of the workshop, uh, it's been quite some time uh, thinking about this uh, on how can we support the community, uh, especially as you said, people working more in, in academia rather than industry um, to get data. 
uh, to you know evaluate their algorithms on it and to make work on it. We publish a, a list of data sets, but I would say that's very, very, very early start. And you know, I wish there was a lot more available. Available. Uh, it seems like this is one of the main uh, things stopping people from doing more experimentation uh, around fashion and recommender systems uh, as a whole. Uh, and we really hope that in the future, uh, you know, some of these big players would release data, but it's, it's proven very, very difficult, uh, to release any data at all because, you know, there's always the, the personal information side and, and all that. I don't know if anyone else in the audience has a, a different answer, uh, or would like to collaborate to, you know, gather even more information about data sets that are already available. It's, it's really difficult to really as, as, as an industry player to release data these days. It's, it's very unlikely that it will happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's been uh, my experience. Um, uh, some years ago, I had a, a relationship with a different, uh, an unnamed company who uh, was going to give us a, some beautiful data set. And, uh, and they, they, they listed all of the features we were going to get for our lab. It was unbelievable. Um, then the lawyers got a hold of it. Then, you know, sort of senior management got a hold of it. And they ended up sharing with us, you know, essentially sort of an, an anonymized kind of graph with nodes with no names and no attributes. And it was totally useless. And, uh, and I appreciate the, the, the tough spot companies are in, right? This is a big risk to share with, with us um, for potentially, you know, just a big downside risk. Um, so you know, what we've tried to do again is sort of try to be clever in, you know, you know this Amazon data set is public, this Instagram we've been able to crawl, um, sort of, you know, opportunistically try to find these kinds of opportunities to build these data sets. Um, and so, but I think there may be some value if companies can't directly share. Uh, sometimes companies uh, uh, are good at identifying, uh, let's say, gaps in particularly research coming out of university where you know, can, can help sort of direct us towards a good, um, you know, the kinds of data sets we ought to be collecting to attack those kinds of problems. Because what I'm worried about, right, is we're gonna spend all of our time uh, chasing problems that fall out of, you know, a particular data set just because the data set only supports a certain subclass of problems, right? And which is not necessarily helpful to us as a community. So, yeah. One of the alternatives is basically if the, if the data does not come to you, maybe sometimes one has to go to, to, to where the data is. Um, and I guess <laughs> yeah, it's what, yeah. for instance, just did, right? He went to yeah, Google yeah. Brand. What data, that's, I guess. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, I think, is very good for the companies, right? And it's good for the students, for, cert for certain. Um, the challenge, right, is, you know, we would love, uh, and some, some of that work they do publish, and sometimes, right, they then find a good uh, public data set to partner with the private data that they can't report on. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to fight for all of all the folks here in the workshop who are in, in, the, in universities, right? We, we're trying to keep our students uh, uh, or keep our research problems, um, I don't know, sort of, let's, let's kind of push some of the, uh, the sort of the flow of ideas and talent uh, back to us and away from some of the big companies, but it's very hard to do these days. Fair enough. It's also better for the, it's of course better for the field if there are public, uh, publicly shared benchmark data sets and so on, and it should still be a goal to have those. Um, what, what I often liked, and I think it's also something that you did, is, uh, is if, if one basically um, uh, collects the data on the web using publicly yeah. available data and creates data sets from that. It's also sometimes a bit of a legal uh, slippery slope. It depends, right? Uh, but it's, I think it's very, can be very valuable. Uh, that's exactly right. And uh, uh, that's a really good point. And uh, we can leave that for a different discussion to talk about terms of service and, uh, and uh, kind of crawling uh, policies and protocols. But you're right. It, it is, it is an avenue we've pursued a lot, and uh, uh, there are some risks to it, of course, as well. Yeah. All right, so uh, James, we have a new question on Hova. Would you like to read it? Okay, I'm firing up the app again. Um, 
uh, basically, did we measure the statistical significance of the performance? Um, we, I don't know if we did in this paper or at least report it. We typically do in our work. Um, you know, I've, uh, we've published a lot in uh, like IR venues. And so if you're familiar with IR venues, they really, really fight you on uh, significance, right? Um, in this paper, I'm, I'm, I have a paper next to me. I don't think we reported it there, but we really should have. Um, and that's something we can fix. But that, that's typically something we like to do in our lab is report some kind of significance figure. Um, that's a very good point, thank you. All right, so I see, cool. um, Julia, by any chance you wanted to answer James or point to something? Uh, me? <laughs> uh, on the main, main, main view, so that's I'm, I was wondering. Ah, uh, no, sorry. No, I, I was going to react on the data set thing, but then uh, Zeno did, and um, yeah, and no, that's okay. <laughs> So I've got one last uh, one last point, which is uh, I'm gonna. I know people are up late right now, but again, can anyone beat me in terms of how hot it is? Uh, Celsius. I'm currently at uh, 31. I don't know if anybody can beat me, so I'll, I'll claim victory there. Um, so, uh, Nine times degrees like in Berlin. Say again, how much? Nine degrees Celsius oh. in Berlin. Uh, <laughs> So, so if you've not visited Texas, we, we, uh, after we get through COVID, we certainly would love to have you guys visit uh, Texas, but just know that we are hot in the summers and I mean, we're going to be hot into October. So, but our winters are quite, uh, quite mild. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank James. You so thank you very much. And I guess with that, we'll do a, uh, well, first to say then, James, that's a great opportunity to, to use our fashion wardrobe for the summer a bit longer when we're in Texas. Um, but with that, we conclude um, the, sec uh, the second keynote and we're moving towards our last um, paper session where we'll have three different papers. I will ask you to maybe wait. We're gonna start it in 10 minutes, but I, for now I want that all the speakers come in and just test the the connection, test your screen, uh, screen share, and all of that. So, Mariam, uh, Lucy, Bo Lanle. Uh, let's start with you, Mariam, if you can just quickly share your screen to see if it works. Yes, let me try. Trying to find a button. Ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> All Does right, that works. Yeah, that works. So right, let's uh, let's try with uh, who's second? Timo. I guess Lucy, you're next. Uh, okay, so Tim, Timo works. Perfect. I'll just stop that screen share for a sec. Hello. All right. Yeah, it worked, Timo. So I think we're good. Now we can test with Lucy, perhaps. Uh, yeah, wait a minute. I'll turn on my video. Allow. Okay, works. Right. Oh, perfect. Yeah. But I cannot see. Can uh, Mariam and Timo, can you uh, turn off your camera for one second, please? Sure. You cannot see Lucy. And Lucy, would you mind turning it on? I cannot see you, Lucy. It's you're muted. Your microphone is muted. Maybe that's why. Hi. Oh, perfect. Now we can see you, and that works. And lastly, Olangle, would you like to test your camera and your screen? Hey. Hey. Excuse me. This the camera Hello. works. Hello. Okay. Let's see. Hey. 
Can you say this? Uh, it seems that it's starting. It says you have started sharing your screen, but I cannot see it. Now I can see it perfectly, but I cannot see you. Did you stop your screen, your okay. video? Can you start it again, the video? Oh, uh, okay. Can you see my video now? We can see your video, but can you do both the screen share and the video at the same time? I think you don't need to have the video to do the screen share. Are you doing it on the on the Wova web or on an app, on the Zoom app? Yeah. Um, okay, I should probably switch to Zoom, right? Yeah, I think that's Okay, best. let me sign in and try again. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone else, for, for I guess you're on your break, so thanks for waiting for technical. I was talking, and I think people didn't hear me, so I was wondering, is the audio quality? Quality fine or is it patchy for me? Uh, it's perfect for you, Timo. All right. Nice. Thanks. We can hear you well. I'm resuming the recording now. We'll start in one minute. All right. Uh, welcome. Oops. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, we're starting our last session for today. Uh, where we will discuss uh, how to combine fashion, which is a very interesting problem. It's a problem that builds on top of the topics that we discussed in the last two sessions that were around understanding fashion and how size and fix uh, mixes with recommendation in fashion domain, as well as touches on topics that were mentioned uh, on both of the keynote speakers. If you look at the last keynote speaker talking about you know, influencers and so on, there's a lot of that that we'll discuss uh, on this session. So the first paper is outfit generation and recommendation, an experimental study, and it will be presented by both uh, Mariam and Tino. Uh, Mariam, you can start now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as uh, Umberto introduced me, my name is Mariam. I'm a research engineer at Zalando. And uh, I and Timo, we are going to uh, talk about our experimental study about outfit generation and recommendation algorithms. So before starting, I would like to uh, introduce a couple of definitions. Uh, first of all, what do, what do we mean by outfit? So we define an outfit as a set of pairwise compatible fashion items, which means uh, no pair should be uh, no compatible. And given that the outfit uh, generation problem is about uh, completing an initial set of items, like in our case, to a full outfit, or um, basically filling in the, miss, the uh, missing items in the outfit. Uh, the second problem, the personalized outfit generation problem, uh, brings also the uh, user into the picture and their preferences, uh, uh, which can be either clicks or interactions with items or uh, more summarized data about the customer, such as favorite brands or simply uh, answers to, uh, to a questionnaire, a fashion questionnaire. So given the user preferences together with the initial set of items, which in this case can be empty, we would like to complete this set of item or recommend an outfit to the um, customer, generate an outfit in this case. So uh, now we'll present uh, the, the structure for the rest of the uh, talk, uh, which as you can see is very simple. We'll start by giving a motivation behind our work. Uh, then we'll start talking about the non-personalized version of the algorithms that uh, we studied, uh, follow, followed by a personalized version of the algorithms, and we'll finalize our talk with an empirical study of these uh, algorithms. 
So what's the motivation? So basically we wanted to see and, and uh, share with you what is working and not what is not working in this domain. Uh, recently, there have been a lot of traction. There have been a lot of um, algorithms for uh, generating outfits, but unlike the, the uh, usual use case, basically, uh, uh, namely item recommender systems, here there is no extensive performance analysis of, of the different uh, uh, algorithms for this use case. Basically, there's kind of set generation algorithms um, in the fashion domain. So that's why we wanted to contribute to close uh, this gap by uh, comparing three main classes of algorithms that we believe are very commonly used in the literature, but also in the industry. So they're based on SAMIS NETS approaches, LSTM and RNN based approaches, and finally attention based approaches. Apart from that, we would, um, we adapt a few of these algorithms to the uh, personalized outfit generation use case. So now we'll start with this uh, non-personalized outfit generation, or they're also called algorithms for item compatibility. So we give two names because in the literature they can be, um, they can be encountered by both names. So we'll start by Simon's Nets. It's a very commonly probably you're all familiar with it. Um, in its essence, it learns a compatibility function between a pairs of objects. In our case, it's objects of fashion items and outputs um, compatibility score in our case, that's how compatible this pair of items is in terms of fashion. Uh, has a relatively simple architecture. It consists of identical uh, feature extraction blocks and, uh, pardon, I have to move this, and compatibility block. And it's trained by um, uh, the compatible pairs of items. Uh, in our case, those that are ca coming from um, outfits that are created by influencer, like this one, for example, and then the compatibility likelihood is one. And also a pair of pairs of items that are not compatible, for example, introducing random replacements uh, in invalid pairs, like this one, for example. Uh, so one of the disadvantages of this approach is that it operates on pair of items, which means that uh, some of the pairs in the outfit might, might not be compatible. For example, nothing prevents the first item that you see in this slide on the left hand side and the last item are, are uh, compatible to, uh, to are not compatible. Sorry to prevent this. Uh, we would like to we basically generalize this architecture by introducing parallel subnets for each fashion category. And then the uh, output is basically for the entire outfit. Second class of algorithms we uh, took into consideration based on LSTMs where the uh, fashion compatibility is modeled by the transition probability between the items in the outfit as a proxy. Here the outfit is represented as a sequence of fashion categories, which means the order of uh, categories is always fixed. First we have uh, the shoes and then we have the pants and they have, have the t-shirt and so on. It's trained by predicting the next item where basically the outfit is considered as a sequence in the, in the uh, NLP domain. And, but also the previous item in the outfit in order to, uh, to be able to generate a full outfit from tip to toe. So starting, for example, from the last item on the, in, in, the, in the sequence or the first item in the sequence. That means in general that we need basically to train two models, one forward, one backwards, or to use via LSTM. Our next group of uh, algorithms based on attention, uh, in particular GPT, which is based on the decoder uh, of the uh, transformer. Here, the item compatibility is modeled via, via self-attention where each item attends to all previous items. Uh, more naturally as before, the outfit is represented as a set because outfit is indeed a set, the order doesn't really matter. And we achieve this by removing the positional encoding in the GPT uh, decoder. The model is, predicting the, the, uh, is uh, trained by predicting the next item in the outfit. But here the outfit doesn't have as a set of fixed items. So we'll have to ensure that, that the outfits are coming uh, in uh, basically in random order. Next group of, um, the next algorithm in the same group is BERT. You're probably all um, familiar with it. Here again, the uh, compatibility is model via self-attention mechanism. The difference is that each item attends to all uh, other items. So to predict one item, basically we use the contents from the left and from, uh, from the right. Again, outfit is represented as a set to adopt this algorithm. So we adopt this algorithm also for this uh, output generation use case. Uh, we remove the positional encoding, also remove the second task of the of BERT 
where we predict the next sentence because um, in the fashion domain, there is no such equivalent of next sentence. The model is trained again by filling the blank, trying to predict, to ask the model to predict the output that was the Python the item that was hidden by providing a mask in that case. So now we'll talk about a personalized version of, of, of output generation algorithms, uh, starting with a generic algorithm that in a very simple way allows to make any of this non-personalized, uh, to turn any of this non-personalized algorithm into a personalized algorithm. It starts by generating enough outfits for each available item in the catalog such that there are enough brands, colors, and categories. So we have this um, set of outfits on one side and then we have the user history on the other side. And the idea is to define a similarity function between these two. The similarity function could be hard-coded, like cosine similarity could be learned. In both cases, we end up with certain scores, and then simply we rank these outfits by these scores and we show the top key outfits to the customer. So we have something that like this already implemented and, um, and put in production, actually works sufficiently well, but as we can see later, there is a lot of improvements over this uh, baseline approach. The next al algorithm that I'm going to present is again, it's a um, uh, sequence to sequence extensions of the LSTMs where we have basically two different uh, LSTMs. Uh, the, left, the left one, it's basically learning uh, the uh, user interactions or the user preferences from the user interactions and basically produces a personalization signal or user preference signal to do to the right one, which, which one is, which is learning the um, distribution of the outfits or the items of the outfits conditioned on of the uh, state of the first LSTM. So basically that it, the transformer, it's, it's a, has a very, uh, in a general, very similar architecture or the sequence to sequence LSTM. The difference is how, how they work inside. So again, we have this encoder encoder structure and we learn a user preference signal from the interactive item. So the difference here is that we, we do this by attending uh, each item to every other item in the encoder. And the decoder generates the outfit by, by uh, attending to both the previous item in the outfit, and but also the signal coming from the encoder. So we also deployed this algorithm. So as, as, as I told you, the, the, um, the purpose of our work was to see what is working and what is not working. So this one now turns out that it works pretty well. And we have implemented, we have deployed in production. So that was also challenging, but it's a kind of like a proof, yeah. Complex deep learning algorithms can actually uh, can work in scaling production in, in the industrial settings, and this is a proof for it. And improved over our existing algorithm that I just presented based on Siamese nets uh, and this gen generic extension, uh, and um, yeah, improved all metrics, but provided uplift of all metrics, both offline and online settings. So this is an example that you see here of algorithm generated uh, by by the transformer on the right uh, hand side. And we can see here um, a nice match between this um, dress and this uh, bag that probably the influence of the creators couldn't find because um, probably the, uh, perhaps the uh, cat, our catalog is, is, is uh, pretty long. So it would be much easier for the algorithm to find such a match than for, uh, from a human being, for a human being. Next, um, basically extension. Uh, or adaptation that we, we studied uh, was um, a basically a personal version of the PERT in the GPT by introducing global context. And we do this by adding an additional context, a uh, token that corresponds to this context. The context in our case could be anything about a customer, which is summarized and has a fixed length, such as gender, age, location, favorite brands, and so on. And uh, so this fixed context size, as I said, is encoded as an embedding with the same dimensionality uh, as the item embedding. And if this is not enough for one token, then we add another token for that is assigned to the context. And then uh, the model can attend to this context vector to, and utilize its to prediction as we need any other uh, token to make a decision, to make a prediction. So this was the um, summary of the algorithms that we studied. So now Timo will take over and we'll continue with empirical evaluation. Hi, this is Timo. Yeah, I'll start by walking you through the data sets that we're using. One is coming from our site, Salon, and the other one from Zalando. I think Zalando already got introduced a couple of times, so I'll skip that. Um, and for Salon, it's um, yeah, best described maybe by a customer coming to the web page and then filling out a number of questions. 
and then having a personal stylist assigned to them who creates an outfit specifically for that particular customer. So it's like highly personalized and they actually have like a thousand freelancing stylists yeah, working for them. And the outfits in the salon data set, they're coming from these stylists. The outfits in the Zalando data set, they're coming from uh, Instagram influencers and from Zalando employees. They are both uh, containing personalized data, but at first we're gonna be looking at the non-personalized uh, experiments and then later at the personalized ones. So we compared the uh, algorithms that are applicable to non-personalized outfit generation on both of the data sets and the tables, the two tables show the results for the respective data sets. Uh, one of the metrics we look at is the perplexity that's uh, just defined as e to the power of the cross entropy between uh, model output and ground truth. And you can see it kind of corresponds to how, how a capable model is at sequentially autoregressively generating uh, an outfit. And you can see that GPT has the lowest, which is the best uh, perplexity, which makes intuitively sense because uh, its pre-training task is also to sequentially generate outfits. The next, yeah, the next um, metric is the compatibility. Compatibility we defined as the model's ability to distinguish between real and invalid outfits. Invalid outfits being just real outfits where we have substituted one article with a random replacement. And uh, this is capturing in some sense the model's ability to just look at the entire outfit as a whole. And at this metric, uh, again, the two mm, transformer-based models, GPT and BERT, are performing the strongest. And the last one is the fill in, fill in the blank accuracy. Fill in the blank is defined as uh, the model's ability to make a correct replacement. So we take an outfit, mask out one article, let the model replace, uh, uh, like suggest a replacement for it. And then the accuracy just says how often it matches the ground truth. And this is exactly also what BERT's uh, pre-training task is. So it's not surprising that uh, on this metric, BERT is performing best. Yeah, so next, uh, the personalized evaluation. Quickly for the for the salon data set, what the personalized information in the data set is. Customer comes to the web page shown on the photo, um, and then fills out a questionnaire. And then the stylist assembles an outfit for this customer. So for every outfit in the data set, we have a bunch of questionnaire answers. Okay. And now when we evaluate our algorithms, then we provide them with a questionnaire too that was filled out by a customer in the past. Let the um, algorithm create an outfit. And then we have the stylist outfit, the one that was physically actually shipped to the customer and the outfit that the model generates side by side. And then what we do is um, take the outfit that was shipped and see how often uh, articles that were kept in the real world um, were also being generated by uh, our algorithms or at least articles that have similar properties like having the same brand, having the same color and these types of things. And these match rates uh, we use, like how often that matches, we use to compare the models to each other. And you can see this in the three leftmost columns in the table uh, that the contextual GPT is performing the best and the outfits that we sample from BERT are a little bit worse. And the uh, um, two rightmost columns, personalization and diversity, are being like are, are to be treated a little bit with care because um, they reflect how diverse the outputs of the model are, which um, is something we try to optimize for, but under the constraint of not losing the matches, so the three leftmost columns. Okay, next one. Ah. And now the same thing for Zalando, the person like the personalized information on the Zalando data set is different. It's not a fixed size, it's a sequence of article clicks. So we track the, art, uh, the, the user's browsing history kind of th through the website. <laughs> Sounds dangerous if I say it like that. <laughs> uh, track, track like the clicks they do on the website and then based on those clicks, uh, generate an outfit. Yeah. So on the, on the next year, um, we're comparing the, the models that are capable of processing a sequential user history. So the Siamese net transformer sequence to sequence LSTM. And again, have these matching metrics and the uh, personalization. And there we can see that the transformer is best on these, on matching the articles the, uh, of the outfits that the user has clicked on the real web page. And only the sequence to sequence LSTM has, again, a more probably random, uh, more, slightly more random output in higher, higher diversity. Yeah, and also worth mentioning here is like what Marianne said, we also ran an A-B test and saw in the A-B test that the transformer improved over the Siamese nets. Um, however, the improvement was not as big as the offline evaluation. Yeah, which is probably a common, common uh, theme. 
Okay, now to wrap it up, um, we have compared a number of different algorithms for outfit generation, both personalized and non-personalized, and evaluated them on two different data sets with different personalized information, Salon and Zalando. And our experiments show, which is now at this time really a common message that the presentation seemed to convey, that the uh, transformer-based models are the best performing in our experiments. So these are also the ones that we go with. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk, uh, Maria and Timo. Uh, we have a short time, but I'm gonna, there's a few questions. So I would invite you to go to the WOVA platform to uh, reply to those uh, people who ask questions. Uh, okay, there's actually a lot of questions. So I'm gonna go with this one. GPT and BERT are quite complex models. Have you studied which components of these models are necessary or whether there are simpler models that can achieve the same quality? So you know, yeah, I, I can uh, give an answer to it and you can add something if you think, Marianne. So we have um, seen for the models that if we increase their, the model capacity, say adding more layers to the model, that it aids the performance, which is some indicator for the model capacity and expressiveness being actually necessary for solving this task. And um, in general, comparing two completely different architectures, well, that's kind of uh, what the what the results sec uh, section showed. And there we also saw that this um, yeah, seems to be the architecture that makes sense. And I think it's also from a architectural sense um, reasonable because the BERT model at least, and GPT in some way too, treat the inputs as a set. And this is some architectural bias that just makes perfect sense for outfits. You kind of want your model to look at all things at the same time. So I, short answer, yeah, I think the architectures make sense. And I think for this task, they are not an overkill. Perfect. I'm gonna ask one last question. Uh, it will be a, a quick one. Uh, how do you tackle the problem of cold start? How many product interactions should we have to have a good uh, interaction modeling? So maybe I can um, try to answer this question. So in the first version of, of our um, uh, outfit recommender system, we don't explicitly address the cold start problem. Basically for those customers that do not have clicks or have very few clicks, the algorithm will be very biased to popular uh, outfits. So for those users simply that don't have clicks, we will uh, recommend outfits that are very popular through, uh, and, uh, in the website that are, and have a lot of clicks. So we don't explicitly at, at this point uh, address the cold start problem. Perfect, thanks. Uh, again, there's a few more questions. I would appreciate if you can uh, engage with the people who ask them to, to answer them. To the person who asked, where's the papers and the slides, they're all on our website. So you can go directly and, and download them. And now I welcome Bolanle, who will present uh, the next paper of the session. Hi. Uh, can, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Now it's, it's, it's working on it. OK. Perfect. Uh, yeah, you can start. Perfect. Okay. Hello, my name is Bolanle Downsi. I'm a PhD student at the University of Minnesota. This is um, a presentation on the work we did with my supervisor at the beginning of this year. So essentially, we've, we realized that to a large extent, people use a very small fraction of their wardrobe day on average. So reports, uh, res, um, results of previous research has also shown that 36% reduction in how often clothes are worn before disposal compared to what used to be obtained 15 years ago. So some of the causes we identified for this were that for some people, they don't know how to wear what they have. Then in some cases, the style is wrong or it doesn't fit right. And in some other cases, it's a problem of people not knowing how to pick what they want because it's a complex process. So they usually just stick with whatever they know and wear the same clothes over and over again. So some of the possible solutions, one possible solution we're looking at for this is using intelligent recommender systems. So essentially the recommender system is basically trying to play the role of a human stylist. So in order to do that, we need to understand what the human stylists do. So the, our objectives here were to understand the factors that affect how stylists make choices 
in terms of what they, what they recommend to their clients. So we had two questions. What factors were influ influencing how they make their decisions on outfit suitability and choice? And then the second one was, do the outfit suitability factors change if they are integrating a client's existing wardrobe or not? So to collect data, we did semi-structured interviews with, four, with 12 US-based stylists. And the main criteria for selection was that they had to have a minimum of three years experience working as a fashion stylist. So um, broadly, the stylists were grouped into three groups. So wardrobe consultants, image consultants, and personal stylists. So we did, the method of analysis was thematic analysis, so we could do inductive coding to see, okay, what emerged and we didn't have to post any codes on the, the transcripts from the interviews. So for our findings on research question one, we were, they were grouped into three main themes, uh, client considerations, the garment features, and the stylist consultation process. So I'll go over each of them, one after the other right now. So for client considerations, there are two main types. We had personal features and we have lifestyle, we had lifestyle features. So for personal features, four main themes were, were identified. So the first, the main, the two main ones that everybody was concerned about were the body shape and the coloring of the person. So a few people came up, um, mentioned that they looked at the age and then for some people, they also looked at what the person's personal perceptions are. So say, for example, someone who had um, issues with a particular body part, she didn't want to show it, then that would come into what they were making, recommend the recommendations they were making. So here you see an example of one of the quotes from a wardrobe consultant. So here she's looking at, okay, she's, look, she's looking at the person's shape and then trying to decide, okay, different outfits will fit differently depending on how curvy the person is at the top or at the bottom. So for client consideration, lifestyle considerations, we had some that came up and the main one was, I, I hear they're listed according to how often they are caught in our, um, with, interview, with the people we interviewed. So the first one was daily activities. So for all, the, all of them, they looked at what the person was doing daily. Then they looked at the profession in terms of if someone is a graphic um, artist compared to someone who's a banker the recommendations will be completely different for those two people. Then they also looked at the budget um, in terms of how much was the person ready to spend. Then they would look at the preferences, style preferences. So for someone who had a preference for fitted clothes, then they would stick with things that were more fitted. For someone who had a preference for casuals, they would look for things like jeans and t-shirts. So, they also looked at the intended result of the client. So an example would be a client who comes in and says uh, she just had a baby and she's trying to change her wardrobe. That would make a, dif a difference in what they're recommending. Or someone who says, okay, I just got a new job and I'm trying to design a work wardrobe. It's also different for someone who says she's interested in going on a trip and just wants clothes that she would wear while she was on the trip. So the last one was personality. Though just a few people mentioned personality um, as being important. And we found that most of the people who mentioned personality were image consultants. So for, in term, for personality, you look at, is a person, a, a, what uh, some of the terms they use were things like diva, or if she's more of a romantic type, or if she's more of a, someone who likes classics. So they would look at her personality to determine, okay, how do we give them what suits them? So for garment features, um, some of the attributes we came up, there are five main themes that came up. Here we had garment attributes, which are, okay, what are the features of that garment? Uh, what's the fabric? What's the texture? What's the style? Uh, what's the neckline? Then another one that came up was brands. So one thing, one thing we noticed was that some of the clients said different brands had different um, things that they were known for. So a particular brand could be known for providing uh, more flowy dresses. So if you had a client who wanted something that had more flowy dresses, then you would go for that brand. Then they also mentioned um, fashion industry seasons and trends. So what, what, what's in season this 
this month may be different for what's in season next month. So when the person is taking a client shopping, she'll probably be looking at, okay, what's in the stores right now? Because that will determine what she's offering. So another thing was wardrobe basics. So wardrobe basics are those things that you need to have in your wardrobe that you can build on to get, um, to get other outfits put together. And then the last one was clothing versatility, which had to do with how easily one piece, one garment piece could be taken into a different um, look, um, area and still be used. So uh, this code kind of ties in how um, a stylist would go through the process. So for example, she would look at, okay, what's she doing? This, in this case, she's a stay-at-home mom. So she looked at what she would be doing if she's a stay-at-home mom. And she looked at the person's figure and then looked at the fact that, okay, even if she wants to stay home or she wanted to go out, she probably needed a, a, an outfit that could work when, for both events. So this was what she looked at when she was trying, to, when she made recommendations for what she would sell to the lady. So the last one was the stylist consultation process. And here it has to do with what's the specialization. Um, a wardrobe consultant would probably make different recommendations from a personal shopper. Then the other thing was the mode of interaction. When you are interacting with a client, is it, is it an in-person client or is it someone that they just walk in with online? Because this to an extent will determine if they can tell the client's um, body shape or coloring. So the last one was the objective of the client, which I think we've already, I've discussed a bit about in the personal um, client features. So the last was strategies and formulas, which is, okay, while they are making recommendations, they are also teaching their clients, this is why I'm recommending this to you. And this is why I would say you shouldn't wear this. Or this is in your wardrobe. You can pair it with this other item to make a different, a completely different look. So for second, the second research question, we asked if um, the wardrobe integration played a part in what they were recommending or not. All, all the stylists said yes, except one person. And in her case, she said that she's basically doing the same thing, whether she's using the person's wardrobe or not. But for the others, then they said, yes, the wardrobe would probably change the recommendations they were making. So for implications for the apparel recommender systems, here are the factors, and I'll just go, because this was focused on just identifying these features, but here are a few things we think you could look at. So when you are designing a recommender system for body type, how do you get the body type of the client? How do you get the color? Because colors would, um, skin color would probably display differently on different screens. And then names for different skin colors are not exactly standardized. So how do we reconcile these issues? Next is lifestyle. How do you obtain the person's lifestyle? Even if they tell you their profession, how will you be able to know, okay, what are they doing on a daily basis? How, how do you ask a question such as, do you have little kids in the house? Those are the kind of things you're looking at when you're doing the design of this kind of systems. So we're also looking at garment representation in terms of ontology. Do the clients know the different fashion words? Can they tell what you mean when you say a flat skirt versus a, an A-line skirt or versus a pleated skirt? Then the other thing is, how do, you, how do we retrieve images of the things they have in their wardrobe and make sure these images are clear enough for the system to be able to recommend based on that? So the last um, factor would consider is, um, what are the usual requirements and how do we map them to garment features? So are there any style rules that tie these two things together that we can use to train models? So here, I'm cons um, for example, we're looking at user objectives and using the recommender system now. So someone who is coming in to make a purchase decision, but as someone who is trying to decide what dress to wear from her wardrobe, the approach would have to be different. Then for, if you're building a complete outfit versus when you are trying to just find a top to match a skirt, the approach for making the recommendations too would also have to be different. It's illustrated by these two quotes that we show from one, someone who's a personal shopper and someone who's a wardrobe consultant. So they are looking at two different things when they are making their recommendations. So I also want to touch on strategies and formulas because it was something that we found very important. It, it's, this, this quote is essentially from one person, but it kind of ties in three different 
factors for strategies and formulas, which are wardrobe integration. How do you, for them, they would go into the wardrobe and see, okay, this works, this works. This is what you have so far. Okay, so I can buy maybe a turtle neck top that works with this jacket when we go shopping. Then um, style tips. Well, yeah, your, the recommender should be able to tell all the clients, okay, um, because you have a broad neckline, then maybe you should wear a plunging neckline or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the other thing is what's help them to build um, initial wardrobe basics that they could start from. What do they start with? How do they go forward from there? So the main contribution of this paper is we just we try to find out what features are important to learn for recommenders. So we know, okay, here's what we need to focus on when we are designing inputs that we need to collect and information we need to get from the user. From the user. So um, future work for us would focus more on how we would obtain this user information such as body type, coloring, or lifestyle correctly. Because the essence of this is the, the information you're putting in the system will determine the recommendations you're going to be giving the client. Then we also need to look at how we're going to map user attributes and garment features that are ideal for them. This will essentially lead us to have data sets of style rules that we can use in making recommendations. So in conclusion, we looked at the important factors for professional stylists when they are making recommendations and they were grouped into three, three sets. Client considerations, the garment features, and the consultation process with the client. So we found that wardrobe integration plays a major role in determining the approach that the, the stylist would use with their clients. And then the features of the garment, the client also, and their requirements will determine which garments are recommended for each client. So limitations, this was a qualitative study. And essentially I was looking at it from, uh, we're looking at it from a sustainability perspective. So most of our interpretations are looked at in terms of how do we help users use their wardrobe more efficiently. We're not trying to get, to get them to buy more stuff. So the people we interviewed here were just 12 and this, they may not really be a true representation of all fashion stylists. It's just their own opinions. So even though this is just their opinions, we think this is still a useful source of information in understanding the design requirements for recommender systems. So um, I'm open to questions now and I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this presentation. Thank you so much for that very interesting presentation. I think you've laid out some of very interesting uh, user needs for everyone working in the field of fashion recommender systems and, and outfit recommendations. Uh, you know, I think it ties very well with some of the presentations we talked before about uh, how expert knowledge is, is very important and, and, and so on. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone who has a question, you can either ask it in the session Q and A, or if you want, we welcome anyone to unmute your mic and, and just ask the question out loud here. Let me start with the a, with a first question. Uh, something that I found quite interesting in your paper is that according to the profession of the people uh, that you interviewed and that you know the, the users interact with, they have uh, slightly different views on, on where they want to focus uh, with that person. You know, you mentioned, you know, image, people yes. who focus more on, on projecting an image and so on. How do you think users can can make a conscious choice about whom to work with around their needs. Is it more they just find someone that they know? Or do you think they should be directed uh, to sort of a, a recommender systems to tell you whom to reach out to almost? Okay, so um, for most of these participants we interviewed, they actually have a sign up form that new users need to fill to put in information. So usually they go through like an onboarding process with the client to find out, okay, what are you trying to achieve? So if they find that the person is not really within their own clientele, <clears throat> they would usually recommend them to someone else. So most people would come in and just Google maybe a fashion stylist or Google image consultants. So if they, 
they have connections with other people that they think if they think they might be a better fit for their clients and they will recommend the client to that person. But I think the recommender system should also be able to do that. Because if if the client can for example, take for example the conversational recommender systems that were mentioned in some earlier presentations. Mm -hmm. If a user can say, this is what I'm trying to achieve, a recommender should be able to infer from that that, okay, you need an image consultant or you need a personal stylist or you need a wardrobe consultant and recommend someone based on that description. Yeah, a very interesting perspective. It's a lot more complex than, than just building out, right? Yeah. <laughs> which is very interesting. Uh, I have another follow-up question on that, which is, uh, you know, you've, you've done a lot of research on this area. I wonder what are the areas, and I know that your perspective is more from a sustainability point of view, uh, but what are the areas where you see, uh, you know, e-commerce platform are, there's a gap between what users need or what stylists would recommend versus those platforms? Oh, where do I start from? <laughs> okay. okay, so... Let's start with sizing. Uh, I think there should be a better way for us to help users, people find styles. If a brand knows this is their target market, then instead of just focusing on one medium style and then expanding to larger styles, why not get five or six people who you think are a broad range of the people you target and then use them as the models you start your patterns from and then expand on that. And when you're making the recommendations, get the measurements of your users and try to use this to find a, a, good, a good range of styles that I think would fit the person rather than having issues with people buying things and then keep returning them. Because in the long run, you're losing money, the users are not satisfied, so they probably won't come back to buy from you. Okay, so sizing and fit up as part. How, let's see, can we get users to use this system to find what they need more efficiently? Uh, what's the occasion? What are they doing? How, why do they need to buy these clothes? And then we should also be able to look at what's their previous purchase history and decide based on that, what in our new collection works with the things they've bought in the past and then make recommendations for that. I probably don't have enough time to go into this, so yeah, that probably be something we have to discuss after. Yeah, perhaps we can uh, have a follow up. Anyone can reach out to you on, on the WOBA platform uh, and, and so on. Uh, thank you very much again for your talk. Uh, it was really interesting. And now we're going for thank the you. last talk of the day. And I think the last talk of Rex is 2020. So it is really a pleasure to, you know, to be the last ones uh, still working at it. Uh, and like very interesting talk by Lucy Dun. Thank you very much. Okay, can I share my screen? Uh, yeah, you should be able to share your screen. There we go, I think it's working. Yeah, and it's working perfectly. Okay, all right, shall I begin? Yes, right. please. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks everybody and thanks for sticking with me to the end here. <laughs> I'll try to keep you entertained for the last 20 minutes here. Um, We've learned a lot in this, this workshop, so I know it's kind of a little bit of mental overload probably for many of us. Um, so I'm Lucy Dunn. I'm here from the University of Minnesota, um, and I'll just give you a little background on myself. Um, in my, I, I kind of have kind of a weird job. Um, I, my academic affiliation is with the College of Design and um, specifically with the apparel design program, which I direct. Um, but my research hat is much more in, um, in hardware engineering. It, it, I work on uh, wearable technologies and garment-based technologies. Um, so this project is kind of a little bit of, you know, a, a detour for me, but it's a really big passion of mine. I think this is an area that is poised to absolutely transform the fashion industry and um, the practice of, of designing clothing as well as the way that consumers use and maintain their own clothing. Um, and, and because of that impact, it keeps me really engaged in, in this area. So today um, I'm going to be talking about a project um, that we worked on some years ago, um, trying to understand the way that people build their own outfits every day um, and the strategies that they use. Um, and then I'll get into a little bit on um, some of the work we did looking at uh, computer generated com combinations of garments that real people own um, and what number of those combinations are actually usable. Um, 
for for a different spectrum, I guess, of, of users. So I'll get back into that in a minute. Um, but so our, our motivation here is really the in-home user um, and and you know understanding how outfits go together. And it's really motivated by that that pervasive problem that many of you, but maybe not all of you, um, experience on most days, which is, oh my gosh, what am I going to wear today? Um, and yes, we, we know from our empirical research that this varies considerably across the consumer spectrum. So some of you might be like, why is this hard? But hopefully since you're at this workshop, you don't totally think that it's not a hard problem. <laughs> um, so uh, this, this idea of not having anything to wear, um, when we take a, a pretty basic hypothetical closet of 120 items, which is an average from one of our studies, um, and if we break it down into the component um, garments and types that might be in there, and then just do a very quick, um, combinometrics calculation on those numbers, we end up with a really, really large number. So if you have 600,000 outfits in your closet, it's unlikely that you actually have nothing to wear. Um, so we have to reinterpret what nothing means. You know, what, what is really this crisis? What, what are consumers experiencing in their day-to-day -day interaction that's not working, that's causing this crisis? Um, and I, I refer to this um, as the wardrobe moment, which is a, a, a term coined by other apparel researchers. Um, so it's that mini crisis of trying to decide what to wear for a given day. Um, so today I'm going to focus on kind of three themes. Uh, one is understanding what people self-report about what they want out of getting dressed, like what they want out of a good outfit, and what's and what are obstacles to getting to a good outfit. Um, also self-report on the strategies they use to build an outfit. And then I'll get into um, assessment of the auto-generated outfits that we have put together from actual wardrobes. Okay, so just to start with our self-report um, section, um, this all comes from a user survey, which is 194 Mechanical Turk workers. Um, they're skewed female, but they're reasonably well distributed on the consumer spectrum. We calculate that from a nine question battery that's drawn from previous research, um, and then we just plot them across the spectrum. Uh, we, we thought that we might see some effects of, of the position on the consumer spectrum with, in, with respect to strategies and wardrobe sizes and things like that. That's why we calculated that. Um, so our survey covered uh, these themes, uh, perceived order of size and use, so what do you have and what are you using, uh, values and objectives in dressing, what do you want out of dressing, constraints of the wardrobe moment, what's making it hard to make, make an outfit, um, variables that are at play in that dressing decision, so what are you taking into account when you're evaluating whether or not something is good, um, and then outfit building strategies, so how do you go about putting together an outfit from component parts. So getting into some results, um, for wardrobe size, we saw a, a difference in, in wardrobe sizes for female versus male participants. Um, the average isn't that different, but um, the, the um, standard deviation here is also really, really wide. Um, and then I'll, I'll also mention here, though, that we're asking people to self-report a very complex system that they obviously haven't counted. So we don't have a whole lot of faith in their you know, absolute judgment right there. Um, so we also ask them to estimate by garment category to try to get at something a little bit more specific. Like if I ask you how many pairs of jeans do you own, you might be able to count real quick. But if I ask you how many garments are in your closet, that might be more difficult. Um, so when we ask them to report by subcategory, that number gets a little bit larger. But again, there's a huge standard deviation here. There's really small wardrobes and really large wardrobes. Um, interestingly, we did not see a strong relationship between wardrobe size and consumer spectrum score. We expected the innovators to have bigger uh, wardrobes than the laggards, but we didn't see that clearly in our data. Um, I should also mention, however, though, that we're talking about a working wardrobe. So when I say working wardrobe, that's um, something that we define as clothing that you tell me is, is in regular use for your, your normal daily activity. So maybe that's work, maybe that's school, um, whatever it is that you do most days. Um, the garments that are in active use for that purpose. So that means you're not counting your prom dress or um, the, you know, the sweatpants that you mow the lawn in. Um, and we're also not counting things like shoes or um, bags or other accessories or hosiery even, outerwear. We're, we're counting the, the core garments of your working wardrobe. So this should be smaller than the actual total number that you actually own. So then we ask people um, what percent of that wardrobe is in regular use, and here we define regular use as wearing it once per month or more. Um, and 
uh, between female and male, we see a pretty similar um, average, so 63% for female and 58% uh, for male. Um, I should also mention here, however, that this is an aggregate across the whole spectrum, um, and it's also self-reported. So we see the same self-report in this, the subjects that we've actually been able to track in their everyday patterns, and their patterns don't match this at all. Um, so for our female users that we tracked over a period of at least three months, three to six months, um, they wore about 5% of their wardrobe once per month or more, and actually they could only have worn 30%. Um, if they never repeated a garment. Um, so we think there's a lot of error in this self-report um, for some users. I should mention for male users that we tracked, there was not a lot of difference. Slight, they, they were slightly less than they estimated, but much, much less of a difference than there was for our female users. Um, so then we asked people what they want out of dressing, and we use these 12 questions here, and I won't go through them in detail for time's sake, um, but I'll pull out some, um, some trends here. Um, so, uh, some of the things we saw were that uh, for female respondents, we saw that they wanted to be comfortable, um, most of all. They also wanted to flatter their body. Um, for male, also again, that comfortable question comes into mind. Um, they were secondarily interested in dressing quickly, um, which female respondents were much less interested in compared to other things. And they were interested, but less than some, some other factors. Um, and that comfortable question, um, I think, is an interesting facet of fit that we haven't really talked about a lot today. Uh, we talk about fit in terms of, you know, it looking the way it's supposed to on your body, which is certainly important. But there also seems to be this comfort question, which might be a little bit more difficult to quantify or to predict. Um, uh, looking my best is, is also shared by both, um, which is interesting. Uh, we, we think that's a, you know, a nice sort of aesthetic objective that might be coming out of the data. Um, and then also, interestingly, everybody's interested in making use of everything, which um, is different than uh, reducing consumption in some way. We don't see people feeling as strongly about reducing consumption, but they do want to make use of everything that they own, which I think would have a follow-on effect of reducing consumption, given that there is so much waste in the wardrobe already. If you're using it better, then you have less need for new things. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, did I miss one there? Oh yeah, and look trendy. That's that's another one that we expected to see more people interested in, but we did not. Um, people across the spectrum did not want to look trendy. <laughs> and maybe it's because we label it trendy. Maybe that's the wrong word to use because clearly people are influenced and affected by trends, but they don't necessarily want to admit that or they don't want to, um, they don't center that in their objectives for dressing. Um, so then, we a few a few of these um, the a few of these objectives seem to have some sort of relationship with the consumer spectrum scores. So I just wanted to show you some raw data here. Um, we saw a positive relationship both for male and female part participants on the um, the want to have fun and want to look better, as well as the look unique here. You, you see look unique on the left here. Um, so, so those are things that are, co are traditionally correlated with um, fashion innovativeness or fashion innovatorness, um, the kind of the more playful or artistic or expressive aspects. Um, for male participants, we also saw a positive relationship for the I want to fl flatter my body question, but we didn't see that for female participants. So it seems like female participants are socialized into wanting to flatter their body more universally, whereas only male innovators seem to be influenced by that objective. Um, and then we saw a negative relationship for both male and female in the um, I want to get dressed as quickly as possible. Um, and that's what you see here on the right, the dress fast question. And we didn't see any visible effects for any of the other statements. Okay, so then we also were interested in the wardrobe moment itself, like how long is it? <laughs> how much time do we have to, to do this decision making? Um, and we found that um, overall, I'll just skip these ahead, it seems like it's converging on somewhere around five minutes. Um, so male participants spend a lot less time than female participants, but in both cases, if you guessed about five minutes, you'd get most people. Um, 
And then for a special day, we give them a separate question because some, some days require more time. So this might be like the day where you're giving a presentation at work or you're going on a date or something that requires a little bit more effort. Um, and that might be the use case that we want to focus on for some recommendation systems um, because that's the, the part where the user feels mo most insecure. You know, that's where they, they want help the most. Um, so that, that might be a slightly longer um, time frame, but you still probably wouldn't want to go a whole lot um, over 10 minutes because people prioritize getting dressed faster. All right, then digging into the sources of difficulty, you know, what are people struggling with here? Um, we were really interested in, in knowing what, you know, what it feels like from the user perspective. Um, so for female participants, we saw um, trouble with, sorry, I'm doing, uh, yeah, trouble with aesthetics or looking good. Um, so they're struggling to find something that looks good on them, um, not as strong for male participants. Um, they're struggling um, with finding something that meets today's needs, so the activities that they're doing today. Um, and we're seeing two, having too few options, so they don't have enough things to choose from. And again, if you go back to that common metrics calculation, maybe that's not accurate, but that's certainly what they're perceiving. Uh, for male participants, also this too few options is a leader. Um, and then, and also the activity driven question, what am I doing today? Um, and there, but male participants are also influenced more by uh, what's clean. Female participants to, to also to a degree, but not as strong as some of the other factors. Um, oh, and interestingly, I won't spend a whole lot of time on clean, but that's a whole area that you can dig into. <laughs> um, I think in systems, we tend to try to represent this as a binary, like it's clean or it's not. But in practice, it is not a binary. <laughs> There's a definite category of like sort of clean that everybody has and everyone has a separate storage space for. Um, and the decision of whether or not it's clean enough depends on that activity question, like what am I doing today? So that's a whole other um, can of worms that maybe we don't want to spend a lot of time on right this minute. Um, and then I just wanted to also call out that almost nobody uh, prioritized the most um, having too, too many options. So too few options is much more significant than too, too many options, which again, when you look at the numbers, isn't necessarily maybe accurate. All right, so then um, strategies, what are people do, do, using to help themselves make these decisions? Uh, we saw strong themes for using the weather, um, for comfort, again, that comfort question, and activity, another theme that's coming back again. Um, and then for male participants, um, cleanliness was important, and uh, from female participants, mood was important, which you can see was a lot less important for um, male participants. So how do I feel today? Um, and then, interestingly, uh, the female participants prioritized the aesthetic comfort, aesthetic aspect of fit over the comfort, um, and it's reversed for male participants. So then quickly just looking at um, consumer spectrum again, um, we saw a couple of things that had slight relationships. So on the left here is overall aesthetic, so aesthetic aspects, um, which did trend with consumer spectrum score. And then on the right, um, what, whatever was easiest has a negative relationship. So the lower you are on the, on the consumer spectrum, the um, more you're interested in it being easy. Okay, so then how do people build outfits? Um, we found that a, a good theme was that a lot of people pick a garment. Um, it's different for male versus female participants. Um, females tend to pick the top first and males tend to pick the bottom first, but picking a garment is a good place to start and then we build from there. Um, using a constraint is also popular. So going back to the previous um, slide about uh, weather and activity or what's clean, that's another way to constrain. Um, and then for female participants particularly, um, an emotional choice. So like, what do you feel like? What color do you feel like um, might influence um, what, where you start with the outfit? Okay, so then lastly, I'm just going to dig into a little bit about um, trying to evaluate outfits that have been generated automatically. Um, so here we're using an actual uh, women's wardrobe. So this is 137 items that break down into the following categories. Um, and then we build outfits just by combining them all. Um, so we categorize our tops in three layers, inner, middle, and outer, and we can co combine up to three layers of top. Um, one to three layers, um, and then we combine them with the bottoms and we put the dresses on their own with the sweaters over them sometimes. Um, so out of this wardrobe, we get um, almost 500,000 outfits. And then, um, and those are, uh, this is the, the number of outfits that each garment was included in. Um, so that's just a little spread of, of the outfits that we had. 
Um, so then to rate them, we, we drew a random sample of a thousand of those outfits um, and we rated, we rated them on a five point scale. And interestingly, this is not the same kind of five point scale that you would see on like Amazon reviews um, because our scale is so much broader. Uh, we talked a little bit today about not having a negative, um, you know, negative response to categorize. Here we do. <laughs> so there's outfits that are like not actually outfits, like they're not feasible um, or the, you know, it's like a, it's like a tank top over a bulky puff, puffer vest or something like that like it's it wouldn't actually work so our scale goes down to not wearable like this is not something anyone would wear um, and it goes up to this is great and someone would look great look wearing exactly this but importantly that's someone not me that's some person which introduces a little bit of subjectivity um, so we had each outfit rated by th the three of us on the on the research team um, plus two to four crowdsourced graders. So the three of us were normed within ourselves um, and we had a consistent understanding of our scale, but the crowdsourced graders were much more um, diverse. Um, so then you can see here the spread for each different group. Blue is the overall average for both groups. Um, red is experts and um, yellow is the lay average. And you can see a really different distribution for experts versus lay raters. Um, interestingly, the experts thought things were better. Um, you might think that experts would be more critical, but experts were more generous here than lay people were. And we think that that might be because experts can imagine more possibilities for a, an outfit that's made of three garments that are laid flat. You know, they're not dressed on a human. So that styling piece that came up in the panel, um, that, that could really influence whether or not an outfit is good or not. Um, and it's possible that lay raters don't have as much imagination around how that could play out on a different body or in a different style. Um, but importantly, almost all of these outfits are wearable, could technically be worn together. A vast majority could be worn together. Um, the percentage that's great is really low for lay raters, but pretty hefty for experts. Um, so there, there's a broad range here, but it seems like most outfits are wearable. So coming back to that question of not having enough options, that's really interesting here. Okay, so just to wrap up here, um, we see that individuals report smaller wardrobes than that are in more regular use than we think is true. <laughs> Um, we think that the wardrobe moment should be about five minutes um, and it's going to be constrained by what you want out of that dressing interaction as well as practical things like what the weather is today. Um, those objectives and strategies are variable, as you might expect. Some are linked to consumer, consumer spectrum, spectrum or innovativeness, uh, but not all. Um, and there are consistency around things like comfort, looking better, and being efficient in the wardrobe. Um, we think that we definitely need to take into account the practical considerations, weather activity, um, as well as subjective things. Comfort might be one of our harder things to capture. Social appropriateness is also really hard to capture. Um, but interestingly, trendiness is something that we focus on in recommender systems a lot, but wasn't really prioritized much by most of the users we talked to. Um, and then it's, it's, uh, individuals are unlikely to really uh, to, to report that they have too many options, but we think that really is a, an underlying source of difficulty because they can't find good options out of a huge number of actual options. Um, so what I think that means is that um, there's kind of a last mile problem in, in recommending a good outfit. Like you can get to a pretty reasonable outfit for someone it's very easily, but to get to the one that an individual really wants to wear is much, much harder. Um, and that's where we really need more research to understand the full scope of the problem. Okay, so I'll leave it there. And I don't know if I ran over, but um, if there's time, I can take questions. Hi, Lucy. Uh, wait, sorry. Thank you very much for, again, for your talk. It was uh, really, really interesting uh, to get that you know, perspective, especially in our community. And again, tied in with so many of the other topics that we have been discussing through the day. Um, I invite everyone or anyone who has a questions, you can either write them on WOVA on the platform under Lucy's talk, or you can, um, you can also ask them here uh, by unmuting your microphone. Uh, and let me start with one, which is maybe a bit open, but let's see if, you know, you, you want to answer that is uh, comfortability is a key factor when people are uh, getting dressed, right? Yet it seems that at least, you know, advertisement and how uh, recommendations are made, they're not targeted at least explicitly towards that rather, you know, trendiness, which, you know, is something that didn't come up as high 
on the people you interview. So why, why do you think uh, that is? Or, you know, how do you think we can counteract that? Um, well, one of the things I think is that um, certainly in the fashion industry and probably also in the recommender systems field, we assume that like the, the innovator set is overrepresentative. Like we, we assume that more people are more engaged in the topic than they actually are. And I think the reality is the vast majority of people really don't care about this stuff. <laughs> um, and if you actually look at people actually getting dressed, they, they they do care. Like, I mean, that that question of wanting to look better was pretty universal. Um, but they don't care in the way that we care or that we imagine that you're supposed to care. You know, they're not like trying to be a fashion model or they're not trying to be like featured in a, in a fashion blog somewhere. They're just trying to look pretty good for themselves and like keep up with whatever society expects of them, um, which may seem like a less exciting problem, but it's still an incredibly complicated problem. Like it's the same complicated. It's actually harder, I think, than being a true innovator where you can literally put introduce randomness and it's not even not even just okay it's like kind of good like innovators really do want to break rules and combine things that shouldn't go together so like for a recommender system that's a random number generator like that's easy i can do that but to understand subtle social rules and tell some individual how to make their body and their self look better that's a really hard task um, so I think maybe we spend some of our time looking at the wrong things. Um, but then getting back to that like comfort question, even especially right now, I don't, I don't know if you saw that New York Times article that like shook fashion, <laughs> um, uh, sweatpants forever, um, was reporting on the COVID trends in, in sales and, and how, you know, luxury is really taking a hit, but um, sweatpants are thriving. <laughs> so it's possible that we may see some seismic shifts after COVID. I'm not sure. I could, I could see it lashing back the other way and everyone wears the most ridiculous stuff because we've all been wearing sweatpants for six months um but you never know yeah very very interesting how how things are changing as well because of you know this slight bump i hope in in our in our history uh there is another question which is uh any ideas how outfit recommender systems could deal with a person's mood and its and its effect on outfit choice yeah, I've thought a lot about this. Um, I think that it can't be prescriptive. Um, I think there's, I've arrived at, there's a set of things that we can do, we can be prescriptive about, or and not necessarily like pre prescriptive in like a diagnostic, like in a what single point recommendation, but in a, here's a set of things to pick among. Um, and, but in that set, I think that's where things like mood come into play. Um, I, I actually have a whole model of this that I drew out once and, um, you know, it, it took me months to arrive at this model of like what should be in the system and what should be for the user and how could the system collect implicit feedback from the user. Um, so one of those things is when you come back to that strategies slide, um, if the strategy starts with a garment, then that's the user's implicit influence like so if they if their mood feels like fluffy today then they start with a fluffy garment like i feel like wearing this and then the, the problem is completing the outfit not not beginning it um so i think there's a lot of ways in which the user influence can be implicit and be gathered from interactions rather than from um, prescriptive um, uh, recommendations again very very interesting and thanks so much for your talk uh, uh we're a bit over time but if you want to follow up with lucy you can see their uh, Twitter handle and as well as the email. So I think we'll have access to WOVA as well for, for a while. Uh, so I'm going to stop the sharing. And uh, I guess we're, we're about to end in the, in the last part of our, of our day. Uh, thanks everyone for attending and sticking to the end. Uh, I want to do something which is to ask you for your feedback, which is one of the most valuable things that you can give us right now, because it will help us shape uh, the community uh, moving forward. By the way, we're going to have 10 more minutes and we're going to wrap up. We're not going to have a break and then come back because then none of you will come back. Uh, so let me just share my screen and I'm going to ask you to, uh, here you can see a QR code. I hope that works and that will link, I'll, I'm going to try as well. That will link you to a feedback form uh, that you can quickly uh, put a few sentences on and it will help us a lot. Uh, yeah, please, for me it works. Please let me know if it doesn't. And I think now everyone can, if you want, you can just show your cameras 
on this last five minutes or so. It'll be nice to see all your faces who've been attending for, for, for the whole day. Um, and say hi. Hi, Tao, Steve. I'm still here. Thanks so much for organizing an awesome workshop. Better yes. and better every year. Yeah. Uh, yeah this is wonderful. Robin, Thank you. Nima Gordon. I'm, I'm tapping in. Well, you filled that form, I hope. I don't know how to get this to. Just scan nice it with your phone called. and should bring you to the to the feedback form. Uh, Nima, do you want to say some uh, other words? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Uh, so um, just a, a few short words regarding uh, the publication. So as uh, uh, with previous year, we also this year decided to uh, publish the proceedings of the workshop. We have already sent invitations to the authors uh, that have contributed to the workshop and thanks for that. So the uh, proceedings of this year's workshop, uh, we have uh, reserved a volume of uh, lecture notes in electrical engineering and the title of the volume is going to be called Recommender Systems in Fashion and Retail. So it's very, um, as you can see, the uh, volume, the book's name is very relevant, of course, to the event. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, preparing your uh, 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 manuscript accordingly. And the sooner we receive the prepared uh, version, of course, the sooner the Springer uh, editors can begin to work on it. And hopefully, the sooner your uh, contributions can be publicized. And, and the sooner uh, we have, go on holidays. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Sadly, we don't have any uh, dates still for when it's coming out, but I guess the sooner we get them, the better. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, and I guess what what we want to end up with is a big, big thank you to everyone who's been part of this uh, workshop, right? Uh, we have, of course, you know, co-organizers, Nima, Shara, Reza. We have uh, great reviewers uh, who put uh, effort on reviewing all the papers. Of course, the authors uh, who presented very, very interesting work today, as well as our, our panel speakers, um, I think this panel was, was really, really good. I would say better than last year. And I wasn't last year and I wasn't on this one. So this is unbiased. And the keynotes were, were also great. But last year was also great. Nima, don't, don't get me wrong. And the keynotes were also uh, really good. So thank you, everyone. Of course, uh, all of you who attended on this very first uh, virtual version of uh, Fashion Rexis 2020. Uh, I hope you come back. Um, with a lot of information and a lot of uh, new ideas for work and, and hopefully also collaboration, especially between academia and industry. Uh, one last thing is we do have a Slack on the ACM Rexis uh, channel. So if you Google ACM Rexis Slack invite, you will, uh, you know, can auto invite to that. Um, but for everyone who filled the form, I'll just send you a follow up link and you can just register there we share news, uh, articles, papers, whatever is interesting there. There's a few of us who are relatively active. Uh, have a great uh, day or evening, or depending on where you are in the world. And thank you so much for, for attending. Uh, I'm going to put this gallery of you and see all of you and say uh, happy, happy, happy weekend, I guess, or, or whatever is left from that. Bye. And thanks Bye. So thank much. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks for everyone. all the hard work. Bye. Bye, Steve. Bye. Bye, Umberto. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you next year. Yeah.